39463. Drawing Blood by Poppy Z. Bright. Copyright 1993 by Poppy Z. Bright. All rights reserved. Read by Ray Fouché. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Library of Congress Annotation In 1972, cult cartoonist Robert McGee and his young family rent a house in Missing Mile, North Carolina. There, Robert kills his wife, his three-year-old son, and himself. Twenty years later, the surviving son, Trevor, now also a cartoonist, returns to the site to confront the horror from his past. Helping him unravel the bizarre murder is computer hacker Zachary Bosch, who has fallen in love with Trevor. Strong language, violence, and explicit descriptions of sex. 1993. From the Book Jacket. With her debut novel, Lost Souls, last year, Poppy Z. Bright proved herself to be a major new voice in horror fiction and earned the praise of writers like Harlan Ellison and Dan Simmons. With her spellbinding prose and a fresh, haunting new approach, Bright has reinvented horror for the 1990s. Robert McGee is a man living under a dark cloud. Acclaimed cartoonist of the underground comic book Birdland, he has moved his family from Texas to New Orleans and finally to Missing Mile, North Carolina. But Robert is unable to escape the drinking and the violence that have become as natural to him as breathing. Soon after he and his family settle into a decrepit farmhouse, Robert kills his wife, his younger son, and then himself. Only his five-year-old son Trevor is left alive. Twenty years later, Trevor McGee, also a cartoonist, returns to Missing Mile, to the house in which his family once lived. He has been running from the truth for years and finally realizes he must face his demons. He fears that what happened to his father will happen to him. But if it does, Trevor thinks, at least I won't have anyone to kill. Then he befriends Zachary Bosch, a computer hacker from New Orleans running from the law. In the house, which Trevor calls Birdland, they must confront much more than bad memories. For the house itself carries its own dark force, which threatens to envelop Trevor in the past and destroy him. Stephen King's The Shining recreated the Haunted House novel in the 70s with a stunning vision. Bright combines these elements in a totally new way to reimagine this genre for the 90s with a brilliant new power. About the Author Twenty-six years old, Poppy Z. Bright is an electrifying new voice in fiction. Her first novel, Lost Souls, was published in hardcover last year to much acclaim and has just been released in paperback. It has been nominated for Best First Novel of 1992 by the Horror Writers of America and for the Lambda Literary Award. Her short stories have appeared in numerous anthologies and a collection of them, titled Swamp Fetus, has been published by Borderlands Press. She lives and writes in New Orleans. For Christopher DeBar and David Ferguson, who knew when to be there, and when to go away. Acknowledgements. A number of people have kindly assisted me with research on computer hacking. Greatest possible thanks to Bruce Sterling, Darren McKeeman, Forrest Cahoon, John Carter, and the Digital Underground at large. Any technical errors are my own. Thanks also to Connie B. Bright, Harlan Ellison, Dan Simmons, Brian Hodge, Jody and Steve, Mary Fleener, Leslie Sternberg, Steve Bissett, Don Donahue, Paul Mavridis, John and Craig, Linda Murata and Kaz, Ed Bryant, Dan Matthews, Andrew Casey, Kevin and Valerie, Daryl, Virginia, John Fetus Corey, Matthew Grass, Ellen Datlow, F. Christian Grimm, Heidi Kirsch, Tom Montaloni, J.R. McCone, Ian and Ann, Tigger Ferguson and 5-8, Willem Pugmire, Tom Picciarelli, Bob Bright, The Go Figures, Devlin Thompson, Bob and Ron, Steve and Ghost, Miss Sunbeam, Evan Borston, Brian Emrich, Mirren Kim for the wonderful art, 
Anne Stephen E. Johnson, Wayne Allen Sally, Brooks Carruthers, St. Janner Hypercletes, Willow Dobbs, the Reverend Ivan Stang, and Bob Dobbs himself. All of you helped in some way, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. To my editor, Gene Cavalos, my agents, Richard Curtis and Rich Henshaw, and to Monica Calhira Kendrick and Michael Spencer, as always. Major sources of inspiration, R. Crumb, Chester Brown, Julie Doucet, Tom Waits, William S. Burroughs, Trent Reznor, and Charlie Parker. Art is not a mirror. Art is a hammer. Phrase scrawled on a whiteboard in the media lab at MIT, home of the first computer hackers, attributed to Bertolt Brecht. Missing Mile, North Carolina, in the summer of 1972, was scarcely more than a wide spot in the road. The main street was shaded by a few great spreading pecans and oaks, flanked by a few even larger, more sprawling southern homes too far off any beaten path to have fallen to the scourge of the Civil War. The ravages and triumphs of the past decade seemed to have touched the town not at all, not at first glance. You might think that here was a place adrift in a gentler time a place where peace reigned naturally and did not have to be blazoned on banners or worn around the neck. You might think that if you were just driving through. Stay long enough and you would begin to see signs. Literal ones, like the posters in the window of the record store that would later become the whirling disc, but was now still known as the spin and spur. Despite the name and the plywood cowboy boot above the door, those who wanted songs about God, guns, and glory went to Ronnie's record barn down the highway in Corinth. The spin and spur had been taken over, and the posters in the window swarmed with psychedelic patterns and colors, shouted crazy angry words. And the graffiti. Stop war, with a lurid red fist thrusting halfway up the side of a building. He is risen, with a sketchy, sulkily sensual face beneath that might have been Jesus Christ or Jim Morrison literal signs, or figurative ones, like the shattered boy who now sat with the old men outside the farmer's hardware store on clear days. In another life, his name had been Johnny Wiegers, and he had been an open-faced, sweet-natured kid. Most of the old-timers remembered buying him a candy bar or a soda at some point over the years, or later, cadging him a couple of beers. Now his mother wheeled him down Firehouse Street every day, and propped him up so he could hear their talk and watch the endless rounds of checkers they played with a battered board and a set of purple and orange knee-high caps. So far, none of them had had the heart to ask her not to do it anymore. Johnny Wiegers sat quietly. He had to. He had stepped on a Viet Cong landmine and breathed fire, which took out his tongue and his vocal cords. His face was gone to unrecognizable meat, save for one eye glittering mindlessly in all that ruin like the eye of a bird or a reptile. Both arms and his right leg were gone. The left leg ended just above the knee, and Ms. Wiegers would insist on rolling his trouser cuff up over it to air out the fresh scar. The old-timers hunched over their checkers game, talking less than usual, glancing every now and then at the raw, pitiful stump or the gently heaving torso, never at the mangled face. All of them hoped Johnny Wiegers would die soon literal signs of the times, and figurative ones. The decade of love was gone, its gods dead or disillusioned, its fury beginning to mutate into a kind of self-absorbed unease. The only constant was the war. If Trevor McGee knew any of this, it was only in the fuzziest of ways, sensing it through osmosis rather than any conscious effort. He had just turned five. He had seen Vietnam broadcasts on the news, though his family did not now have a TV. He knew that his parents believed the war was wrong, but they spoke of it as something that could not be changed, like a rainy day when you wanted to play outside, or an elbow already skinned. Mama told stories of peace marches she'd gone to before the boys were born. She listened to records that reminded her of those days, made her happy. When Daddy listened to his records now, they seemed to make him sad. Trevor liked all the music, especially the jazz saxophonist Charlie Parker, who Daddy always called Bird. And the song Janis Joplin sang with his Daddy's name in it, Me and Bobby McGee. 
Trev wished he could remember all the words and sing the song himself. Then he could pretend it was just him and his daddy driving along this road, without Mama or Dee Dee, just the two of them. Then he could ride up front with Daddy, not stuck in the back with Dee Dee like a baby. He made himself stop thinking that. Where would Mama and Dee Dee be, if not here? Back in Texas? Or the place they had left two days ago, New Orleans? If he wasn't careful, he would make himself cry. He didn't want his mother or his little brother to be in New Orleans. That city had given him a bad feeling. The streets and the buildings were dark and old, the kind of place where ghosts could live. Daddy said there were real witches there, and maybe zombies. And Daddy had gotten drunk. Mama had sent him out alone to do it, said it might be good for him. But Daddy had come back with blood on his T-shirt and a sick smell about him. And while Trev huddled in the hotel bed with his arms around his brother and his face buried in Dee Dee's soft hair, Daddy had put his head in Mama's lap and cried. Not just a few tears, either, the way he'd done when their old dog Flaky died back in Austin. Big, gulping, trembling sobs that turned his face bright red and made snot run out of his nose onto Mama's leg. That was the way Dee Dee cried when he was hurt or scared really bad. But Dee Dee was only three. Daddy was thirty-five. No, Trev didn't want to go back to New Orleans, and he didn't want Mama or Dee Dee to be there either. He wanted them all with him, going wherever they were going right now. When they passed the sign that said Missing Mile Town Limits, Trevor read it out loud. He'd learned to read last year and was teaching Dee Dee now. Great, said Daddy. Fucking great. We did better than miss the highway by a mile. We found the goddamn mile. Trevor wanted to laugh, but Daddy didn't sound as if he were joking. Mama didn't say anything at all, though Trev knew she had lived around here when she was a little girl his age. He wondered if she was glad to be back. He thought North Carolina was pretty. All the giant trees and green hills and long curvy roads like black ribbons unwinding beneath the wheels of their rambler. Mama had told him about a place she remembered, though, something called the Devil's Tramping Ground. Trevor hoped they wouldn't see it. It was a round track in a field where no grass or flowers grew, where animals wouldn't go. If you put trash or sticks in the circle at night, they would be gone in the morning, as if a cloven hoof had kicked them out of the way and they had landed all the way down in hell. Mama said it was supposed to be the place where the devil walked round and round all night, plotting his evil for the next day. That's right, teach them the fucking Christian dichotomy. Poison their brains, Daddy had said, and Mama had flipped him the bird. For a long time, Trevor had thought the bird was something like the peace sign. It meant you liked Charlie Parker, maybe, and he had gone around happily flipping people off until Mama explained it to him. But Trevor couldn't blame even the devil for wanting to live around here. He thought it was the prettiest place he had ever seen. Now they were driving through the town. The buildings looked old, but not scary like the ones in New Orleans. Most of these were built of wood, which gave them a soft-edged, friendly look. He saw an old-fashioned gas pump and a fence made out of wagon wheels. On the other side of the street, Mama spied a group of teenagers in beads and ripped denim. One of them, a boy, flipped back long, luxuriant hair. The kids paused on the sidewalk for a moment before entering the record store, and Mama pointed them out to Daddy. There must be some kind of a scene here. This might be a good place to stop. Daddy scowled. This is Buttfuckville. I hate these little southern towns. You move in and three days later everybody knows where you came from and how you make a living and who you're sleeping with. He caressed the steering wheel. Then his fingers tightened convulsively around it. I think we can make it through to New York. Bobby, no. Mama reached over, put a hand on his shoulder. Her silver rings caught the sunlight. You know the car can't do it. Let's not get stranded on the highway somewhere. I don't want to hitch with the kids. No? You'd rather be stranded here? Now, Daddy looked away from the road to glare at Mama through the black sunglasses that hid his pale blue eyes, so like Trevor's eyes. Dee Dee had eyes like Mama's, huge and nearly black. 
What would we do here, Rosina, huh? What would I do? The same thing you do anywhere. You'd draw. Mama wasn't looking at Danny. Her hand still rested on his shoulder, but her head was turned toward the window, looking out at Missing Mile. We'd find a place to rent, and I'd get a job somewhere. And you'd stay at home with the kids, and there'd be nowhere to get drunk, and you'd start doing comics again. At one time, Trev would have chimed in his support for Mama, perhaps even tried to enlist Dee Dee's help. He wanted to stay here. Just looking at the place made him feel relaxed inside, not cramped up and hurting the way New Orleans, and sometimes Texas, had made him feel. He could tell it made Mama happy too, at least as happy as she ever felt anymore. But he knew better than to interrupt his parents while they were discussing. Instead, he stared out the window and hoped as hard as he could that they would stop. If only Mama needed cigarettes or Dee Dee had to go pee or something. His brother was toying with the frayed cuff of his shorts, dreaming, not even seeing the town. Trev poked his arm. Dee Dee, he whispered out of the corner of his mouth. You need to pee again? Uh-uh, said Dee Dee solemnly, too loudly. I peed last time. Daddy slammed his hands against the wheel. God damn it, Trevor, don't encourage his weak bladder. You know what it means if I have to stop the car every hour? It means I have to start it again, too. And you know what starting the car does? It uses extra gas, and that gas costs money. So you take your pick, Trev. Do you want to stop and take a piss, or do you want to eat tonight? Eat tonight, Trevor said. He felt tears trying to start in his eyes. But he knew that if he cried, Daddy would keep picking on him. He hadn't always been like that, but he was now. If Trev stood up to Daddy and answered back, even if the answer was giving in, Daddy might be ashamed and leave him alone. Okay, then, leave Dee Dee alone. Daddy made the car go faster. Trevor could tell Daddy hated the little town as much as he and Mama liked it. Dee Dee, as usual, was lost in space. Daddy wouldn't stop on purpose now, not for any reason. Trevor knew the car was going to break down soon. At least Mama said so. If that was true, he wished it would go ahead and break down here. He thought a place like this might be good for Daddy, if he would only give it a chance. God damn! Daddy was wrestling with the shift stick, slamming it with the heel of his hand. Something in the guts of the car banged and shuddered horribly. Then greasy black smoke came streaming around the edges of the hood. The car coasted to a stop on the grassy shoulder of the road. Trevor felt like crying again. What if Daddy knew he had been wishing for the car to break down right that very second? What would Daddy do? Trevor looked down at his lap, noticed how tightly his fists were clenched against the knees of his jeans. Cautiously, he opened one hand, then the other. His fingernails had made stinging red half-moons in the soft flesh of his palms. Daddy kicked the rambler's door open and flung himself out. They had already passed through downtown, and now the road was flanked by farmland, green and wet-smelling. Trevor saw a few patches of writhing vine dotted with tiny purple flowers that smelled like grape soda. They had been seeing this plant for miles. Mama called it kudzu and said it only flowered once every seven years. Daddy snorted and said it was a goddamn crop-killing pest that wouldn't even die if you burned it with gasoline. Daddy walked away from the car toward a cluster of trees not far from the road. He stopped and stood with his back to the rambler, his hands clenched at his sides. Even from a distance, Trevor could tell Daddy was shaking. Mama said Daddy was a bundle of nerves wouldn't even fix him coffee anymore because it just made him nervous. But sometimes Daddy was worse than nervous. When he got like this, Trevor could feel a blind red rage pulsing from him, hotter than the car's engine, a rage that did not know words like wife and sons. It was because Daddy couldn't draw anymore. But why was that? How could a thing you'd had all your life the thing you love to do most suddenly just be gone. Mama's door swung open. When Trevor glanced up, 
Her long blue-jeaned legs were already out of the car, and she was looking at him over the back of the seat. Please watch Dee Dee for a few minutes, she said. Do some reading with him if you're up to it. The door slammed, and she was striding across the green verge toward the taut, trembling figure of Daddy. Trevor watched them come together, watched Mama's arms go around Daddy from behind. He knew her gentle, cool hands would be stroking Daddy's chest. She would be whispering meaningless, soothing words in her soft southern voice, the way she did for Trevor or Dee Dee when they woke from nightmares. His mind framed a still shot of his parents standing together under the trees, a picture he would remember for a long time. His father, Robert Frederick McGee, a smallish, sharp-featured man with black wraparound sunglasses and a wispy shock of ginger hair that stood straight up on top, the lines of his body tied as a violin string. His mother, Rosina Parks McGee, a slender woman dressed as becomingly as the fashions of the day would allow in faded, embroidered jeans and a loose green Indian shirt with tiny mirrors at the collar and sleeves, her long wavy hair twisted into a braid that hung halfway down her back, a thick cable shot through with wheat and corn silk and autumn gold. Trevor's hair was the same color as his father's. Dee Dee's was still the palest silk-spun blonde, the color of the lightest hairs on Mama's head. But Mama said Trev's hair had been that color too, and Dee Dee's would likely darken to ginger by the time he was Trevor's age. Trevor wondered if Mama was out there soothing Daddy, convincing him that it didn't matter if the car was broken, that this would be a good place to stay. He hoped so. Then he picked up the closest reading material at hand, a Robert Crumb comic, and slid across the seat to his brother. Dee Dee didn't understand all the things that happened in these stories, neither did Trevor for that matter, but both boys loved the drawings and thought the girls with giant butts were funny. Back in Texas, Daddy used to joke that Mama had a classic crumb butt, and Mama would smack him with a sofa pillow. There had been a big, comfortable green sofa in that house. Sometimes Trevor and Dee Dee would join in the pillow fights, too. If Mama and Daddy were really stoned, they'd wind up giggling so hard that they'd lose their breath, and Trevor and Dee Dee could win. Daddy didn't make jokes about Mama's butt anymore. Daddy didn't even read his Robert Crumb comics anymore. He'd given them all to Trevor. And Trev couldn't remember the last time they had all had a pillow fight. He rolled the window down to let in the green-smelling air. Though it was still faintly rank with the odor of the frying engine, it was fresher than the inside of the car, which smelled of smoke and sour milk and Dee Dee's last accident. Then he started reading the comic aloud, pointing to each word as he spoke it, making Dee Dee follow along after him. His brother kept trying to see what Mama and Daddy were doing. Trevor saw out of the corner of his eye that Daddy had pulled away from Mama and was taking long strides down the highway, away from the car, away from the town. Mama was hurrying after him, not quite running. Trevor pulled Dee Dee against him and forced himself not to look to concentrate on the words and pictures and the stories they formed. After a few panels, it was easy. The comic was all about Mr. Natural, his favorite crumb character. The sight of the clever old hippie sage comforted him, made him forget Daddy's anger and Mama's pain, made him forget he was reading the words for Dee Dee. The story took him away. Besides, he knew they would come back. They always did. Your parents couldn't just walk away and leave you in the back seat, not when it would be dark soon, not when you were in a strange place and there was nothing to eat and nowhere to sleep, and you were only five years old. Could they? Mama and Daddy were far down the road now, small gesturing shapes in the distance. But Trevor could see that they had stopped walking, that they were just standing there. Arguing, yes. Yelling, probably maybe crying, but not going away. Trevor looked down at the page and fell back into the story. It turned out they couldn't go anywhere. Daddy called a mechanic, an immensely tall, skinny young man who was still almost a teenager, with a face as long and pale and kindly as that of the man in the moon. Stitched in bright orange thread on the pocket of his greasy overalls was the improbable name, Kinsey. 
Kinsey said the Rambler had thrown a rod that had probably been ready to go since New Orleans. And unless they were prepared to drop several hundred bucks into that tired old engine, they might as well push the car off the road and be glad they'd broken down close to a town. After all, Kinsey pointed out, they might be staying a while. Daddy helped him roll the car forward a few feet so that it was completely off the blacktop. The body sagged on its tires, two-toned paint of faded turquoise above the dusty strip of chrome that ran along the side, dirty white below. Trevor thought the Rambler already looked dead. Daddy's face was very pale, almost bluish, sheened with oily-looking sweat. When he took off his sunglasses, Trevor saw smudgy purple shadows in the hollows of his eyes. How much do we owe you? Daddy said. It was obvious from his voice that he dreaded the answer. Kinsey looked at Mama, at Trevor and Dee Dee in the crooks of her arms, at their clothes and other belongings heaped in the back seat, the duffel bags bulging up from under the roped-down lid of the trunk, the three mattresses strapped to the roof. His quick blue eyes, as bright as Trevor's and Daddy's were pale, seemed to take in the situation at a glance. For coming out? Nothing. My time isn't that valuable, believe me. He lowered his head a little to peer into Daddy's face. Trevor thought suddenly of an inquisitive giraffe. But don't I know you? You wouldn't be... No. Not Robert McGee. The cartoonist who blew the brain pan off the American underground in the words of St. Crumb himself? No. No, of course not. Not in Missing Mile. Silly of me. Sorry. He was already turning away, and Daddy wasn't going to say anything. Trevor couldn't stand it. He wanted to run to the tall young man, to yell up into that kind, curious face. Yes, it is him. It is Robert McGee, and he's everything you said, and he's my daddy, too. In that moment, Trevor felt he would burst with pride for his father. But Mama's arm tightened around him, holding him back. One long, lacquered nail tapped a warning on his forearm. Shh, he heard her say softly. And Daddy, Robert McGee, Bobby McGee, creator of the crazed, sick, beautiful comic Birdland, whose work had appeared beside Crumbs and Shelton's in Zap and the L.A. Free Press and the East Village Other and everywhere in between all across the country, who had received and refused offers from the same Hollywood he had once drawn as a giant blood-swollen tick still clinging to the rotten corpse of a dog labeled Art, who had once had a steady hand and a pure, scathing vision. Daddy only shook his head and looked away. Just past downtown Missing Mile, a road splits off to the left from Firehouse Street and meanders away into scrubby countryside. The fields out here are nearly barren, the soil gone infertile. Most believe from over-farming and lack of crop rotation. Only the oldest residents of town still say these fields are cursed and were once sowed with salt. The good land is on the other side of town, the side toward Corinth, out where the abandoned rail yard and the deep woods are. Firehouse Street runs into State Highway 42. The road that splits off to the left soon becomes gravel, then dirt. This is the poorest part of Missing Mile, the place called Violin Road. Out here, the best places to live are decrepit farmhouses, big rambling places with high ceilings and large cool rooms, most of which were abandoned or sold years ago as the crops went bad. A step below these are the aluminum trailers and tar paper shacks, their dirt yards choked with broken toys, rusting hulks of autos, and other trash their peripheries negligently guarded by slat-sided soporific hounds. Out here, only the wild things are healthy, the old trees whose roots find sustenance far below the ill-used layer of topsoil, the occasional rosebush gone to green thicket and thorns, the unstoppable kudzu. It is as if they have decided to take back the land for their own. Trevor loved it. It was where he discovered that he could draw, even if Daddy couldn't. Mama talked to a real estate agent in town and figured out that they could afford to rent one of the dilapidated farmhouses for a month. By that time, she said, 
she would find a job in Missing Mile, and Daddy would be drawing. Sure enough, a few days after they moved their things into the house, a dress shop hired Mama as a salesgirl. The job was no fun. She couldn't wear jeans to work, which left her with a choice of one Indian print skirt and blouse or one patchwork dress. But she ate lunch at the diner in town and sometimes stopped for coffee after her shift. Soon she met some of the kids they'd seen going into the record store, and others like them. If she could drive to Raleigh or Chapel Hill, they told Mama, she could make good money modeling for university art classes. Mama talked to Kinsey at the garage, who let her set up a payment plan. A week later, the Rambler had a brand new engine, and Mama quit the dress shop and started driving to Raleigh several times a week. Daddy had his things set up in a tiny fourth bedroom at the back of the house, his untidy jumble of inks and brushes, and his drawing table, the one piece of furniture they had brought from Austin. He went in there and shut the door every morning after Mama left, and he stayed in there most of the day. Trevor had no idea whether he was drawing or not. But Trevor was. He had found an old sketchbook of Daddy's when Mama unpacked the car. Most of the pages had been torn out, but there were still a few blank sheets left. Trevor usually took Dee Dee outside to play in the daytime. Mama had assured him that the devil's tramping ground was more than 40 miles away, so he didn't have to worry about accidentally coming upon the pacing, muttering demon. When Dee Dee was napping, something he seemed to do more and more often these days, Trevor wandered through the house, looking at the bare floorboards and the water-stained walls, wondering if anyone had ever loved this house. One afternoon, he found himself in the dim, shabby kitchen, perched on one of the rickety chairs that had come with the house, a felt-tip pen in his hand, the sketchbook on the table before him. He had no idea what he was going to draw. He had hardly ever thought about drawing before. That was what Daddy did. Trevor could remember scribbling with crayons on cheap newsprint when he was Dee Dee's age, making great round heads with stick arms and legs coming straight out of them, as small children do. This circle with five dots in it is Mama. This one is Daddy. That one's me. But he hadn't drawn for at least a year, not since Daddy stopped. Daddy had told him once that the trick was not to think about it, not in your sketchbook anyway. You just had to find the path between your hand and your heart and your brain and see what came out. Trevor uncapped the pen and put its tip against the unblemished, though slightly yellowed, page of the sketchbook. The ink began to bleed into the paper making a small spreading dot, a tiny black sun in a pale void. Then, slowly, Trevor's hand began to move. He soon discovered he was drawing Skeletal Sammy, a character from Daddy's comic book, Birdland. Sammy was all straight lines and sharp points, easy to draw. The half-leering, half-desperate face, the long black coat that hung on Sammy's shoulders like a pair of broken wings, the spidery hands and the long thin legs and the exaggerated bulge of Sammy's kneecaps beneath his black stovepipe pants all began to take shape. Trevor sat back and looked at the drawing. It was nowhere near as good as Daddy's Sammy, of course. The lines weren't straight. The black inking was more like scribbling. But it was no circle with five dots either. It was immediately recognizable as skeletal Sammy. Daddy recognized it as soon as he walked into the kitchen. He leaned over Trevor's shoulder for several moments, looking at the drawing. One hand rested lightly on Trev's back. The other tapped the table nervously, fingers as long and thin as Sammy's, faint lavender veins visible beneath the pale skin, silver wedding ring too loose on the third finger. For a moment, Trevor feared Daddy might snatch the drawing, the whole sketchbook. He felt as if he had been caught doing something wrong. But Daddy only kissed the top of Trevor's head. You draw a mean junkie, kiddo, he whispered into Trevor's ginger hair. And he was gone from the kitchen silently, like a ghost, without getting the beer or glass of water or whatever he had come for, leaving his elder son half elated and half dreadfully, mysteriously ashamed. The carefully drawn fingers of Sammy's left hand were blurring a drop of moisture on the page, making the ink bleed and furl. Trevor touched the wetness, then put his finger to his lips. Salty. 
a tear. Daddy's or his own? The worst thing happened the following week. It turned out Daddy had been drawing in his cramped little studio, had finally finished a story, only a page long, and sent it off to one of his papers. Trevor couldn't remember if it was the Barb or the Freep or maybe one of the others. He got them mixed up sometimes. The paper rejected the story. Daddy read the letter aloud in a hollow, mocking voice. It had been a difficult decision, the editor said, considering his reputation and the selling power of his name. However, he simply didn't feel the story approached the quality of Daddy's previous work, and he thought publishing it would be bad both for the paper and for Daddy's career. It was the kindest way the editor could find to say, this comic is a piece of shit. The next day, Daddy walked into town and called the publisher of Birdland. The stories for the fourth issue were already nearly a year overdue. Daddy told the publisher there would be no more stories, not now, not ever. Then he hung up the payphone and walked a mile across town to the liquor store. By the time he got home, he had already cracked the seal on a gallon jug of bourbon. Mama had begun staying later and later in the city after her modeling jobs, having drinks with some of the other models one night, going to someone's apartment to get stoned the next. Daddy didn't like that, had even refused to smoke the joint she brought him as a present from her friends. She said they wanted to meet him and the kids, but Daddy told her not to invite them out. Trevor had gone into Raleigh with Mama one day. He brought his sketchbook and sat in a corner of the big airy studio that smelled of paint thinner and charcoal dust. Mama stood gracefully naked on a wooden podium at the front of the room, joking with the students when she took her breaks. Some of them laughed at him, bent over his sketchbook so quiet and serious. Their laughter faltered when they saw the likenesses he had produced of them during the class period. The stringy-haired girl whose granny glasses pinched her beaky nose like some torture device made of wire, the droopy-eyed boy whose patchy beard grew straight down into the collar of his black turtleneck because he had no chin. But on this day, Trevor had stayed home. Daddy sat in the living room all evening, sprawled in a threadbare recliner that had come with the house, his feet tapping out a meaningless tattoo on the warped floorboards. He had the turntable hooked up and kept playing record after record, anything that his hand fell upon. Sarah Vaughan, Country Joe and the Fish, Frenetic band music from the twenties that sounded like something skeletons might jitterbug to. It all ran together in one long musical cry of pain. Most of all, Trevor remembered Daddy searching obsessively for a set of Charlie Parker records. Bird with Miles. Bird on 52nd Street. Bird at Birdland. He found them, slammed one onto the turntable. The saxophone spiraled through the old house, found the cracks in the walls, and spun out into the night. An exalted sound, terribly sad, but somehow free. Free as a bird in Birdland. Daddy hefted the bottle and chugged bourbon straight from it. A moment later, he let out a long, wet, rippling belch. Trevor got up from the corner where he'd been sitting, keeping an eye out for Mama's headlights, and started to leave the room. He didn't want to see Daddy get sick. He'd seen it before and it had nearly made him sick, too. Not even so much the sight of the thin, stringy, whiskey vomit as that of his father's helplessness and shame. His foot struck a loose piece of wood and sent it skittering across the floor. Daddy had been doing repairs around the house a few days earlier, nailing down a board that had begun to curl away from the wall. Long silver nails and a hammer were still scattered around the hall doorway. Trevor began to gather up the nails thinking Dee Dee might step on one, then stopped. Dee Dee was smart enough not to go around the house barefoot with all the splinters in the floorboards. Maybe Daddy would need the nails. Maybe he would still finish the repairs. At the sound of the nails chinking together, Daddy looked up from his bottle. His eyes focused on Trevor, pinned him to the spot where he stood. Trev, what are you doing? Going to bed. That's good. I'll fix your juice. Mama usually gave the boys fruit juice to take to bed with them when there was any in the house. Daddy got up and stumbled past Trevor into the kitchen, 
slapping one hand against the door frame to support himself. Trevor heard the refrigerator opening, bottles rattling. Daddy came back in and handed him a glass of grapefruit juice. A few drops sloshed over the side, trickled over Trevor's fingers. He put his hand to his mouth and licked them away. Grapefruit was his favorite because of the interestingly sour, almost salty taste. But there was an extra bitterness to this juice, as if it had begun to spoil in the bottle. He must have made a face because Daddy kept staring at him. Something wrong? Trevor shook his head. You gonna drink that or not? He raised the glass to his lips and drank half of it, took a deep breath and finished it off. The bitter taste shivered over his tongue, lingered in the back of his throat. There you go. Daddy reached out, pulled Trevor into his embrace. Daddy smelled of stinging liquor and old sweat and dirty clothes. Trevor hugged back anyway. As the side of his head pressed against Daddy's, a panicky terror flooded through him, though he didn't know why. He clutched at Daddy's shoulders, tried to wrap his arms around Daddy's neck. But after a moment, Daddy pried him off and gently pushed him away. Trevor went down the hall, glancing into Dee Dee's dark bedroom. Sometimes Dee Dee got scared at night, but now he was fast asleep, despite the punishing volume of the music. His face burrowed into his pillow, the faint light from the hallway casting a halo on his pale hair. Back in Austin, the brothers had shared a room. This was the first time they had slept apart. Trevor missed waking up to the soft sound of Dee Dee's breathing, to the scent of talcum powder and candy when Dee Dee crawled in bed with him. For a moment, he thought he might sleep with Dee Dee tonight, might wrap his arms around his brother and not have to fall asleep alone. But he didn't want to wake Dee Dee. Daddy was being too scary. Instead, Trevor walked down the hall to his own bedroom, trailing his hand along the wall. The old boards were damp, faintly sticky. He wiped his fingers on the front of his T-shirt. His own room was nearly as bare as Dee Dee's. They had been able to bring none of their furniture from Austin, and hardly any of their toys. Trevor's mattress lay flat on the floor, a rumpled blanket thrown over it. He had pinned up some of his drawings on the walls, though he hadn't put up skeletal Sammy, and he hadn't tried to draw any of Daddy's other characters. More drawings lay scattered on the floor, along with the comics he had scrounged from Daddy. He picked up a fabulous Furry Freak Brothers book, thinking he might read it in bed. The antics of those friendly fools might make him forget Daddy sprawled in the chair, pouring straight whiskey on top of his pain. But he was too tired. His eyes were already closing. Trevor turned off his bedside lamp and crawled under the blanket. The familiar contours of his mattress cradled him like a welcoming hand. From the living room, he heard Charlie Parker run down a shimmering scale. Birdland, he thought again. That was the place where you could work magic, the place where no one else could touch you. It might be an actual spot in the world. It might be a place deep down inside you. Daddy could only reach his bird land by drinking now. Trevor had begun to believe his own bird land might be the pen moving over the paper, the weight of the sketchbook in his hands, the creation of worlds out of ink and sweat and love. He slept and the music wove uneasily in and out of his dreams. He heard Janis Joplin singing Me and Bobby McGee, and remembered suddenly that she had died last year. From drugs, Mama had told him, taking care to explain that the drugs Janis had been using were much worse than the pot she and Daddy sometimes smoked. An image came to him of Daddy walking hand in hand with a girl shorter and more rounded than Mama, a girl who wore bright feathers in her hair. She turned to Daddy, and Trevor saw that her face was a swollen purple mass of flesh, the holes of her eyes black and depthless behind the big round glasses. Her ruined features split in the semblance of a smile as she leaned in to give his father a deep soul kiss. And Daddy kissed back. Sunlight woke him, streaming through the dirty panes of his window, trickling into the corners of his eyes. His head ached slightly, felt somehow too heavy on his neck. Trevor rolled over, stretched, and looked around the room, 
silently greeting his drawings. There was one of the house, one of Mama holding Dee Dee, a whole series of ones that he was pretty sure were going to turn into a comic. He knew he could never draw the slick, tawdry world of Birdland the way Daddy had, but he could make his own world. He needed to practice writing smaller so he could do the letters. His head slightly logy but full of ideas, Trevor rolled off the mattress, pushed open the door of his room, and walked down the hall toward the kitchen. He saw the blood on the walls before he saw Mama. It would come out in the autopsy report, which Trevor did not read until years later, that Daddy had attacked her near the front door, that they must have argued, that there had been a struggle, and he had driven her back toward the hall before he killed her. That was where he would have picked up the hammer. Mama was crumpled in the doorway that led from the living room into the hall. Her back rested against the frame. Her head lolled on the fragile stem of her neck. Her eyes were open, and as Trevor edged around her body, they seemed to fix on him. For a heart-stopping second, he thought she was alive. Then he saw that the eyes were cloudy and filmed with blood. Her arms were a mass of blood and bruise, silver rings sparkling amid the ruin of her hands. Seven fingers broken, the autopsy report would say, along with most of the small bones in her palms, as she raised her hands to ward off the blows of the hammer. There was a deep gouge in her left temple, another in the center of her forehead. Her hair was loose, fanned around her shoulders, stiff with blood. A clear fluid had seeped from her head wounds and dried on her face, making silvery tracks through the mask of red. And on the wall above her, a confusion of bloody handprints trailing down, down. Trevor spun and ran back down the hall, toward his brother's room. He did not know that his bladder had let go, did not feel the hot urine spilling down his legs. He did not hear the sound he was making, a long, high moan. The door of Dee Dee's room was closed. Trevor had not closed it when he looked in on Dee Dee last night. High up on the door was a tiny smudge of blood, barely noticeable. It told Trevor everything he needed to know. He went in anyway. The room was thick with the smell of blood and shit. The two odors together were cloying, almost sweet. Trevor went to the bed. Dee Dee lay in the same position Trevor had left him in last night, his head burrowed into the pillow. One small hand curled into a fist near his mouth. The back of Dee Dee's head was like a swamp, a dark mush of splintered bone and thick clotted gore. Sometime during the night, because of the heat or in the spasms of death, Dee Dee had kicked off his covers. Trevor saw the dark brown stain between his legs. That was where the smell came from. Trevor lifted the blanket and pulled it over Dee Dee covering the stain, the ruined head, the unbearable curled hand. The blanket settled over the small still form. Where it covered the head, a blotch of red appeared. He had to find Daddy. His mind clung to some tiny, glittering hope that maybe Daddy hadn't done this at all, that maybe some crazy person had broken into their house and killed Mama and Dee Dee and left him alive for some reason, that Daddy might still be alive too. He stumbled out of Dee Dee's room, felt his way along the hall, sprawled headlong into the bathroom. That was where Mama's friends found him hours later, when they drove out to see why Mama hadn't shown up to model that day. She was so reliable that they became worried immediately. The front door was unlocked. They saw Mama's body first, and had nearly worked themselves into hysterics when someone heard the high, toneless keening. They found Trevor squeezed into a tiny space between the toilet and the old porcelain sink, curled as compact as a fetus, his eyes fixed on the body of his father. Bobby McGee hung from the shower curtain rod. It was the old-fashioned kind, bolted into the wall, and had held his weight all night and all day. He was naked. His penis hung limp and dry as a dead leaf. There had been no last orgasm in death for him. His body was thin nearly to the point of emaciation, luminously pale, his hands and feet gravid with blood, 
his face so swollen as to be featureless, except for the eyes bulging halfway out of their sockets. The rough strand of hemp cut a deep slash in his neck. His hands and his torso were still stained with the blood of his family. As someone lifted him and carried him out, still curled into the smallest possible ball, Trevor had his first coherent thought in hours, and the last he would have for many days. He needn't have worried about accidentally coming upon the devil's tramping ground, he realized. The devil's tramping ground had come to him. From the Corinth Weekly Eye, June 16, 1972, by Denny Marston, staff writer. Missing Mile. Grizzly tragedy has struck just down the road. Hardly anyone knew that the famous underground cartoonist Robert McGee was living in North Carolina until he bludgeoned two members of his family to death, then committed suicide in a rented house on the outskirts of Missing Mile. McGee, formerly of Austin, Texas, was 35. His work has appeared in student and counterculture newspapers across the country, and he created the controversial adult comic book Birdland. Also deceased are his wife, Rosina McGee, 29, and a son, Frederick McGee, 3. Surviving is another son, name and age unknown. A state trooper commented at the scene, we believe drugs were involved. With these kinds of people, they usually are. Another trooper remarked that this was the first multiple murder in Missing Mile since 1958, when a man shot his wife and his three brothers to death. Kinsey Hummingbird of Missing Mile repaired the McGee's car a few weeks before the murders. I didn't see anything wrong with any of them, Hummingbird said. And if I had, it would be nobody's business. Only the McGee's will ever know what went on in that house. He added, Robert McGee was a great artist. I hope somebody takes good care of the little boy. No one would speculate on why McGee chose to let his eldest son live. The child has been taken into custody of the state and will be placed in an orphanage or foster home if no relatives are located. Twenty years later, one. As he walked to work each afternoon, Kinsey Hummingbird was apt to reflect upon a variety of things. These things might be philosophical, quantum physics, the function of art in the universe, or prosaic. What sort of person would take the time to scrawl Robin Fox in a freshly cemented sidewalk? Had they really thought the legend was important enough to be preserved through the ages in concrete? But never boring. Kinsey seldom found himself bored. The walk from his house to downtown Missing Mile was an easy one. Kinsey hoofed it twice a day, nearly every day of his life, only driving in when he had something too heavy to carry. A pot of homemade 15-bean soup, for instance, or a stray amplifier. The walk took him past a patchwork quilt of fields that changed with every season. Plowed under dark and rich in winter, dusted with the palest green in spring, resplendent with tobacco, pumpkin vines, or other leafy crops through the hot Carolina summer, and straight on till harvest. It took him past a fairy tale landscape of kudzu, an entire hillside and stand of trees taken over by the exuberant weed, transformed into ghostly green spires, towers, hollows. It took him over a disused set of train tracks, where wildflowers grew between the uneven ties, where he always managed to stub his toe or twist his ankle at least once a month. It took him down the wrong end of Firehouse Street and straight into town. Missing Mile was not a large town, but it was big enough to have a run-down section. Kinsey walked through this section every day, appreciating the silence of it, the slight eeriness of the boarded-up storefronts and soap-blinded windows. Some of the empty stores still bore going out of business signs. The best one, which never failed to amuse Kinsey, trumpeted Beat Christmas Rush in red letters a foot high. The stores not boarded up or soaped were full of dust and cobwebs, with the occasional wire clothes rack or smooth mannequin torso standing a lonely vigil over nothing. One rainy Saturday afternoon in June, Kinsey came walking into town as usual. He wore a straw hat with a tattered feather in its band and a long billowing raincoat draped around his skinny shoulders. Kinsey's general aspect was that of an amiable scarecrow. His slight stoop did nothing to hide the fact that he was well over six feet tall. He was of indeterminate age, some of the kids claimed Kinsey wasn't much older than them. Some swore he was forty or more, practically ancient. His hair was long, stringy, and rather sparse. His clothes were time-worn, 
colorfully mismatched, and much mended, but they hung on his narrow frame neatly, almost elegantly. There was a great deal of the country in his beaky nose, his long jaw and clever mouth, his close-set bright blue eyes. The warm rain hit the sidewalk and steamed back up, forming little eddies of mist around Kinsey's ankles. A puddle of oil and water made a swirling rainbow in the street. A couple more blocks down Firehouse Street, the good end of town began. Some shabbily genteel antebellum homes with sagging pillars and wraparound verandas, several of which were fixed up as boarding houses, a 7-Eleven, the old farmer's hardware store, whose parking lot doubled as the Greyhound bus depot, and a few other businesses that were actually open. But down here, the rent was cheaper, and the kids didn't mind coming to the bad end of town after dark. Kinsey crossed the street and ducked into a shadowy doorway. The door was a special piece of work he had commissioned from a carver over in Corinth. A heavy, satin-textured slab of pine, varnished to the color of warm caramel, and carved with irregular, twisted, black-stained letters that seemed to bleed from the depths of the wood. The Sacred U. Kinsey's real home. The one he had made for the children because they had nowhere else to go. Well, mostly for the children. But for himself, too, because Kinsey had never had anywhere to go either. A Bible-belting mother who saw her son as the embodiment of her own black sin, her maiden name was McFate, and all the McFates were psychotic delusionaries of one stripe or another. A pale shadow of a father who was drunk or gone most of the time, then suddenly dead, as if he had never existed at all. Most of the hummingbirds were poetic souls tethered to alcoholic bodies, though Kinsey himself had always been able to take a drink or two without requiring three or four. In 1970, he inherited the mechanic's job from the garage where his father had worked off and on. Kinsey was better at repairing engines than Ethan Hummingbird had ever been, though deep inside he suspected this was not what he wanted to do. Growing older, his friends leaving for college and careers, and somehow the new friends he made were always younger, the forlorn, bewildered teenagers who had never asked to be born and now wished they were dead, the misfits, the rejects. They sought Kinsey out at the garage. They sat and talked to his skinny legs sticking out from under some broken-down Ford or Chevy. That was the way it always was, and for a while Kinsey thought it always would be. Then, in 1975, his mother died in the terrible fire that shut down the Central Carolina cotton mill for good. Two years later, Kinsey received a large settlement, quit the garage, and opened the first-ever nightclub in Missing Mile. He tried to mourn his mother, but when he thought about how much better his life had gotten since her death, it was difficult. Kinsey fumbled in his pocket for the key. A large, ornate pocket watch fell out and dangled at the end of a long gold chain, the other end of which was safety pinned to Kinsey's vest. He flipped the watch open and glanced at its pearly face. Nearly an hour ahead of schedule. He liked to be at the U by four, to take deliveries, clean up the last of the previous night's mess, and let the bands in for an early sound check if they wanted. But it was barely three. The overcast day must have deceived him. Kinsey shrugged and let himself in anyway. There was always work to do. The windowless club was dark and still. To his right, as he entered, was the small stage he had built. His carpentry was unglamorous but sturdy. To his left was the art wall, a mural of painted, crayoned, and magic-markered graffiti that stretched all the way back to the partition separating the bar area from the rest of the club. The tangle of obscure band names and their arcane symbols Song lyrics and catchphrases was indistinct in the gloom. Kinsey could only make out one large piece of graffiti, spray-painted in gold, wavering halfway between wall and ceiling. We are not afraid. Those words might be the anthem of every kid who passed through that door, Kinsey thought. The hell of it was that they were afraid, every one of them, terribly so. Afraid they would never make it to adulthood and freedom, or that they would make it only at the price of their fragile souls. Afraid that the world would prove too dull, too cold, that they would always be as alone as they felt right now. But not one of them would admit it. We are not afraid, they would chant along with the band, their faces bathed in golden light. We are not afraid, believing it, at least until the music was over. 
He crossed the dance floor. The sticky remnants of last night's spilled beer and soda sucked softly at the soles of his shoes with each step. Idly brooding, he passed the restrooms on his right and entered the room at the back that served as the bar. He was brought up short by the stifled screech of the girl bent over the cash drawer. The back door stood open, as if she had been ready to leave in a hurry. The girl stood frozen at the register, cat-like face a mask of shock and fear, wide eyes fixed on Kinsey, a sheaf of twenties clutched in her hand. Her open handbag sat on the bar beside her, a perfect damning tableau. Rima? he said stupidly. What? His voice seemed to unfreeze her. She spun and broke for the door. Kinsey threw himself over the bar, shot out one long arm, and caught her by the wrist. The twenties fluttered to the floor. The girl began to sob. Kinsey usually had a couple of local kids working at the U, mostly doing odd jobs like stocking the bar or collecting money at the door when a band played. Rima had worked her way up to tending bar. She was fast, funny, cute, and, Kinsey had thought, utterly trustworthy, so much so that he had let her have a key. When he had another bartender, he didn't have to stay until closing time every night. On slow nights, someone else could lock up. It was almost like having a mini vacation. But keys had a way of getting lost or changing hands, and Kinsey didn't entrust them to many of his workers. He had believed he was a pretty good judge of character. The sacred you had never been ripped off. Until now. Kinsey reached for the phone. Rima threw herself across him, grabbing for it with her free hand. They struggled briefly for the receiver. Then Kinsey rested it free and easily held it out of her reach. The phone cord caught her purse and swept it onto the floor. The contents spilled, skittered, shattered. Kinsey tucked the receiver into the hollow of his shoulder and began to dial. Kinsey, no, please. Rima grabbed futilely for the phone again, then sagged back against the bar. Don't call the cops. His finger paused over the last number. Why shouldn't I? She saw her opening and went for it. Because I didn't take any money? Yes, I was going to, but I didn't have time. And I'm in trouble, and I'm leaving town. Just let me go, and you'll never see me again. Her face was wet with tears. In the half-light of the bar, Kinsey could not see her eyes. Her wrist was so thin that his hand could have encircled it two or three times. The bones felt as fragile as dry twigs. He eased his grip a little. What kind of trouble? I went to the Planned Parenthood clinic over in Corinth. Kinsey just looked at her. You want me to spell it out? Her sharp little face went mean. I'm pregnant, Kinsey. I need an abortion. I need five hundred dollars. Kinsey blinked. Whatever he had expected, that wasn't it. Rima had arrived in Missing Mile just a few months ago. Among local guys who had asked her out and been turned down, the word was that she carried a torch for the guitarist of a speed metal band back in her native California. So far as Kinsey knew, she hadn't been back to California recently. Who? He managed. You don't know him, okay? She swiped a hand across her eyes. An asshole who wouldn't wear a rubber because that's like taking a shower with a raincoat on. There's plenty of them around. They shoot their wad and that's the last thing they have to worry about. Now her mean face had collapsed. She was crying so hard she could barely choke out the words. Kinsey, I slept with the wrong guy. And he's not going to help me out. He won't even talk to me. And I don't want any goddamn baby, let alone his. At least tell me who. I could talk to him. There are things. She shook her head violently. No! I just want to go to Raleigh and get rid of it. I won't come back to Missing Mile. I'll go to my sister's place in West Virginia. Or maybe back to L.A. Please, Kinsey, just let me go. You won't see me around here again. He studied her. Rima was twenty-one, he knew, but her body seemed years younger. Barely five feet tall, breastless and hipless, all flat planes and sharp angles. 
Her straight, shiny brown hair was held back with plastic barrettes like a little girl's. He tried to imagine that childish body swollen with pregnancy. Could not. The very idea was painful. I can't give you any money, he said. No, I wouldn't. But you can take your last pay envelope. It's there on the bulletin board. Kinsey let go of her wrist and turned away. Oh, God, Kinsey, thank you. Thank you. She knelt and began scraping together the contents of her purse. When she had searched out everything in the dimness of the bar, she went to the bulletin board and took down her envelope. Kinsey was hardly surprised to see her glance into it, as if making sure enough money was there. She turned and stared at him for a long moment, as if deciding whether to say anything else. Good luck, he told her. Rima looked surprised, and a little guilty. Then, as if the milk of human kindness were too heady a potion for her parched soul, she spun on her heel and left without another word. There goes my mini vacation, Kinsey thought. Thirty minutes later, with the lights turned up and the swampy area behind the bar half mopped, he found the little white packet. It was nestled in a crack in the wooden floor directly below the spot where Rima's purse had spilled. With the lights off, as they had been when Kinsey caught her, it was unlikely that she would have spotted it. Kinsey bent, picked it up, and looked at it for a long time. It didn't look like much. A tiny twist of plastic, the corner of a baggie, perhaps, with an even tinier pinch of white powder inside. No, it didn't look like much at all. But Kinsey knew it for what it was. A towering monument to his gullibility. She could still be pregnant, he reasoned, as he walked to the restroom. She really could need money for an abortion. Somebody could be giving her coke. Maybe she was even selling the shit to get the money she needed. Yeah, right. The things she had said about the father of her embryo, if embryo there was, hardly suggested that he would be giving her free drugs. And Kinsey knew that the market for cocaine in Missing Mile was very poor indeed. You could hardly turn around without bumping into a pothead or a booze hound, and they treated psychedelics like candy. But coke was another thing. Most of the younger kids seemed to think it was boring. It didn't tell them stories or give them visions, didn't drown their pain, didn't do anything for them that a pot of strong coffee couldn't do for a fraction of the price. They would probably snort coke if it was handed to them, but they wouldn't spend their allowances on it. And most of the older towny crowd couldn't afford it even if they wanted it. Rima, though, seemed to have had a constant low-grade cold for the last couple of months. She was always going to the restroom to blow her nose, but she always came back still sniffling. How clear was hindsight? You could still call the cops, Kinsey told himself, as his cupped palm hovered over the toilet bowl, ready to tip the little packet in. Show them this stuff. She couldn't be far out of town yet. His hand tilted. There was a tiny splash, barely audible. The packet floated serenely on the still surface of the water. She had every intention of ripping you off. Buster. His fingers found the flush lever, pushed it. There was a deafening liquid roar. Kinsey thought the plumbing in this building was of approximately the same vintage as the Confederate boarding houses up the street, and the packet was gone. Pregnant or not, she's in some kind of trouble. That's one thing she wasn't lying about. Why make it worse for her? Later, mopping the floor near the stage, he glanced up at the art wall. The words, We are not afraid, gleamed softly at him, and he knew that wherever Rima was now, whatever she was doing, those words did not hold true for her. He could not resent letting her take her last pay, though. There was always a chance she would use the money to help herself, to get away from whatever or whoever had made her stash cocaine in her pocketbook and steal from people who wished her well. There was always a chance. Yeah, and there was always a chance that John Lennon would rise from the dead and the Beatles would play a reunion show at the Sacred U. That seemed about as likely. Kinsey shook his head dolefully and kept mopping. Two. 
Zachary Bosch awoke from fascinating dreams, pulled the pillow off his face, rubbed his eyes, and blinked up at the green lizard on the ceiling just above his head. He slept in a small alcove at the side of the room, where the ceiling was lower and cozier than the rest of his lofty French Quarter apartment. The plaster here was soft and slightly damp, cracked with age, yellowed from two years of Zack smoking in bed. Against the dingy plaster, the lizard was a vivid iridescent green. Children in New Orleans called such creatures chameleons, though Zack believed they were actually anoles. He reached for the ashtray next to the bed, and the lizard was gone in a brilliant flicker of motion. Zack knew from experience that if you were fast enough to catch them by the tail, the thready appendage would come off, still twitching in your hand. It was a game he often played with the little reptiles, but seldom won. He found the ashtray without looking, brought it up and nestled it in the hollow of the sheet between the small, sharp mountains of his hip bones. In the ashtray was a tightly rolled joint that had been the size of a small cigar, a panatella, or whatever the things were called. Zack hated the taste of tobacco and its harsh brown scorch in his lungs. He never touched the stuff. His friend Eddie put it simply, if inelegantly, if it's green, smoke it, if it's brown, flush it. Zack had smoked half of this particular green the night before, while concocting a news story to plant in the Times-Picayune just to amuse himself. A tasteful little number about some petrified fetus parts removed from a woman's womb ten years after an illegal back-alley abortion. If it wasn't true, it ought to be. Or rather, the public ought to think it was. In today's moral climate, cloudy, with a fascist storm front threatening, illegal abortions needed all the bad publicity they could get. He had made sure to stress that the woman suffered great pain, bloated grotesquely, and was, of course, rendered infertile. By the time he finished writing the article, Zack had caught himself feeling tender, almost protective, toward his hapless fiction. She was a true martyr, the finest kind of scapegoat, a vessel for imaginary pain so that real pain might be thwarted. Zack felt for a book of matches on the floor, found some from Commander's Palace, lit the joint and sucked smoke in deep. The flavor filled his mouth, his throat, his lungs, a taste as bright green as the lizard. He stared at the matchbook, which was a darker green. The restaurant was one of the oldest and most expensive in the city. A friend of a friend who was deep in hock on his American Express card had taken Zack to the bar there recently and charged Zack's four extra spicy Bloody Marys to his visa. They always did shit like that. Stupid patterns, intricate webs they wove that ended up trapping themselves most tightly of all. Geeks, marks, and conspiracy dupes. In the end, they all amounted to the same thing. Sources of income for Zachary Bosch, who was none of the above. His third-floor apartment was full of dust and sunlight and tons upon tons of paper. His friends who knew his reading habits, his smoking habits, and his squirreling habits swore the place was one of the most hair-raising fire hazards in all New Orleans. Zack figured it was damp enough to discourage any flames that escaped his notice. In deep summer, water stains spread across the ceiling, and the fine old molding began to sweat and seep. The paint had long since begun to peel, but this never bothered Zack, since most of the walls were covered with scraps of paper. There were pictures torn from obscure magazines that had reminded him of something. Newspaper clippings, headlines, or sometimes single words he had put up for their mnemonic effect. There was a large head of J.R. Bob Dobbs, high epopt of the Church of the Subgenius, and one of Zack's favorite personal saviors. Bob preached the doctrine of slack, which, among other things, meant that the world really did owe you a living, if only you were smart enough to endorse the paycheck. There were phone numbers, computer access codes, and passwords scribbled on yellow post-it notes whose glue would not stick in the damp. These last were constantly fluttering down from the walls, creating canary drifts among the debris on the floor and sticking to the soles of Zack's sneakers. There were boxes of old correspondence, magazines, yellowing newspapers from all over the world and in several languages. If he couldn't read an item, he could find someone to translate it inside of an hour. Distinguished dailies and raving tabloids. And books everywhere, crammed into shelves that covered one wall nearly to the high ceiling, spread open or with pages marked beside his bed, stacked into seuss like towers in the corners. There was every kind of fiction, telephone books, 
computer manuals, well-thumbed volumes with titles like The Anarchist's Cookbook, High Weirdness by Mayo, Principia Discordia, Steal This Book, and other useful Bibles. A cheap VCR and a homemade cable box were rigged up to a small TV. The whole setup was nearly hidden behind stacks of video cassettes. Pushed up against the far wall was the heart of the chaos, a large metal desk. The desk was not visible as such, though Zack could find anything on, in, or around it in a matter of minutes. It was heaped with more papers, more books, shoeboxes full of floppy disks, and the unmistakable signature of the ganja connoisseur, an assortment of ashtrays overflowing with ashes and matches, but no butts. Marijuana smokers, unlike those who indulged in tobacco, did not leave spore. In the center of the desk, rising above the ashtrays and drifts of paper like some monolith of plastic and silicon, was a computer. An Amiga, with an IBM card and Mac emulation that allowed it to read disks from several different kinds of computers. A sweet little machine. It was equipped with a large capacity hard disk, a decent printer, and, most important for his purposes, a 2400 baud modem. This inexpensive scrap of technology, which allowed his computer to communicate with others via any number of telephone lines, was his meal ticket, his umbilical cord, his key to other worlds, and to parts of this world he had never been meant to see. The modem had paid for itself several hundred times over, and he had only had this one for six months. He had an Oki 900 cellular phone and a laptop computer as well, with a built-in modem to keep him mobile in case of emergencies. Zack hunched himself up on his elbows, stuck the joint in his mouth, and raked a hand through his thick black hair. Some French Quarter death rockers spent hours before the mirror trying to achieve the precise combination of unnatural-looking blue ebony hair and bloomless translucence of skin that had been visited upon Zack by simple genetics. It came from his mother's side of the family. They looked as though they'd grown up in basements, not that most of them had ever been anywhere near a basement, since they'd been in Louisiana for five generations or more. His mother's maiden name was Rigaud, and she hailed from a muddy little village down in the Bayou country where the most exciting thing that ever happened was the annual crawfish festival. The hair and dark almond-shaped eyes, he guessed, came from her Cajun blood. The pallor was anyone's guess. Perhaps it came from all the time she had spent in various mental hospitals, in gloomy day rooms and harsh fluorescent corridors, as if such a thing could be inherited. She was probably in some lockup now, if she was still alive. His father, a renegade Bosch who claimed a lineage back to Hieronymus, but whose visions had all been seen through the bottom of a whiskey bottle, had long since disappeared into some steamy orifice of the city's nightside. Zack had just turned nineteen, and though he had lived in New Orleans all his life, he had seen neither of his parents for nearly five years. Which was fine. All he wanted of them was what he carried with him his mother's weird coloring, his father's devious intelligence, a tolerance for hard liquor that exceeded either of theirs. Drinking never made him mean, never made him bitter, never made him want to punch someone young and small and defenseless, to bruise tender flesh, to steep his hands in blood. He supposed that was the main difference between him and his parents. Zack had a habit of pulling his hair and snarling it around his fingers while he was reading or staring at the computer screen between keystrokes. As a result, it grew into a kind of mutant pompadour that cast the sharp planes and hollows of his face into shadow, exaggerated his pointed chin and thin peaky eyebrows, and the gray smudges of computer strain around his eyes. Last year, a ten-year-old kid on Bourbon Street had run after him calling, Hey, Edward Scissorhands! He hadn't known what it meant at the time, but when Eddie showed him an ad for the movie of that name, Zack was as close to shocked as he ever got. The resemblance was scary. He held the picture next to his face and stared in the mirror for a long time. At last, he took comfort in the fact that he never wore black lipstick, and Edward Scissorhands never wore big, round, geeky, black-rimmed glasses like Zack's. The movie bothered him, though, when Eddie took him to see it. He always enjoyed watching Tim Burton's films. They were eye candy, for one thing, but they left him feeling vaguely pissed off. They all seemed to have an agenda of relentless normalcy hiding behind a thin veil of weirdness. He'd loved Beetlejuice until the last scene, 
which sent him storming from the theater and left him kicking things all day. The sight of Winona Ryder's character, formerly strange and beautiful in her ratted hairdo and smudged eyeliner, now combed out and squeaky clean, clad in a preppy skirt and knee socks and a big shit-eating, sickeningly normal grin, it was entirely too much to bear. But that, Zack supposed, was Hollywood. He took one more drag on the joint and snuffed it out in the ashtray. It was excellent pot, bright green and sticky with resin that smelled like Christmas trees, quick to set the brain buzzing and humming. He hoped somebody at the market would have more. Zack felt around on the floor again, found his glasses and put them on. The world stayed blurry at the edges, but that was just the drugs. Something nudged his hip beneath the sheet. The remote control for the TV and VCR. He aimed it at the screen and smiled as he thumbed the on button. He found himself watching an Italian splatter movie called The Gates of Hell. Good old Lucio Fulci. His plots were brain-numbing nonsense. Every character dumber than a bag of rusty nails, but he gave great gore. And nothing normal ever happened in his movies. A girl began to bleed from the eyeballs. Fulci loved eyeballs. Then proceeded to vomit out her entire digestive tract over the course of maybe a minute. She'd been parking with her boyfriend. Such were the wages of sin. Zack pressed the reverse button and watched the actress suck up her intestines like a plate of spaghetti and marinara sauce. Tasty. A moment later, he realized that the movie was making him hungry which meant it was seriously time for some food. The remains of a muffaletta from the central grocery were wrapped up in his little dorm-style refrigerator. Zack kicked the sheet off, swung his legs over the edge of the mattress, rode the ensuing head rush for a minute, then stood and picked an expert path through the debris to the fridge. The savory smells of ham and Italian spices, oiled bread and olive salad, wafted up as he unwrapped the greasy pink butcher paper. The big round sandwiches were expensive, but delectable, and they made two or three meals if you weren't a big eater, which Zack was not. It wasn't as if he couldn't afford a muffaletta any time he wanted one. Money was free, or nearly so. All he could need was at his fingertips every time he sat down at his desk and switched his computer on. But he had never quite gotten used to having enough to eat. His parents' kitchen cabinets never had much in them but booze. The movie raged on. A priest had hung himself in the town of Dunwich, original name that, which flung wide the gates of hell or something. Zombies with bad skin conditions seemed to be able to beam themselves around like refugees from the Starship Enterprise. Zack thought of the only priest he had ever known, Father Russo, who said the masses his mother used to drag him to every few months when she was coming off a bad binge. Twelve-year-old Zack had gone to confession alone one day, ducked into the booth, and leaned his aching head against the screen and whispered, Bless me, Father, for I have been sinned against. Hot tears squeezed out of his eyes as his lips formed the words. That is not how the confession begins, the priest replied, and some of Zack's hope ebbed. But he persisted. My mother kicked me in the stomach and made me throw up. My father slammed my head against the wall. Can't you help me? bad boy telling lies about your parents. Don't you know you must obey them? If they punish you, it is because you have sinned. The Lord says, honor thy father and thy mother. What about them honoring me? He shrieked, slamming his hand against the flimsy wall of the confessional, a hot spike of pain shooting up his already sprained arm, raking the curtain back, bursting into the priest's side of the booth yanking his shirt up to display the technicolor bruises and belt stripes across his skinny ribs. What about this, motherfucker? What does God say to this? Staring into the priest's startled face, seeing the trace work of broken veins deepen from red to purple, the weak, watery eyes flare with pious anger, and knowing sickly that there was no help here, that the priest was not really seeing him, that the priest was as drunk as his parents had been last night. He had been hauled from the church and told not to come back, as if he ever would. He collapsed on the stone steps and sobbed there for an hour. Then he got up, hawked an enormous goober on the steps, and left with a silent pain that went deeper than his bruises and abrasions, all the way down to the wounded soul 
that the Catholic Church would never touch again. It would be nice to see Father Russo hanging and burning and bleeding from the eyeballs. Maybe the priest was dead now. Maybe he had the starring role in some hellish Lucio Fulci film. Zack hoped so. He chewed the last bite of muffaletta, licked the grease off his lips, and went diving for clothes. He came up with a pair of army pants cut off at the knees and a T-shirt that pictured JFK grinning toothily as his brains exploded in vivid silkscreen color. Faded red Converse high tops without socks completed the ensemble. It was time to go snag his two daily stashes. Then he could come back here and get some work done. June, as far as Zach was concerned, was the last tolerable month in New Orleans until mid-autumn. The days were already hot, but not as mired in sodden swelter as they would be through July, August, and most of September. During these obscene months, he slept all morning and afternoon, his dreams punctuated by the rattle and drip of his laboring air conditioner. He spent his nights cramming his head with information, words and images, and the subtle semiotics they triggered in his brain or hacking paths through the infinite mazes of forbidden computer systems, or simply skating around the boards, where he was not just welcome, but absurdly revered. Only long after sundown would he venture into the French Quarter to prowl the gaslit side streets, to walk among euphorically drunken tourists and roustabouts on neon-smeared Bourbon Street, to meet his friends passing a bottle of wine in front of Jackson Square, or lingering in the dark bars and smoky clubs of Rue Decatur, or occasionally throwing a small party in St. Louis No. 1, the old cemetery on the edge of the quarter. But today he descended the stairs to the sidewalk, pushed the iron gate open, and drew in a noseful of the humid air as if it were perfume. And it was, of a sort. It felt like wet cotton in his lungs, but it carried the fragrance of the quarter, a heady melange of thousands of odors, seafood and spices, beer and horseshit oil paint, and incense, and flowers, and garbage, and river mud, and underlying it all, the clean crumbling smell of age, old iron, softly sifting brick, stone trodden by a million feet, recording the infinitesimal imprint of each. Zack's third-floor apartment overlooked tiny Rue Madison, one of the two shortest streets in the quarter, along with its twin Wilkinson on the other side of Jackson Square. His row of buildings was decorated with intricate black ironwork. Only a block long, quiet little Madison ran straight into the technicolor melee of the French market. Zack passed the vintage clothing store on the corner, knocked on the open door and waved to the hippie proprietor, who had recently given him a neighborly deal on a black frock coat lined with royal purple silk, though it would be too hot to wear the thing until Christmas. Then cut through an area housing an informal bazaar where you could find useless crap, or the very treasures of Lafitte, depending upon the day and your luck. Then he was in the French market, surrounded on all sides by delicious smells and harmonious colors, and all the symmetry and bounty of the edible vegetable kingdom, heaped together in great glowing piles under one old stone roof. There were pyramids of tomatoes so achingly scarlet that they hurt the eyes, bushel baskets of eggplants like burnished purple patent leather, the verdant green of bell peppers, and the delicate creamy green of the tender little squash called merleton. There were onions as large as babies' heads, red and gold and pearly white. There were nuts and ripe bananas and cool frosted grapes, fresh herbs by the bunch, great thick braids of garlic, and dried red Tabasco peppers hanging from the rafters. There were stalks of fresh sugar cane, sold by the foot so you could gnaw and suck out the sweet juice as you walked through the market smelling and marveling. There was homegrown rice, and barrels full of shining red beans to cook it with, and long links of smoky Cajun sausage to throw in for flavor. There was a fish market to the side where you could buy fresh crabs and crawdads and catfish, bright blue gulf shrimp as long as your hand, even alligator if you liked. And in front of every stand were the vendors hawking their wares, old men who had come in laden pickup trucks before dawn, their faces seemed leather, black or tan. Cajuns, Cubans, occasional Asians. The market, Zack thought, was probably one of the most culturally and racially diverse spots in the city. Good karma for a place where, not two hundred years ago, slaves had done the morning shopping. 
Every vendor had the finest, the freshest, the cheapest goods in all the market. They all proclaimed so, each more loudly than the next, until the clamorous praise for fruits and vegetables rose to the roof and spiraled out between the stone columns. They would sell it to you by the piece, or the pound, or the whole damn lot, if you fancied. But Zack fancied other things. He walked through, looking but not stopping, until he reached the fringes of the flea market that took up the rear part of the building. Here the wares tended more toward the tacky or the weird, tables full of shell magnets and ceramic crawfish salt shakers, alternating with stands that sold leather jewelry, boot knives, essential oils and bundles of incense, and suspicious-looking cassette knockoffs, or whatever CDs the vendor had recently bought. Several of the people running the weirder stands nodded to him. There was Garrett, a nervous kid with bleached blonde hair and great tragic angel eyes, who painted pictures way too scary for the Jackson Square portrait crowd. He had a table full of crucifix pendants and rhinestone cat's eye sunglasses and was doing a brisk business. There was Serena, purple-haired patchouli-daubed priestess as calm as her name, nodding happily before her altar of bootleg cure and nirvana. Serene until some unsuspecting light-fingered customer happened along and mistook her for an easy mark. Then she whipped into ultraviolet motion, straight-arming the hapless thief with one hand, retrieving her merchandise with the other. There was spooky Larisse with her black Cleopatra eyeliner and tattered velvet dress, who did tarot readings on the square when she wasn't selling her homemade voodoo dolls in the market. Her readings were not lucrative. She told her customers so many accurate bad things about themselves that they almost always demanded their money back, and she always gave it back. But with a date scrawled across it in indelible magic marker, a day and year sometimes far in the future, sometimes ominously near. Zack scanned the stands and tables. The sign changed locations every day, but someone always had it. Finally he spotted it, taped to a table of hats manned by a lean young man with skin the color of Café Noir, and a mass of dreadlocks that seemed to burst like snakes out of the top of his skull, twisting halfway down his back, some of the strands interwoven with threads of purple, red, yellow, and green, the colors of Rasta and Mardi Gras. This gentleman went by the mellifluous name of Dougal St. Clair. The sign, taped to the edge of his table, neatly printed and discreet, read, Help us in the fight against drugs. Any donation appreciated. Zachary, I think you need a hat, man. Dougal's face split into a grin, sunny and stoned as his native Jamaica, as he waved Zack over. His voice was deep and jovial, with an accent like dark sweet syrup. He plucked a broad-brimmed black hat from the jumble on the table. An Amish hat, circled with a handsome band of black leather and silver cockle shells. To his credit, Dougal did not plop it rudely onto Zack's head just held it out until Zack had to take it. Zack held the hat in his hands, but did not try it on. Some of these guys could sell you anything. Actually, he said, I wanted to make a small donation to the cause. Yeah, man, no problem. Dougal didn't exactly stick out his hand, just eased it to the edge of the table where it would be available in case anyone wanted to slip anything into it. Zack scissored two twenties out of his pocket and palmed them over. Dougal's dark eyes flickered, clocking the amount even as he made the money disappear. He reached under his table and came out with a thick pamphlet, which he handed over to Zack. The Dangers of Marijuana. Ever so imaginative a title. The propaganda zombies were really knocking themselves out with creativity these days. Zack tucked the pamphlet into his pocket. Dougal unscrewed the top of a thermos and sloshed a generous amount of steaming black coffee into the plastic cup. The odor touched Zack's nostrils, rich with chicory. Dougal saw him squirming and offered the cup. Finish it off, man. Fresh this morning from Café du Monde. Zack's hands itched to grasp the cup. He knew how warm and comforting it would feel between his palms, knew how the smooth, slow-roasted flavor would roll over his tongue. Unfortunately, he also knew how the subsequent effects would feel, his heart slamming like a caged thing against the inner meat wall of his chest his brain drying out like a sponge, his eyeballs seeming to jitter and buzz in their sockets. I can't drink coffee anymore, he admitted. I used to love it, but now it just gives me the shakes. Dougal's heavy eyebrows drew together in genuine consternation. 
but we got to second best Joe in the world right here. Just have a slug. It'll do you right. I can't even drink decaf, Zack said sadly. My imagination's too good. You're twenty? Nineteen. And you quit drinking coffee when I was sixteen. Dougal shook his head. The frayed and festooned ends of dreads swayed gently around his face. I think you need to relax. If I couldn't drink New Orleans coffee, I guess I'd be making even more donations to the cause than you do. So what's the best, Joe? Jamaican Blue Mountain, man. Fry up some salt fish and ackee every morning, have two, three cups of Blue Mountain. You lose them dark circles under your eyes. Yeah, thought Zack, and die of a heart attack before I hit twenty-five. They shot the shit for a few more minutes. Party tonight, Dougal informed him. Bunch of folks gonna dial the trip phone at Louis, which translated to anywhere from three to twenty people are going to drop acid in St. Louis Cemetery tonight. As he made his farewells and turned to go, Dougal stopped him. You want a hat? Half price, no problem. Zack had forgotten he was still holding the black Amish hat. He started to toss it back on the table, then stopped. He didn't have a hat, and this one would keep the sun off nicely. He put it on, a perfect fit. Dougal nodded. Very fine. Make you look like a preacher man gone bad. That sunny grin again, and Zack laughed too. These guys could sell you anything. On his way back, Zack stopped at a produce stand and bought a few handfuls of thin, twisted, lethally hot red and green peppers. Once in a while, the market would get some of the orange and yellow scotch bonnets, or habaneros, that grew on bushes in Dougal's home country. They were said to be the hottest pepper in the world, fifty times the heat of the jalapeno, and they had a sweet, fruity flavor Zack loved. But the Louisiana peppers would do for now. He would snack on them later, while swigging milk and speeding down the highways of Hackdom. He supposed his strange body chemistry had its rewards. He missed coffee like a dear lost lover, but he knew no one else who could hack on acid, thrive for days on pot and Bloody Marys made of equal parts vodka, tomato juice, and Tabasco, or munch ounces of near-pure capsicum without even a scorched tongue or a burning belly to show for it. He walked back down Madison, checked his mail. Two catalogs, one from Lumpanics Unlimited, which sold books about how to obtain fake IDs and disable tanks and other useful things, and one from Mojada Mobetta, which carried every fiery sauce, spread, spice, and seasoning known to humankind. These he filed on the bed for leisurely perusal later, along with his sharp new hat. His fingers were itchy, ready to pound some keys. First he took out the anti-drug pamphlet and removed the bag of pot taped between its pages. Tight green bud, packed nearly flat laced with delicate little red hairs that spelled P-O-T-E-N-C-Y. Zack stuck his nose in the bag and breathed deep. The smell alone was intoxicating, herbal and piney. Anything that smelled that good just had to be illegal. He crumbled some onto a stray sheet of paper, removed a couple of seeds and set them aside to throw in a field later, packed the weed into his black onyx pipe and lit up. The sweet smoke curled down into his lungs, sent green tendrils into his bloodstream, uncoiled the knots in his brain. Ah, time to work. He flipped the box on, stuck the phone in the modem's cradle, and dialed an obscure local pirate bulletin board system known as Mutinet. The BBS was an information exchange for all sorts of hackers, phone freaks, and assorted computer weirdos. Zack had discovered its existence by writing a program that dialed every phone number in the area code and kept a list of the ones answered by modems. A little time spent discovering which ones led to bulletin boards and what other ones might be useful had led him to Mutinet, and a combination of brashness, twisted humor, and demonstration of his abilities had gotten him on. He had all kinds of work waiting and projects going, credit card accounts to shave pennies from like wafer-thin slices of salami, bank balances to augment, lists of phone codes to obtain for sale later. He had recently written a program that cracked the encrypted password system of the state police headquarters, and he was toying with the idea of wiping clean the records of every drug offender he could find. 
but right now he felt like fooling around on Mutinet for a while. He wasn't sure what made him do it. It wasn't how he usually began a work session, and he was never sure what gods to thank afterward, for the pirate board might have been the only thing that saved him. The system's logo appeared, along with a screen full of warnings, exhortations, and dire pronouncements, then a prompt. Zack tapped in his Mutinet handle, Lucio, and his current password, NH3GH3, and he was in. A computer BBS worked much like a real bulletin board. You could put up items for anyone to read and respond to, or you could put messages in envelopes, so to speak, for the eyes of one person only. It was better than a real bulletin board, though, because no one could deface your messages or peek into your envelopes, except the system's operator, who wasn't usually inclined to bother. He had mail waiting, a message from a talented freak named Zombie, who had given him some good uncancelled credit card numbers of the recently deceased. Grieving relatives didn't usually think to notify the card companies right away, and in the meantime the numbers were ripe for misuse or dissemination. Maybe this would be something equally nifty. He brought up his mail and sat back in his chair. And the message filled his screen, flashing like Bourbon Street Strip Club Neon, pulsing like a vein in a junkie's fevered temple. Lucio, they are on to you. They know who you are. They know where you are. Run. 3. The Greyhound bus was slow and hot and nearly empty. It smelled mostly of smoke and sweat, a tired smell like the ends of journeys, but underlying that was a faintly exotic sweetness that twined into the nostrils like opium smoke. Probably the industrial strength disinfectant they used to slop out the restroom at the back of the bus, but to Trevor it was the smell of travel, of adventure. At any rate it was an odor he knew as well as that of his own skin. He had spent a good part of the past seven years on Greyhound buses, or waiting for them in the quiet despair of a thousand cavernous terminals. The Carolina countryside rolled past his window, summer green, then dusk blue, then a deepening smoky violet. When he could no longer see by the dying sunlight that came through the window, he switched on the small bulb above his seat and kept drawing, his hand moving to the rhythm of the Charlie Parker tape on his Walkman. Now and then he raised his head and stared briefly out the window. All the cars had their headlights on, rushing toward him in an endless dazzling stream. Soon it was so dark that he could see only his own hollow-eyed reflection in the glass. The fat redneck occupying the two seats in front of him heaved a great sigh when Trevor turned on the light. Trevor was dimly aware of the man shifting in his seat, making a show of tugging his John Deere cap down over his eyes, his body giving off a strong stale odor of cheap beer and human dirt. At last he turned completely around and stared at Trevor over the back of the seat. Neckless, his head looked like a jug resting on a wall. The skin of his face was seamed and damp and blotchy, nearly leprous. He might have been nineteen or forty. Hey, you, he said. Hey, hippie. Trevor looked up but did not remove his earphones. He always listened to music at a very low volume, and he could hear fine with them on. Me? Yeah, you. Who the fuck you think I mean, him? The redneck gestured at an ancient black man asleep across the aisle, toothless cavern of his mouth gaping, gnarled hands twisting around the nearly empty bottle of night train in his lap. Ever so slowly Trevor shook his head, never looking away from the redneck's bleary, glittering eyes. Well, anyway, you mind turning that goddamn light off? I got a real bad headache, you know? Hangover, more like. Trevor shook his head again, even more slowly, even more firmly. I can't. I have to work on this drawing. The fuck you do? More of the redneck's head rose over the seat, though there was still no neck in evidence. A large, scarred hand appeared as well. Trevor saw black half-moons of dirt under each thick nail. What's a freak like you drawn that's so goddamn important? Silently, Trevor turned his sketchbook around so that the redneck could see it. The light showed every detail of the drawing. A slender woman, half-seated, half-sprawled in a doorway, head thrown back, 
yawning mouth full of blood and broken teeth. Her left temple and forehead were smashed in, her hair and face and the front of her blouse black with blood. The draftsmanship was stark and flawless, the frozen agony eloquent in every line of her body, in every stroke of her ruined face. My mother, Trevor said. The redneck's fat face quivered. His lips twitched. His eyes went shocked, momentarily defenseless, then flat. Fucking freak, he muttered loudly. But he didn't say anything else about the light, not for the rest of the trip. The bus turned off the interstate at Pittsburgh and got on the narrow two-lane state highway. It stopped for minutes at a tiny dark station in Corinth. Then there were no more stops, and it was irrevocable. It was true. He was really going back to Missing Mile. Trevor looked back down at his drawing. A line appeared between his eyebrows as he frowned at it. How weird. In the lower right-hand corner, without being aware of it, he had labeled the drawing. And he had labeled it wrong. In big, dark block letters, he had printed the name Rosina Black. But his mother's name had been Rosina McGee. She had been born Rosina Parks, but she had died a McGee. Black was the name Trevor had chosen for himself years ago the name he drew under. He didn't erase the mislabel. It was too heavily penciled. Would fuck up the paper. He wasn't much for erasing anyway. Sometimes your mistakes showed you the really interesting connections between your brain, your hand, and your heart. The ones you might otherwise never know were there. They were important even if you had no idea what they meant. Like now, for instance. Coming back here might be the biggest mistake he'd ever made but it might also be the most important thing he had ever done. He couldn't remember his last sight of Missing Mile. His mother's friends had carried him out of the house that morning, and that was all he had known for a while. Only one of them, a man with large, gentle hands, had been brave enough to edge past Bobby's dangling body and pry Trevor from his niche between the toilet and the sink. The next thing he remembered was waking up in a blank white room, smelling medicine and vomit, then screaming at the sight of a tube that snaked out of a bag hanging by the bed and ran straight into the crook of his arm. The flesh where it went in was puffy, red, sore. Trevor had thought the thing was alive, burrowing into him as he slept. He would never really trust sleep again. You closed your eyes and went somewhere else for a few hours, and while you were gone anything could happen, anything at all. The whole world could be ripped out from under you, the nurse said Trevor had not been able to hear people trying to talk to him and could not eat or drink. The tube had pumped ground-up food into his arm to keep him from starving to death, or so he understood it. He was embarrassed to find himself wearing a diaper. Even Dee Dee was too old for diapers. Then he remembered that Dee Dee wasn't anything anymore but a memory of a smashed shape on a stained mattress. His family had been dead five days had been buried while Trevor floated in that hazy twilight world. The doctors at the hospital in Raleigh called it Catatonia. Trevor knew it was Birdland. Not just the place where no one else could touch you, but the place you went when the real world scared you away. After it became apparent that no relative or friend of the family was going to claim him, and a series of cognitive tests proved he was functional, if withdrawn, the court declared Trevor McGee a ward of the state. He was placed in the North Carolina Boys' Home on the outskirts of Charlotte, an orphanage and school whose operating budget had been shaved to the bone the previous year. There was no foster family program, no special training for the gifted, no therapy for the disturbed. There was only an enormous, drafty, pillared school building and four outlying dorms all built of smooth gray stone that held a chill even in the heart of summer. There were only 300 boys aged 5 to 18, all kept crew-cut and conservatively dressed, each with his own personal hell, and none of them much inclined to help ease the weight of anyone else's. The place seemed to have no color, no texture. Trevor's thirteen years there were a collage of blurred edges, featureless gray expanses, empty city streets sectioned into little diamonds by the chain-link fence that surrounded the home and its grounds. His room was a cold square box, but safe because 
He could draw there without anyone looking over his shoulder. Most of the other boys used sports as their escape, built their dreams around athletic scholarships to state or UNC. Trevor was painfully clumsy. Except for his right hand, his body felt wrong to him, like something he wasn't entitled to and shouldn't have. He dreaded the afternoons he was forced out to the playing fields with his gym class, hot, dusty tedium, broken only by occasional panic when someone screamed at him to run or swing or catch a hurtling ball that looked like a bomb falling at a thousand miles per hour out of a dizzying clear blue sky. His life at the boys' home had been neither good nor terrible. He never tried to make friends, and mostly he was ignored. On the rare occasions that a group of predators chose him as their next target, Trevor returned their taunts until he goaded them into attacking him. They always attacked him eventually. Then he would hurt as many of them as badly as he could. He learned to land a hard punch with his left fist, to kick and claw and bite, anything that did not risk his drawing hand. He usually got the worst of it, but that particular group would leave him alone afterward, and Trevor would mind his own business until the next group came along. From things he read, he suspected it was a lot like prison. The state had cut him loose at 18 with an option to attend vocational school. Instead, Trevor headed for the Greyhound station and bought a ticket for as far as the hundred dollars in his pocket would take him. He had traveled haphazardly in those years, zigzagging between cities and coasts, picking up work here and there, occasionally selling a sketch or a comic strip for the price of a bus ticket, often more. Sometimes he met people that under other circumstances he thought he might have called friends. At any rate, people in the real world were more interesting than any he had met in the home. But as soon as he left a place, these acquaintances were gone as if erased from the world. He never let anyone touch him. Mostly, he preferred to be alone. If he was ever unable to draw, Trevor thought he would probably die. It was a possibility he always kept tucked away in a corner of his mind, the comfort of the razor or the rope, the security of poison on the shelf waiting to be swallowed. But he wouldn't take anyone with him when he went. He had not cut his hair for seven years. He had never had a permanent address. He seldom visited a town or a city more than once. There were only a few places he avoided. Austin, New Orleans, and North Carolina, until now. His 25th birthday had recently come and gone, celebrated only by the crossing of state lines, a thing that always exhilarated him a little no matter how often he did it. Trevor often came close to forgetting his own birthday. All it had meant in the boys' home was an ugly new shirt and a cupcake with a single candle on it, reminders of everything he didn't have. And besides, his birthday was overshadowed by the more important anniversary just after it, the anniversary that fell tomorrow. Twenty years since it happened, and every year strung heavy as a millstone round his heart four-fifths of his life spent wondering why he wasn't dead. It was too long. Recently, he had started having a dream of the house on Violin Road. All through his childhood, Trevor had dreamed of that last morning, that bloody morning that seemed to drip through his memory like molasses, dark and slow. That was a familiar nightmare, infrequent now. But this new dream was different, and had been coming several times a week. He would find himself sitting in the little back bedroom Bobby had used as a studio, staring at a blank sheet of paper on the drawing board. Trevor usually drew comics in his sketchbook, but Bobby had used loose-leaf paper for Birdland. Only there was no Birdland on this sheet of paper. There was nothing on it, and he could think of nothing to put on it. It stared him in the eye and laughed at him, and Trevor could almost hear its dry, sardonic whisper. The abyss stares back into you? Ha! Nothing to see but a liver pickled in whiskey and the ashes of a million burnt-out dreams. Awake, Trevor couldn't imagine not being able to draw. He could always make his hand move. An empty page had always been a challenge, a space for him to fill. Awake, it still was. But in this dream, the blank sheet of paper was a mockery. And he didn't drink whiskey or any other kind of alcohol. He had never taken a drink in his life. 
Trevor found that this dream bothered him more than the ones in which he saw his family dead. Drawing had been the only thing he cared about for such a long time. Now he was beginning to understand how the loss of it could drive someone insane. He started to worry. What if the hollow, paralyzed feeling of the dream infiltrated his waking life? What if someday he opened his sketchbook and his hand went stiff, his mind numb? The night he woke up with a broken pencil in his hands, the edges of the wood as raw as a fractured bone, the sound of the snap still echoing like a leftover shred of nightmare through his lonely boarding house room, Trevor knew he had to go back to the house. He was sick of wearing his past like a millstone. He would not let his art become one, too. The bus passed a wreck just outside Missing Mile, a small car crumpled in a ditch, sparkling shards of glass picking up the whirling red and blue lights, making the scene seem to revolve psychedelically. Trevor cupped his hands to the window, pressed his forehead to the glass. Paramedics were loading someone into the ambulance, strapped to a stretcher, already punctured with needles and tubes. Trevor looked straight down into the person's face and saw that it was a girl, maybe close to his age, face drenched with blood, chest crushed in, eyelids still fluttering. Then he saw it. The life left her. Her lids stopped moving, and he saw her eyes freeze on a point beyond him, beyond anything he would ever see in this world. The medics kept moving, shoved her into the ambulance, and slammed the doors, and she was gone. Yes, she was gone. Great, he thought. An omen. Just what I needed. A few minutes later, the bus pulled into the parking lot of the farmer's hardware store, the flat-iron-shaped building that stood lone and proud among lesser downtown structures like the prow of some landlocked ship. A small ticket office at the back and a bench in the parking lot served as Missing Miles' bus station. The Greyhound groaned to a stop alongside the deserted bench. Trevor hoisted his backpack and made his way down the aisle, then down the steps. His feet touched North Carolina ground for the first time in two decades, and a shiver ran through him like a tiny electric chill. No one else got off. The bus had seemed hot, but the humid swelter of the night outside made him realize it had been air-conditioned. The air pressed like a soft, damp palm against his face, delicious with the scents of honeysuckle, wet grass, hot charcoal, and the rich oils of roasting pork. Someone nearby was cooking out tonight. The smell of barbecue made his stomach roll over, then growl. He was either sick or starved. Years of institutional food had blurred the two sensations. The boy's home was not quite Dickensian, but second helpings were neither kindly looked upon by the cafeteria ladies, nor much desired by the boys. Maybe by now Missing Mile had somewhere to eat besides that greasy diner. But if not, the diner would do. Trevor decided to take a walk through downtown. He couldn't go out to the house yet. Not at night. He was ready for anything, but he was still scared. He would be there tomorrow, for the twenty-year reunion. Trevor only hoped he was invited this time. Kinsey knew tonight was going to suck. Rima was scheduled to work, and Rima was gone, finding someone else to rip off having raw meat scraped out of her womb, coking up her little brain until it spun like a whirligig, or maybe all of the above. So Kinsey would be working by himself. Terry Bucket's new band Gumbo was playing. Owner and manager of the Whirling Disc Record Store, Terry also played drums and sang whenever he could get a gig. Gumbo was one of the U's biggest draws now that Lost Souls were on the road, and it would be a busy night. To distract himself, Kinsey decided to have a dinner special. It would make him even busier, but he loved feeding his kids. He ran through his limited repertoire. Curry? No, it would take too long. Lentil soup? No, he'd had that one twice last week. Gumbo for the band. But his skills weren't up to it, and there was nowhere to get fresh seafood, and he never had been convinced you could make good gumbo anywhere but New Orleans. The Mississippi River water gave it that special flavor, maybe. At last, Kinsey decided tonight would be Japanese night. 
He hiked home and put together a quick broth from some elderly vegetables and a few pork bones in his freezer, loaded it into his car, and drove slowly back into town so as not to slosh it. The railroad tracks were tricky, but he managed them with aplomb. In town, he stopped at the little grocery next to Farmer's Hardware and bought twenty packages of oodles of noodles and several bunches of green onions. The rain had stopped, which meant it would be even busier. Back at the U, Kinsey took down the chalkboard over the bar, selected a piece of purple chalk, and with a flourish wrote, Japanese noodle soup, one dollar. If anyone ordered this special, Kinsey would ladle up a bowl of his homemade broth, pop in the noodles, throw away the sodium-laden flavor packet, and zap the whole thing in the microwave he kept behind the bar. The green onions were for a garnish, and he set to chopping them into small, fragrant rounds. It was getting near eight. The band wouldn't start until ten, but the kids often started drifting in this early to drink and eat and talk. Sometimes he opened the club at five for happy hour, but he hadn't been happy enough today. An hour later, the sacred U was nearly full. Admission was free until ten. After that, he would have to find someone to work the door. That was never hard. All the door people had to do was collect money, shoot the shit, and watch the band for free. If they were of age, they got a free beer, too. The club served no alcohol but beer, bottled, canned, and draft. Still, the vagaries of North Carolina law made the U a bar and forbade the presence of those under 21. For the place to be an all-ages club, as Kinsey had intended all along, it must qualify as a restaurant as well. Hence the noodle soup, the sandwiches, the odds and ends of snacks he served. At first, making the food had been a bother. Then he grew to like it. Now his cookbook collection was rapidly expanding. Regular customers gave them to him all the time, and Kinsey chose to take these as a compliment. Some of the kids he knew, the ones from Missing Mile and surrounding areas, most of whom attended a nearby Quaker school called Windy Hill. There was a public high school, too, but the kids there were mostly metalheads and shit-kickers. Kinsey knew some of them, had even helped them work on their cars, but they didn't like the music at the U. The kids who came here were of a more artistic bent, clothed in bright ragtag colors, or ripped t-shirts and combat boots, or chic, sleek black, according to their various philosophies and passions. Some dyed their hair and cropped it. Some let their hair grow long and tied it with colored ribbons. Some simply shoved it behind their ears and didn't give a shit, or pretended not to. There were poets and painters, firebrands and fuck-ups, innocents and wantons. There were missing mile townies and college kids from Raleigh and Chapel Hill, the ones with legal IDs and money for beer, the ones who paid his bills. There were younger kids furtively fumbling with flasks, adding liquor gotten from God knows where to their cokes from the bar. Unless this was done in a particularly obvious or obnoxious manner, Kinsey usually turned a blind eye. He had just hooked up a new keg of Budweiser when Terry Bucket sat down at the bar. The band had done their sound check earlier, and it was obvious they'd been practicing. They were tighter than ever. Terry's voice clear and strong. R.J.'s bass line thunderous. What do you call that style of music? Kinsey had asked after listening to a couple of numbers. Swamp rock, Terry had said with a grin. Now he grinned up at Kinsey again, stoned and amiable, muscular drummer's forearms propped on the bar, tie-dyed bandana wrapped around his dark curly hair. Noodle soup, huh? Where'd you come up with that? A cookbook called The Asian Menu, said Kinsey, with certain variations. I'll bet. Well, let's give it a try. Give me a natty boho, too. National Bohemian was the used bar brand. At $1.50 a bottle, it was a hot seller. Kinsey opened a frosty bottle and set it on the bar in front of Terry, then started preparing the soup. Talk to Stephen Ghost today, Terry said. Yeah? They call the store? Stephen Ghost were the two members of the band Lost Souls. The spray-painted lyric, We Are Not Afraid, was from World, the song they always used to close their set. Steve played a dark, fierce guitar. Ghost had a voice like golden gravel running along the bottom of a clear mountain stream. A couple of weeks ago they had returned from a gig in New York and promptly left town again for a cross-country road trip in Steve's old T-Bird. San Francisco was their ultimate destination, but they would plan their route as they traveled, and they might be gone for as much as a year. 
Yeah, the new guy answered, and Steve goes, This is John Thomas from the IRS calling for Mr. Bucket. I about pissed myself when he handed me the phone. That little bastard. Terry laughed and shook his head. Are they doing okay? Sure, they're in Texas now. Steve said they played at a coffee house in Austin and the folkies loved them. Sold some tapes, too. Maybe I ought to check out Austin. You ever been? No. One of my favorite underground cartoonists came from there, though. Bobby McGee. Terry frowned. McGee? Wasn't he the guy who... Yep. That house is still standing out on Violin Road, Terry mused. I was only eight when the murders happened, but I remember. They say it's haunted. Of course they do. It might even be true. But his comic Birdland was brilliant, right up there with Crumb, and didn't he leave one of his kids alive? Kinsey served Terry a steaming bowl of noodle soup. Yes, he left a kid. A five-year-old son, I believe. And no, I don't know whatever happened to him. I bet he was fucked up real good, said Terry, slurping thoughtfully. Excuse me. Could I get a bowl of that soup? said a quiet voice from the end of the bar. Kinsey turned. Neither he nor Terry had noticed the boy before. The bar was crowded, and the kid fit right in, tall and slender, plain black t-shirt tucked into black jeans, wavy ginger-blonde hair grown long and pulled back in a ponytail from a bony, almost delicate face. A battered gray backpack was slung over his shoulder. He looked about twenty and carried himself like someone maybe even younger, unsure of his welcome and not particularly wanting to be noticed. But his eyes were arresting. A transparent icy blue, large and round, irises rimmed with a thin line of black. They seemed enormous in the thin face. Wayf eyes, thought Kinsey. Hunger eyes. You new in town? Terry asked through a mouthful of noodles. The boy nodded. I came in on the bus about an hour ago. That's new, all right. Terry offered his hand. The boy looked confused for a moment, then reached out and shook. I'm Terry Bucket. I run the record store here, in case you need any sounds. Everything from Nine Inch Nails to Hank Williams. Hank Williams, Sr., Kinsey interjected. Sr., absolutely. For Bo Cephas, you have to drive to Corinth. He's a little too all-American for us. Who are you? Trevor Black. I usually listen to jazz. Got some of that, too. Terry grinned at the boy. After a moment's hesitation, the boy smiled tentatively back. Terry's friendliness was hard to resist. He would keep talking until a person started answering, even if it was just to shut him up. Kinsey set a bowl of soup in front of Trevor Black. The name seemed vaguely familiar, but he couldn't think why, and collected the boy's dollar. I usually buy new customers beer. If you're under 21, I'll buy you a Coke. Trevor tucked a neat bundle of noodles into his mouth. I'm 25, but I don't drink. I'll take a Coke. He chewed the noodles, then frowned. This tastes just like oodles of noodles. Terry snorted. Kinsey practices what you call found cuisine. The broth is homemade, Kinsey said coolly. Would you like your dollar back? Either of you? Terry just waved an impatient hand. Trevor seemed to consider it for a moment, then shook his head. No, this is fine. So glad it meets with your approval, Kinsey muttered, turning away to get the kid's coke. Behind him he heard Terry snort again. Kinsey closed his eyes and took several deep breaths. It was going to be a long night. An hour later, Gumbo was churning away on stage. Trevor Black was still perched on his stool nursing his third coke, and the bar was a scene of utter chaos. Kinsey had gotten a local kid called Robo to collect money at the door. Robo, at 18, was well on his way to becoming Missing Miles' resident stew bum. He got his nickname from the bottles of Robitus and he shoplifted from the drugstore. But Kinsey figured he was just capable of counting dollars, stamping hands, and managing not to pocket any of the band's proceeds, as long as Kinsey slipped him a couple of beers during the show. 
The club was packed. Terry and R.J. Miller, Gumbo's bass player, had sat in with Lost Souls a number of times and were already known as solid players. The guitarist was a glam rock dynamo, a kid named Calvin, who in fact bore a strong resemblance to the Calvin of comic strip fame, but punked out and tarted up considerably. Gumbo served up a foot-stomping set, hot as Tabasco, intoxicating as Dixie beer. Since the band started, Kinsey had been drawing constant cups of draft, popping endless bottle tops. Just before eleven, the keg of bud ran dry. Kinsey ducked into the back room and walked a new one onto the dolly. The kegs were heavy and awkward, and when he was in a hurry, he usually managed to roll them off the dolly and right onto his toes. Shit, he said loudly, as this very thing happened. As he jerked his foot away, the keg teetered and threatened to tip. Kinsey grabbed at it. If it went over, the beer inside would foam unmercifully. Customers were lined up three deep at the bar waiting to be served, and last call was just an hour away. Silently, he cursed the treacherous Rima, wishing he had busted her after all, if only for the cheap satisfaction it would give him right now. Then, suddenly, someone was beside him, wrestling with the icy keg, pushing Kinsey toward the taps, the cooler, the impatient mass of drinkers. Go wait on them. I'll hook it up. I know how. Skinny arms wrapped around the keg, heaving it into place. Deft, long-fingered hands were already tapping the valve. Trevor Black. Kinsey wondered if the kid really was twenty-five. He still looked more like nineteen, and the U could get busted if an underage person was caught serving beer. Kinsey shrugged and put it out of his mind. Taking the risk was better than losing business. Fifteen minutes or so into the rush, Kinsey could tell Trevor had done this kind of work before. He was quick to figure out where everything was. He was able to duck and dodge around Kinsey without getting in his way. Since he didn't know the prices, he just served drinks as fast as he could and left the register to Kinsey. Dollar bills flew into Kinsey's hands. The tip jar jangled with change. At last, the flood of customers flowed to a trickle, then stopped altogether. Everyone was drunk and dancing, getting into gumbo. Kinsey went up front with a round of natty bohos for the band. Terry flashed him a big smile and did a little flourish on the drums. The club was hot and steamy, smelling of sweat and beer and clove smoke. The faces of the dancing kids were slick with light, lost in musical rapture. When Kinsey made his way back through the crowd, Trevor was leaning against the cooler drinking another Coke. His smile was tentative, barely a flicker. Was that okay? To just jump in like that? Absolutely not. You're fired. They stared at each other for a moment. Then Kinsey's mouth twitched, and all at once both were laughing. Seriously, do you want a job? You can keep all tonight's tips, and I'll start you at four fifty an hour. Trevor shrugged. I have stuff to do in Missing Mile. I don't need a job right away. And I'm not really a bartender. I've just filled in for one a couple of times. Kinsey raised an eyebrow. You could have fooled me. Well, you can fill in some here if you want. Pick up a shift every week or so. Trevor stared at the floor. Maybe. It depends. Kinsey decided not to ask what it depended on. He seemed to have wrecked the moment of camaraderie already. Trevor was an odd bird his conversation seeded with chill winds and ice pockets. Kinsey searched for a neutral topic to dissipate the tension. So, if you're not a bartender by profession, what is it you do? Trevor kept looking at the floor, scuffed the toe of a ratty black sneaker over the worn boards. I draw comics. Kinsey had thought the name was familiar. Trevor Black. Didn't you have a page in Drawn and Quarterly? This was an underground comics magazine featuring some of the newest, most bizarre talent around. Trevor looked surprised, then a little disconcerted, but he nodded. Yes, that was me. It was a good strip. You know, it made me think of... A second wave of beer drinkers descended upon the bar clamoring for natty bohos. Trevor turned away to serve them so quickly that Kinsey wondered whether he was glad to get off the subject. As Kinsey rang up their purchases, his mind lingered on the comic. 
It had been an odd, brief tale, an epiphany of sorts, something about a flock of birds rising from a man's charred corpse like a feathered, jewel-eyed soul. Kinsey had been about to say how much the comic's style had reminded him of the late Robert McGee, the sharp inking and clean, graceful lines. He was sure Trevor had read Birdland. Possibly he knew McGee had died here. Kinsey might even tell him about the time he'd fixed the McGee's car, just before the tragedy. But the band was winding down. The rush went on until last call, and then it was closing time. Money to count, spills to wipe up, hundreds of cups, cans, bottles to find and empty and sort for tomorrow's recycling pickup. By the time they finished, it was after three. Kinsey popped a beer, and then picked out a tape and stuck it in the little cassette player behind the bar. Miles Davis, something from the fifties. The sound of the trumpet filled the room, easy and slow, smooth as eggnog spiked with whiskey. Trevor put his head down on the bar. Kinsey leaned against the register and closed his eyes. The music ended, and an announcer's voice came on, part of the tape, which had been recorded live on 52nd Street in the Golden Bebop days. The voice was deep, white, and juicy, and somehow seemed a distilled essence of its time. You could easily picture the guy in his sharp suit with its deep-cut lapels, hair slicked back, cool Ofe cat. Well, yeah, Miles Davis. Remember, you still have plenty of time to get to Birdland. Kinsey heard a strangled sob. He opened his eyes and stared at Trevor, who was rolling his head back and forth on the bar, his hands clawing at the scarred wood. His lips were pulled back over his teeth, and tears poured from his eyes. Kinsey could actually see them forming salty little pools on the bar's varnished surface. He moved toward the boy. Hey, Trevor? What? I don't have plenty of time to get to Birdland, Trevor cried. His voice sounded as if it were being pulled out of him, dragged over hot coals and rusty nails, tortured out of his throat. I don't have any time at all, and I'm scared. Birdland? Kinsey said softly. Trevor caught the puzzled inflection. He looked up at Kinsey, the pale flesh of his eyelids swollen his clear eyes naked and wet and terrified. And suddenly Kinsey knew that face, a five-year-old boy, in bad need of a haircut by some standards, too thin and hollow-eyed by any, standing on the side of a country road staring first at his mother, then at his father. Trevor McGee, said Kinsey. Oh, God damn. Miserably, Trevor nodded. Then he was sobbing again. Kinsey went around the bar, put a cautious hand on the boy's trembling shoulder, felt the muscles bunch up and flinch away from his palm. Don't touch me. Sorry. I didn't mean... No, I just can't... They stared helplessly at each other. Trevor's face was flushed, slick with tears. Everything in the way he held himself, arms crossed over his chest, shoulders hunched, screamed, don't touch me, as loudly as Trevor's mouth had done. But his eyes were five years old again, and begged, hold me, hold me, help me. Trevor might hate him, might even think Kinsey was hitting on him, but that was just too bad. Kinsey could not ignore such pain. I remember you, he said. I was the mechanic who fixed your parents' car. I wanted to help you then, and I want to help you now. Before Trevor could flinch again, Kinsey wrapped his long arms around the boy and held on tight. He felt Trevor's body go absolutely rigid, felt him try to pull away. If he had kept trying, Kinsey would have let him go. But after a few seconds of struggle, Trevor sagged against Kinsey's chest. I remember you too, he said. You recognized my dad. But he was ashamed of himself. Ashamed of us. You poor child, Kinsey whispered. You poor, poor child. The thin body was all sharp angles, all elbows and shoulder blades. It felt as fragile against him as that of a wounded bird. Kinsey imagined Trevor's fear unfolding like treacherous wings to carry him back to that house, back to the strange and painful year 1972, 
to the death he no doubt thought he had deserved. At last the crying faded to an occasional long tremor that jerked through the boy like an electric current. He had been leaning hard against Kinsey, his sharp chin digging into Kinsey's shoulder. Now he pulled away and slumped on the bar stool, swiping at his face. Kinsey decided not to give him time to be embarrassed. Let's go. Trevor gave him a half-wary, half-questioning look. You shouldn't be by yourself tonight, Kinsey told him. You're coming home with me. He expected argument, maybe refusal, and he was prepared to push the issue. But if anything, Trevor looked relieved. Kinsey wondered whether the boy had been planning to hike out to Violin Road, to sleep in that bad memory of a house. The house of Trevor McGee's thwarted doom, and perhaps of Trevor Black's impending destiny. Trevor slung his backpack over his shoulder, turned off the bar lights, and followed Kinsey out of the club, down the bad end of Firehouse Street, into the silent, silver-lit night. 4. Four rings. Zack counted them with his teeth gritted, his free hand viciously shredding a fundamentalist tract he'd picked up somewhere, Tomb of the Unborn. Then the gentle click of a lifted receiver, muted Dixieland jazz playing in the background. Hi, this is Eddie Sung. Eddie, for Christ's sake, you've got to help me. i got to get out of... The Dixieland changed abruptly to grinding industrial hardcore. I'm sorry I'm not here, but if you leave your number, I'll call you back as soon... Oh, shit, God damn it, Eddie, please be there, please pick up. A squealing snatch of violins. Then Eddie's answering machine beeped in his ear. Zack took a deep, sobbing breath resisted the urge to slam his own phone into the cradle hard enough to crack its casing, and tried to speak calmly. Ed, I'm in trouble. You always said you coveted my apartment. Well, call me soon enough and you might get the goddamn thing. He hung up, spun aimlessly in the middle of the room for several moments. The computer screen caught his eye, still pulsing like some obscene digital orifice. Yes, you could fall headlong into that screen that alternate reality like a cradling mouth or womb, never coming up for air, never realizing that so slowly, so smoothly you took no notice, it was chewing and digesting you. No. Blaming the computer for his troubles, that was like a terminal lung cancer victim blaming a pack of cigarettes, or worse, his faithful old Zippo. It was a tool, and he had chosen to use it. His troubles were with they whose clammy, suckered tentacle grasped the other end of that tool. William Burroughs had advised him to know what was on the end of his fork, but had he listened? Of course not. And now the dirty tines were on the verge of impaling his tongue. But in that direction, madness lay. He leaned against the door jamb that led into the bathroom, with its polished sea-green tiles and its skylight in the ceiling high above the tub, Taking a shower here was like standing beneath a sunlit waterfall, and where would he ever find such a place again? A green waterfall of a bathroom, an apartment with all his things in it, a block from the wondrous bazaar that sold everything he needed, two blocks from the bank of the Mississippi that coursed through the city like a throbbing brown artery. Before moving in here two years ago, Zack had spent most of his time on the streets and at various friends' houses. This was the first place that had ever felt like home. He wasn't sure he knew how to live anywhere else. Wasn't sure anywhere else would have him. But that didn't matter. He had been cutting things too close, taking too many dumb chances. When he started hacking three years ago, it had been just another lark, another way of amusing himself, a curiosity like getting drunk on slow gin or watching the Psychic Friends Network on late-night cable TV. During his brief high school career, he had taken an elementary programming class and ended up getting himself kicked out of the school computer room, which robbed him of his only good reason to show up at the brain-numbing, tomb-like institution at an inhuman hour each weekday morning. At sixteen, two years after leaving home, Zack dropped out and started casting about for something better. He had known immediately that hacking was it. He'd only had a cheap PC clone with a slow modem at first, but fucking around on the underground bulletin boards he found with his automatic dialing program led him to wonder about other networks, secret systems and data banks that were supposed to be hidden, but were actually right there, 
tantalizingly there, vibrating behind a thin membrane of commands and passwords. Free information and money, if only you could get at it. Zack soon discovered that he could. And it was so damn easy. But if they caught you at things like stealing from credit card companies and breaking the systems of Southern Bell, affectionately known as the Gestapo among freaks and hackers, it could be worth ten years in a federal prison. Sure, you might get out in half as many, or even less, but the thought of even one day in the pen was too much for most hackers, conjuring up vivid images of great tattooed baby rapers and serial killers cornholing their lily-white butts, then snapping their skinny necks. Zack let his knees buckle and slid down the door frame to the floor. He'd kicked off his sneakers at some point, and the green tiles were blessedly cool against the soles of his feet. He saw the round mirror above the sink reflecting his empty room, saw the dripping faucet that over the years had left a stain on the porcelain like the imprint of rusty teardrops, saw the blue ceramic mug that held two toothbrushes, one purple and one black. He kept an extra because Eddie had been known to sleep over on occasions when they watched one bad film too many, or talked too far into the night, or simply drank themselves into a stupor on the cheap bourbon Eddie loved. There was nothing untoward to it, though, nothing sexual, not even a furtive drunken groping here or there. Zack liked Eddie too much for that. But never mind who he liked. He was going to be on the road, playing it lonely for a while. Hackers were scared of prison, yes, and many of them would turn informer once they were nabbed. But most would also do anything they could to help a fellow outlaw, as long as they didn't endanger themselves. He had been communicating with other Mutinet users for more than a year. It was like frequenting some weird little coffee house, getting to know the regulars. He trusted Zombie as much as any of his less remote friends, knew Zombie wouldn't send him such a message unless his lead was reliable. And it surely was. Any number of scary companies and agencies could be after him. If they caught you stealing, they would try to fuck you up. And he had stolen a lot. And didn't he have to admit, begrudgingly, that in some extra-perverse corner of his brain, the idea of having to get out of town before sundown appealed to him? New Orleans had been the only constant thing in his life. But didn't he get an itchy foot sometimes? Didn't he sometimes think about just throwing all his stuff in his car and going? Of course he did. Everybody did, even normal people. The ones with triple mortgages and orthodontist's bills and responsibilities to everything except what they really wanted. Everyone dreamed of the open highway unspooling like a black satin ribbon beneath his wheels. It was in the American blood, some kind of racial memory. But most people never really did it. They became tied to a place by friends, possessions, habits. If you stayed in one place long enough, you started to send down tap roots. And yet it was always a possibility, just getting up one day and taking off. It was the kind of thing you thought about, but seldom did. Until you had to. Zack felt a million possibilities starting to unfold within him like a garden of dark flowers. The perfume was heady the scent of strangers, of unknown cities and towns, the subtle bouquet of adventure and its twin, danger. He was only nineteen, and he wanted to know everything there was to know in the world, to do all things, to grasp every experience in his hands and drink it down like whiskey. This couldn't break his spirit, couldn't keep him down. So they were after him, the shadowy, faceless, infinitely sinister they that seemed a peculiarly American archetype of terror. Dark trench coat, glowing eyes beneath a black slouch hat, badge in hand emblazoned with the dread legend FBI, or NSA, or worse, extended like a red-hot iron ready to sear its brand into your forehead. Every hacker, every phone freak, Every intelligent criminal Zack knew had his or her own visions and nightmares of them. But just because they were after him didn't mean they could get him. He realized that his hands were clenched into fists and his heart was pounding painfully. Excitement did that to him. He supposed it would kill him someday, but he was addicted to it. He willed his pulse to slow down, made himself unfold his hands. Tomb of the Unborn was still crumpled in one palm. Should have been a horror movie, he thought. 
Too bad someone had wasted such a great title on a piece of anti-choice propaganda, for that was what it was, complete with color shots of shredded fetuses in puddles of their own gore. He balled up the tract and threw it across the room, pushed himself to his feet, shook off the head rush, tested his balance. Cool. He'd had a few bad moments there, but now he was ready for the next reel of the grand adventures of Zachary Bosch. Zack didn't know if thinking of your life as a movie serial was healthy, but it certainly helped keep him sane. Bourbon Street runs through the Vieux Carré for 14 blocks, beginning on the more or less north side at the wide avenue called Esplanade. On that side of the quarter, Bourbon is funky and fashionable, paved with cobblestones, lined with dark little neighborhood bars and dearly priced studio apartments, haunted on hot nights by boys sweating in brazenly tight leather. The middle blocks of Bourbon are part tawdry carnival and part efficient tourist mill, the tinsel and glitter of Mardi Gras for sale year-round, plastic cups of beer and frozen daiquiris and hurricanes sold right on the sidewalk, racks of t-shirts, postcards, plastic alligators and mammy dolls, and Nolan's voodoo kits side-by-side side with window displays of glitter condoms, penis neckties, lurid latex vibrators. Here are the big strip clubs with their hucksters and roustabouts outside, bars flashing neon and touting endless drink specials, a few famous restaurants and a slew of pretenders. Every souvenir shop has poppers of amyl nitride for sale in the back. In combination with the abuse of other substances, indulging in these makes the head seem to lift off the shoulders and fill the skull with a dazzling, infinitely expanding light. But at the other end of Bourbon, the end that runs into Canal and the downtown skyscraper sprawl of the central business district, a different miasma hangs over the street. An air of dinginess that is somehow timeless, a seedy, mysterious air. The city looms above the old buildings of the quarter, making them look gray and small and slightly faded. The bars feature no specials or cutely named cocktails, but the drinks are cheap and strong. On this end of Bourbon Street, sandwiched between a pawn shop and a po'boy stand, was the Pink Diamond Lounge. It was identifiable as a strip club only by the design stenciled on the door, a nude female silhouette inside a figure that might have been a diamond but looked a great deal more like a vulva. A lone bouncer nodded in the recesses of the doorway, letting loose a half-hearted line of patter when any likely customers passed by, knowing they had already heard it all farther up the street. The interior of the pink diamond was dark, except for the tiny, garishly lit stage. Smoke lurked in the corners and in a swirling blue layer near the ceiling. A few dancers wriggled gamely in front of beer-stained tables, not on top of them, as was popularly believed of table dances. No table in the pink diamond could bear the weight of a healthy girl, and most could have been reduced to matchsticks by a ninety-pound junkie. One dancer stood in the dust-choked area behind the stage waiting for her cue. A muffled cough and snort sounded over the PA. She would bet her day's tips that Tommy, the DJ, was doing a line right there in the booth. Usually he went to the men's room, but the manager wasn't here today and no one else cared. And now, in her last set of the day, the sweetest charm of the Orient, Miss Lee. The first notes of her music pounded out of the speakers. A cure song cranked up so loud that the words were distorted but it didn't matter because no one else in this club had ever heard of The Cure, except maybe a couple of the other dancers, and no one cared what music she danced to anyway as long as she showed her tits. Miss Lee threw back the dusty velvet curtain and kicked one leg out, long and silky pale, shod in a spike-heeled, silver-chained, black leather ankle boot, and the crowd went wild. If you could call five or six unshaven, seedy-looking men a crowd, and if a few listless hoots and whistles the lewd waggling of a tongue in the general direction of her crotch, or the simple act of lifting beer to mouth could be considered wild. Miss Lee undulated onto the tiny stage. A ring of globe-shaped bulbs lit her from below, playing over her black vinyl T-strap and bra as she moved, showing off what curve she had. Five or six of the bulbs were dead, spaced at uneven intervals like rotten teeth in a jaw. She stalked to the pole, placed strategically at center stage, wrapped her arms around it and straddled it. She arched her back and worked the pole with her hips, letting her mouth fall open and her eyes slip half shut into the dazed, drugged-looking expression that was supposed to pass for ecstasy. 
Then she pushed away from the pole, paused in front of the first stage rat, and began a slow, insistent grind in front of his face. After a couple of minutes, he pinched two crumpled dollar bills out of his shirt pocket and slid them into her garter, making sure to run his nicotine-withered fingers as far up her thigh as he thought he could get away with. His sour scowl never wavered. Miss Lee gave him a gaseous smile and moved on to the next customer, who was marginally young and good-looking, and therefore less likely to tip. She wondered what they would think if they knew where her stage name came from. She had been born in New Orleans of Korean parents, and Loop, the Pink Diamond's manager, had advised her to pick some kind of fake Chinese name to capitalize on her ethnic looks. A lot of guys go in for that kind of thing, he'd added, as if letting her in on a big guy secret. She had chosen the name Lee after a character from her favorite book, Naked Lunch. When a customer was nasty, or business was bad, or she was just in no mood to shake her ass for a bunch of human dildos, she would think of junk-filled needles jabbing into putrescent veins, of swollen cocks leaking foul greenish slime, of beautiful boys fist-fucking by the light of a rotten cheese moon. It didn't make her happy, but it helped. Her second song began, The Pixies' Number 13 Baby. She glanced over at the DJ booth and saw Tommy grimace at the whining voice and churning psychedelic guitar. His tastes ran more to bands like Triumph and Foreigner, fake corporate metal, maybe a little Guns N' Roses if he was feeling really radical. Miss Lee reached back to unhook her bra and felt a bill being tucked into the back of her garter, a dry hand whispering over her left butt cheek and gone before she could turn her head. She caught sight of the customer in one of the mirrors that ringed the stage. A tall black guy, head down, already disappearing into the darkness of the bar. For some reason, the black men who liked her seemed embarrassed by their attraction. Maybe because she was so pale. Surreptitiously, she reached around and palmed the bill, slid it to the side of her leg. It was a ten. Jackpot! That pushed her over the hundred-dollar mark. Good money for the day shift. She could actually afford to go home. She stared at her reflection receding into infinity as she peeled the vinyl top away from her small, firm breasts. A thin silver chain connected them, attached to delicate rings through both of her café au lait-colored nipples. The rest of her skin was a pale matte almond, ribs showing through like slats in a shutter, body too scrawny, except for her rounded shelf of a butt and her tiny pot belly, legs muscled from six-hour shifts on spike heels and long walks through the French Quarter. Her face was rather flat, her wide lips unrouged. She hated the way she looked in lipstick, especially the greasy pink-orange stuff most of the other dancers smeared on their mouths, and her dark, narrow eyes smudged with purple shadow and black mascara, half hidden by her messy platinum wig. You got the most beautiful hair I ever seen, a rube tourist had once told her reverently, and how she had longed to whip it off and drop it in his lap. Instead, she had smiled sweetly and taken his money. Third song, Prince's Darling Nikki, a small concession to the crowd, give them something they've heard before. And it was a dirty song, the famous dirty song that had kicked off the PMRC's entire crusade against dirty music, or whatever it was, by using the word masturbating in its lyrics. Bless it. Miss Lee hooked her thumbs into the elastic of her G-string, pulled the tiny scrap of vinyl tight over her crotch so that the folds of her labia were all but outlined in shiny black. To get away with this trick, she had to shave her pubic hair to the approximate size and shape of a Band-Aid, and it still wasn't enough. They always wanted to see more. Pull it to the side, some old fart would croak, waving a dollar in her face as if it were worth her job. Let me see some hair. Hey, are you a natural blonde? That line was always good for a snigger. The men who came here could never see enough of her body. It was as if they wanted to take her apart. If she could remove her G-string, they'd want her to bend over and spread her cheeks so they could look up her twat. If she could do that, she supposed, they'd want her to unzip her skin and peel it off. But it was a job, though precious few of the men who paid her salary seemed to realize that. It was amazing how many thought the dancers did this to meet guys or get erotic thrills. It allowed her to set her own schedule and paid better than waiting tables, which she had also done. Dancing was much less demeaning. People saw restaurant workers as automatons, extensions of the tables and chairs, 
Fair game for anything from tip stiffing to verbal abuse. But dancers, especially ones with any kind of good looks, were often treated like the epitome of unattainable goddesshood. Even in a joint like the Pink Diamond, the men were crude and gross and often infuriating, but hardly ever flat out mean. And if they were, the dancers could have them kicked out. Some girls tried to get customers thrown out just for making raunchy remarks. Miss Lee thought this was stupid. Men who made such remarks were usually drunk, and drunk men usually tipped better. And she couldn't help pondering the morality of girls who shook their tits in the face of any guy with a dollar to his name, but blanched when they heard the word pussy. It was an okay job, but she wouldn't mind winning the sweepstakes tomorrow. She sank to the stage in a modified split that set them peering at her crotch in the eternal quest to see hair, collected a few more dollars, and disappeared behind the curtain as the last strains of Darling Nikki died. She and the next dancer, a tall muscular girl with bleached blonde hair and smooth ebony skin who called herself Baby Doll, groped their way past each other in the cramped coffin-like area. How are they? Baby Doll whispered. Miss Lee shrugged. Not great. Honey, they're never great. Miss Lee laughed. Baby Doll dabbed at her liberally applied pinky-orange lipstick, hoisted her heavy breasts so that they rode high and round in the D-cups of her red sequined halter top, and ducked on stage as Tommy botched the lead-in to her first song. Miss Lee walked down a short, shabby corridor to the dressing room. The heels of her boots dug into the bare concrete floor and sent bolts of agony up her calves. Boots were more comfortable than the pumps most girls wore, since they gave her ankles some support, but at the end of a shift she could still feel every step she had taken on those four-inch spikes. She tugged them off as soon as she hit the dressing room, collected the sweaty dollars stuffed into her garter and her G-string, peeled off both, and dove into her bag for street clothes. An oversized black ministry shirt, a pair of cutoffs, and her Converse All-Stars, one black, one purple, safety pinned and scribbled upon. She had another pair just like it at home. After six hours on high heels, there was nothing more comforting than shoving your sore toes into a pair of soft, sloppy sneakers. She stopped by the DJ booth to tip out. Don't spend it all in one place, Tommy, sniffle, snort, and cut through the club. A blubbery redneck she'd table-danced for earlier tried to wave her over, but she stared right through him and kept heading for the door. Once she was done, she was done. Just outside the door, she stopped, whipped off the platinum wig and stuffed it into her bag. Her hair underneath was black, buzzed nearly to the scalp except for wispy bangs that fell over her face and a few long skinny braids sprouting here and there. One of her small ears was pierced with thirteen silver hoops beginning at the lobe and curling gracefully up around the delicate rim. From the other dangled a single cross with a tiny ruby-eyed skull at its juncture. She ran her hand through her buzz cut and breathed in the twilight air of the French Quarter and let Miss Lee go for another night. She was Eddie Sung now, and her evenings were her own. The gas lamps were just beginning to come on, their soft yellow glow flickering on every corner. She thought of stopping off for a beer and a dozen oysters on the half-shell somewhere. The salty, briny flavor of them always drove the taste of a day's false smiles out of her mouth. But no, she decided. She would go home and check her mail and her messages, and then maybe she would call Zachary and see if he wanted to go eat oysters. They were supposed to be an aphrodisiac. Maybe they'd work on him. Ha! She should be so lucky. Eddie allowed herself a rueful little laugh and set off through the quarter for home. Five. Zach was already throwing the last of his movable belongings into his car when Eddie arrived. She had run all the way from her apartment on St. Philip after hearing his message on her answering machine, and her face was flushed and sweaty, her breath coming in harsh, shallow gasps. But Zack looked worse. His green eyes had a feverish sheen. Beneath a ridiculous black bad cowboy hat she hadn't seen before, his peaked pale face was nearly luminescent in the gaslit gloom of little Rue Madison. He crammed a box of papers into the back seat of his Mustang, turned to grab another box, and saw Eddie. His face froze. For an instant, he looked terrified. Then he stumbled toward her and threw his arms around her. Her heart broke a little, but Eddie was used to this. It happened every time she saw Zack. They got you? 
He nodded. The words, I told you so, hung in the air, but she would not dream of speaking them. How bad? The warning said, they know who you are. They know where you are. I don't think they really know where I am yet or they'd be here. But they could be finding out right now. They could show up any time. Eddie glanced nervously back toward Charters Street. Except for an occasional ripple of street jazz or burst of drunken laughter, all was quiet. I'm taking the incriminating stuff with me. The computers, my disks, my notebooks. The place will be clean if you want to move in. If they show up and want to search, let them search. They won't find a damn thing. He looked proud, defiant, exhausted. Eddie reached up to touch her fingertips to his perspiring face. Her heart was not just breaking, but imploding. He was all but gone. Come sleep at my place tonight, she said. No one can find you there. Leave in the morning with some rest. He didn't even hesitate. I want to get as good a start as possible. If I go now, I'll have the cover of the night. The cover of the night. To Zack, this was some big adventure. He was scared, yes. But more than that, he was excited. She could hear it in the tremor of his voice, see it in the blaze of his eyes. He was like a racehorse getting ready to run, elegant nostrils flaring, velvet flanks bunching and tensing. She had thought perhaps one last night together, but she knew what it would have been like. They would have stayed up drinking and smoking pot and talking until dawn, maybe whipped up a batch of cayenne popcorn and watched a weird movie or two. And that would have been it. Zack didn't mind if she leaned against his shoulder, didn't mind a casual touch of the hand or ruffling of his unruly hair. But anything more obvious on her part, like the couple of times she'd leaned over and kissed him full on the lips, would be met with, I can't, Ed, I just can't. And if she asked why, she would get the infuriating answer, because I like you. It wasn't as if Zack were celibate or gay either. She had seen him pick up scores of people at the clubs and bars they both frequented, and the ratio was only slightly in favor of cute young males. He always seemed to go for the good-looking and the empty-headed, preferably drunk, ideally with some absent girlfriend or boyfriend to absorb the aftershock. He had only one inflexible rule. They had to have a place to fuck. He would not take them back to his sanctuary of an apartment, would not share his nest with his bimbos. Maybe he was embarrassed for his computer to see them. The next day, or night, he would brush them off, not in an especially cruel way, but in a manner that left no doubt that they had been nothing but caprices. It was, Eddie thought, as if Zack considered sex a biological need on the order of going to the bathroom. You didn't form an emotional bond with every toilet you took a crap in, and when you were done you flushed and walked away, feeling better to be sure, but not really thinking about what you'd just done. It raised Eddie's blood pressure, and frustrated her, and made her crazy. Any other friend or potential lover with such an attitude would have been long since trashed. But Zachary was so sweet, so smart, so cool otherwise, that this seemed an aberration a flaw or a handicap he could not be blamed for, like a strawberry birthmark or a missing finger. She supposed part of it was the hell he had watched his parents put each other through, and the hell he had endured at their hands. And she kept hoping part of it could be blamed on his age. Almost any character defect was forgivable at nineteen. Eddie was twenty-two, and far more worldwide. Won't they know your car? she asked. I've already switched the plates. She glanced at the back end of the Mustang. Zack's license plate read F.E.T. 213, which looked awfully familiar. Isn't that the same one you always had? I didn't switch plates on the car, he explained patiently. I switched them in the DMV computer. My plate is completely wiped out of existence, and I gave myself the plate of some Cajun's 1965 Ford pickup down at Homa. Oh, it can't be traced to me. Uh-huh. Trust me, Ed. I'm making a clean getaway. I just need to get going. They stood awkwardly in the deepening gloom, staring at each other. You already have a key, Zack said. You want the extra? No. You'll need it if you come back and I'm not home. I'm not coming back, Eddie, 
he said gently. Not for a long time, anyway. I'll kill myself before I'll let them lock me up. I know. She would not lose her composure, would not slobber and bawl, would not beg him to take her along. If he wanted her along, he would have said so. So, well, I can't call here, but I'll try to get in touch somehow. You do that. She crossed her arms over her chest, shook a few tiny braids out of her face, fixed him with a steely eye. Eddie, don't you fucking Eddie me. You could have been more careful. You didn't have to show off and take so many dumb chances. It wasn't like you needed the money. You could have stayed. Now she was crying. She bared her teeth at him, narrowed her eyes nearly to slits to hide the tears. I know, he said. I know. He took two steps forward and enfolded her in his arms again. She laid her wet cheek against the soft cotton of his T-shirt, breathed his smoky, slightly sweaty boy smell, held his skinny body tight against her. This was how it should have been all along. Too bad he hadn't agreed. Be safe, she told him at last. I'll be careful. Where will you go? He shrugged. North. They stared at each other again, at a loss for words, but not yet ready to say goodbye. Then Zack leaned down and, ever so carefully, as if touching together two live wires, placed his lips against Eddie's. She felt the electric thrill of contact, the very tip of his tongue touching hers, and an exquisite heat exploded from the center of her womb. For an instant, she thought her innards would simply melt out of her pussy and run down her thighs, so intense was the rush. But then Zack pulled back and stepped away. Gotta go. Eddie nodded, did not trust herself to speak. She watched him walk around the front of the car, slide into the driver's seat, turn the key in the ignition. The powerful engine leapt to life, ready to carry Zachary Bosch far away from New Orleans, far away from Eddie Sung. The horn beeped twice, and then he was pulling away from the curb, red taillights pausing at the corner, then merging into the nighttime traffic of Decatur Street. Gone. Eddie stood for several minutes in the shifting shadows cast by the wrought iron balconies overhead. She glanced at the door that led up to Zack's place, touched the key ring in her pocket, then shook her head. The Madison Street apartment was much nicer than her own roach-infested closet, and she knew the rent was paid for the rest of the year. Zack hated thinking about mundane matters like rent, so he paid it off at the beginning of each year when he renewed his lease. She would start moving her things in tomorrow. But she could not go up there now, while his presence still lingered painfully strong, like a voice just beyond the range of hearing, like an atom-thin membrane between reality and memory. She turned and walked back up Madison, turned left on charters, and headed for Jackson Square. The spires of St. Louis Cathedral loomed ahead, moon-pale and mysterious, stabbing like bony fingers into the purple night sky. A brick commons lay between the cathedral and the square, and kids in thrift shop black and painted leather and torn denim were already beginning to congregate there, smoking cigarettes, passing bottles of cheap wine. Eddie stopped at the bank machine on the corner of Charters and St. Anne. She still had her day's pay in her pocket, a fat wad that rubbed against her leg and made her nervous. She would deposit it, saving out thirty dollars, enough to get good and drunk. Then she might go and join the kids on the square, or she might find a dark little bar and drown her sorrows alone. She filled out a deposit slip, stuffed her money in the envelope, popped her card into the slot and punched in her personal number, then the necessary information. She heard little wheels grinding deep inside the machine. The screen asked her if she needed traveler's checks for that summer vacation. Finally, her $80 deposit was processed and the machine spit back her card, then a printed receipt. Eddie turned away, glanced idly at the receipt, and stopped dead in her tracks. A couple of frat boy tourists crossing the commons nearly walked into her, swore at her, and stumbled on. She ignored them, kept staring dumbly at the slip of paper. She tried squinting and blinking, 
but the numbers stayed the same. She'd paid her rent a couple of days earlier, and that put the balance of her checking account at a precarious $380.82. It now stood at $10,380.82. She'd never let Zack give her money. It was too dangerous for him, and she liked taking care of herself. But it appeared he had left her a farewell present. He got on Highway 90. Other than Super Interstates 59 and 10, which were as dull as direct dialing a long-distance call and paying for it with your own credit card, the two-lane blacktop was pretty much the only way out of New Orleans and left the city under cover of the night. The Rolling Stones song of that name pumped monotonously in his head, curled up baby, curled up tight, an unwelcome echo from the bruised ache and white-hot hatred of his eleventh year. It reminded him that he had hardly any tapes in the car. He'd left his music, books, and movies for Eddie, since he could always get more. But he should have brought a few for the road. He'd stop and get some later, when his thoughts quieted down enough to make listening worthwhile. He was already sick of wearing his new hat, so he chucked it into the back and raked a hand through his hair. It was tangled, dirty, and felt like it was standing up at fifteen different angles. So much the better for that popular Edward Scissorhands look. A few miles out of New Orleans, Ninety wound past an enclave of Vietnamese restaurants and stores, an exotic little Asian village set down in rural Louisiana, nurtured by the bounty of the rivers, lakes, and bayous. Though Eddie was Korean, the sight made him think of her, gave him an empty feeling somehow. He'd eaten dinner at her parents' house in Kenner once, had been served oyster pancakes and a wonderful concoction of rice, fresh greens, seaweed, raw fish, and hot sauce heaped in a giant glass bowl and called Fia Duke Bop. Zach kept hearing it as Fetus of Bob, but that hadn't lessened his appetite. Once Eddie's mom saw he loved the turbo hot sauce, she kept plying him with increasingly fiery tidbits and condiments until he was munching whole the deadly little red peppers she minced into her kimchi. It was then, he guessed, that the Sungs had decided their daughter just might be able to marry an American. Not that they had much to say about any of Eddie's actions, though they believed she was a cocktail waitress at the Pink Diamond, or pretended they did, and not that Eddie expected Zack to marry her. He felt a twinge of unease that was as close to guilt as he ever got. He knew perfectly well how different Eddie had wanted their friendship to be, but it was impossible for him. Loving someone was okay, and fucking someone wasn't bad either. But if you did both with the same person, it gave them too much power over you. It let them plunge their shaping hands into your personality, gave them a share of your soul. He had grown up watching his father change his mother from a sickly, scared, but harmless creature into a sadistic bitch with twisted knives for fingers and a spitting, shrieking mouth. A mouth full of broken teeth, to be sure, but all the pain she had taken from her husband she gave back to her son, a gift wrapped in cruel words signed in blood. And his parents had loved each other, in whatever mutually parasitic way they were capable of. He had watched their heart-ripping fights and sodden reconciliations, heard their anguished love-making through the thin walls of many cheap apartments too often not to believe that somehow they were passionately in love, or had been once. There had never been room for him. Zack sometimes thought that if he had not been born, the two of them might have managed a kind of happiness together. Joe with his broken-backed dreams and his fierce intelligence tamped down by liquor, Evangeline with her bruises and black eyes and always hungry loins. If only his mother had managed to scrape up, pun most certainly intended, the cash for the abortion she often wished aloud that she had had. If only his father's rubber hadn't broken. And how many times had Joe taunted him about that damn rubber? The thing was practically a Bosch family heirloom. In the too silent darkness, Zack punched at the buttons of the radio, twisted the tuning knob. Frizzly static greeted him, then a spurt of jazz. A ripple of piano and timpani, a trembling, exalting alto saxophone. He disliked the Dixieland jazz he had heard all his life, as he did Cajun music, and indeed anything with accordions or brass in it anything that sounded like growing up in New Orleans. Such music twisted barbs into his memory, ran too deeply into his blood. 
But this wasn't New Orleans stuff. Kansas City, maybe. It sounded less frenetically cheerful, exotic somehow, musing and dreaming. He left it on. After the Vietnamese enclave, the highway passed through an interminable stretch of beach cabins with cute names, Jimmy's Juke Joint, Little Bit of Heaven, Moon Mansion, replete with a big plywood ass shining in his headlights, and private driveways that went straight down to the dark water on either side. This was the beginning of Bayou Country, and there was very little solid land. Zack pondered the name of his own imaginary cabin. Hacker Hideaway? Outlaw Asylum? No. Bosch's Blues. Check all Uzis and Secret Service badges at the door. Gradually, the cabins grew sparser and shabbier. Some were bereft even of their names, or bore signs with the words and crude bright illustrations worn away. Then they were gone, and the road was empty, straight, flanked by dark expanses of water and woods and shadow. He crossed a bridge that arced high above the water, saw moonlight shimmering on the surface like pale jewels. The radio station never faded out, though Zack thought he drove 50 miles or more, past bland green vistas and ugly stretches of consumer land, Kmarts and quick stops, and fast food charnel houses shut down against the night. In one of these towns, a fried human ear had been found in a box of takeout chicken, like some cannibalistic remake of Blue Velvet by way of Colonel Sanders. Zack remembered reading the story in some tabloid out of Baton Rouge and wishing he thought it up himself, wondering if it were true or whether there was another prankster out there somewhere creating urban mythology in giant digital strokes. The same song seemed to keep playing over and over, as if the DJ had set the CD on infinite replay and gone to sleep. The sax wailed and sobbed. The piano dreamed behind it. At last, he reached the Gulf Coast and began his meandering trek along it. The little coastal towns shut down after ten. There was only the long, deserted stretch of white beach broken by marinas and piers, and beyond it, the black expanse of the Gulf of Mexico. His parents had brought him here once, when he was ten or so. Zack remembered smelling the salt air as they drove down, imagining the blissful caresses of the sand and water. In reality, the sand had had an unpleasantly powdery feel, like ordinary playground dirt. There had been a scum of pollution at the water's edge, a pale brown froth that ebbed and flowed with the waves. It smelled faintly of dead fish, engine sludge, chemicals gone bad. But out past the beach, the water was the color of new denim and felt so good on his parched, abused skin. He had ducked his head beneath the surface, seal-like, and hadn't stopped swimming out to sea until his father's harsh hands grabbed him by the hair and wedged the back of his swim trunks up the crack of his scrawny ass. The car swerved slightly to the right. Zack caught it at once, but the memories were starting to hypnotize him, to pull him toward the water. A town marker flashed by. Pass Christiane. Pronounced not like Christian, Zack knew, but like a girl's name, Christiane. He was already in Mississippi and hadn't even noticed. Fine old southern mansions loomed sepulchrally along the left side of the road, shrouded in ghostly curtains of Spanish moss and the giant knurled oaks that had hung on through a hundred hurricane seasons or more. The beach on the right was pure white, shining. Zack hooked a left off the highway and headed for past Christiane's downtown, such as it was. A man was pissing against a wall outside the Sea Witch Tavern. A dim, tempting blue light burned somewhere deep in the bar, like a siren luring travelers to a watery grave. The other buildings were dark and still. After driving several blocks, Zack came upon a lone convenience store called Breadbasket, its neon flickering fitfully, flooding its little patch of town with erratic dead-white light. There were no cars in the parking lot, but Zack saw a clerk nodding at the register, blonde head drooping over the Slim Jims and Confederate lighter displays. As he parked the car, the jazz tune finally ended. He heard a guttural voice as of a DJ roused from long and peaceful slumber. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, Laura by Charlie Parker, a whole bunch of times. The inside of the store assaulted his corneas like an acid vision after the calm silver and charcoal of the night. Zack observed that the clerk had not been napping, 
but studying with rapt attention a magazine spread out on the countertop. It was open to a black-and-white photograph of a lanky, bare-chested, feral-faced boy who looked a lot like the clerk himself. Can I help you? A plastic name tag was pinned to the lapel of the boy's blue polyester store jacket. Leaf. Hippie parents would do the damnedest things. Yeah. Can I smell your coffee? Huh? Your coffee. Zack waved at the coffee machine and its trappings against the opposite wall. Can I just smell it? Sure, I guess. Leaf glanced down at the photo again, then unhurriedly closed the magazine. It was an old issue of GQ. If you're looking for Hawaiian Kona, though, you're out of luck. It's just evil old homebrew. That's okay. I don't actually want to drink any. Zack crossed to the coffee maker, pulled the pot out of the metal apparatus that kept it at sub-boiling point, and passed it slowly back and forth beneath his nose. Hot, bitter steam wafted into his face, moistened his tired eyes. He felt microscopic particles of caffeine traveling up his nostrils, into his lungs, out through the interfaces of his bloodstream, and straight into the hard drive of his weary brain. His heart gave a jump and began beating faster. The rush made his mouth dry. As he grabbed a bottle of mineral water out of the cooler, he found himself wondering why a cute kid who read GQ and knew about Hawaiian Kona coffee was working at a bread basket in Pass Christiane, Mississippi. At the register, Zack set his drink on the counter, added a lighter, patterned in gaudy pink and black zigzags but no rebel flag, and pulled out his wallet. He hadn't tried to access any of his various bank accounts before he left town, knowing that all of them could be watched. And he could get more. He'd only brought the stash of ready cash he kept for an emergency such as this. He had always known that he might have to bail out someday, and that he would have to do it fast. Now he found that the smallest bill in his wallet was a hundred. Can't change it, Leaf said apologetically. They only let me keep fifty dollars in the register after ten, and I haven't had shit for business. I'm really thirsty. Well... Zack caught the other boy's eyes with his own and held them. Leaf's eyes were long and slightly tilted, gimlet eyes, the same warm honey gold as his hair. Just give me the stuff, he suggested. I'll get you stoned. This was a simplified version of a hacker technique known as social engineering. It could be used to reassure an operator that she was talking to a bona fide telco technician. It was good for all manner of scamming, impersonation, and general fraud. This cute clerk was no challenge at all. The seeds of rebellion were already planted. Zack could see the kid mulling it over, talking himself into it. He leaned an elbow on the counter and offered his most charming smile. What do you say? Well, oh, fuck it. Take whatever you want. I don't care. I'm quitting soon anyway. Thanks. That's real neighborly of you. Zack whisked the lighter into his pocket cracked the mineral water open, and took a long gulp. It tasted flat and dead, but then he was used to the carcinogenic soup that passed for tap water in New Orleans. Plenty of flavor in that. Leaf snorted. Neighborly. Like you live in Mississippi. I'll bet you're from New York or something. Zack hadn't heard that one before. People sometimes thought he was part Oriental, a fact that amused Eddie no end, but no one had ever accused him of being from New York. He decided the idea appealed to him. Well, yeah, he admitted. How'd you know? The way you talk. And you don't look like you're from around here. The only other place you could have come from is New Orleans. Never been there. In a burst of inspiration, Zack added, Yet. It's where I'm headed. Their eyes met again and locked. For an instant, Zack imagined that Leaf was able to look straight into his brain, to see the lie and the convoluted reason behind it, the miles he had already run and all the miles still ahead. But Zack knew that was not true. And even if it were, he could see in those warm, honey-colored eyes that this kid wouldn't care. Leaf accepted Zack's offer and locked up the store, and they went into the back room to smoke one of the joints Zack had rolled for the trip. Leaf lounged on a crate of toilet paper, long legs sprawled before him. There was a small, defiant hole in one knee of the faded jeans he wore with his uniform shirt. 
The skin beneath was downed with fine gold hairs. Zack leaned against the opposite wall, watching Leaf's nervous gestures, tasting Leaf's lips on the joint. The stock room of a convenience store in Mississippi seemed a stupid place to get waylaid this early in the trip. But the damn kid was making his mouth water. I'm quitting tomorrow, Leaf said after his third toke. I hate this fucking place. What are you doing here anyway? I'm an art student in Jackson. Photography. I was supposed to spend the summer here taking pictures, preserving the goddamn history or something. But it sucks. None of the rednecks know anything, and none of the rich old farts will even talk to me. I don't know which stuff is supposed to be important. I guess I'll fail my project. Can't you do some research? What do you mean? Go to the library. Find out where people lived. What houses are haunted. That kind of thing. Most of the old newspapers are probably on microfilm. Leaf looked up at Zack. The whites of his eyes were shot with a faint scarlet tracery of veins, but the irises and pupils were heartbreakingly clear. I'm a totally visual person, he said. I hate reading. Zack bit his tongue hard, dug his fingernails into the soft meat of his palms. That was the kind of casual statement that could send his blood pressure rocketing if he let it. But now it produced only a faint twinge in his heart, like a filament stretched to the breaking point. So the kid was vapid. So much the better. It made things easy, and Zack would never have to see him again after tonight. You hate all kinds of stuff, he said. Leaf shrugged. I guess. Tell me something you like. This was evidently a tough one. Zack could see the kid sifting through possibilities, rejecting them one by one. I like the beach, he said finally. I never go in the water, but I like to sit on the sand and stare out to sea. It makes me feel like I'm looking into infinity, you know? A screen full of scrolling numbers flashed through Zack's head. He nodded. I like sleeping. Another nod this one coupled with the barest suggestion of a shrug. Tell me something I couldn't have guessed. I like you, okay? They had both known they weren't just locking themselves back here to smoke a joint, but the rest of their agenda had to be obliquely tested so that no one would lose face. Zack knew the game and approved. He smiled and raised an eyebrow, waited for more. Oh, just come over here and let's fuck. Now that was Zack's idea of an excellent pickup line. He slid across to the case of toilet paper, and suddenly Leaf was upon him, face pressed up against his, one hand slipping under his T-shirt, the other squeezing his leg beneath his loose cutoffs. Leaf's mouth found his and closed over it, hot little tongue probing and searching, piney flavor of the weed still on his lips. His spidery hands flew over Zack's skin as if trying to memorize its warmth and texture. His touch was starving, frantic. The poor kid probably hadn't been laid all summer. Zack pushed him gently back against the wall, unbuttoned the tacky polyester uniform, stroked the boy's smooth chest and the hollow of his ribcage, managed to calm him down a little. He kissed the side of Leaf's throat. The pulse that beat there was as agitated as his own. The skin smelled of soap and salt, tasted of clean sweat. Leaf slid to the concrete floor and sprawled between Zack's knees, pressed his face into Zack's stomach and mumbled something unintelligible. Zack cupped the boy's chin, tilted the sharp, feral face up to his own. What did you say? I want to make you come. How? Those exotic, honey-colored eyes tried to meet his, then wavered. Leaf wasn't used to talking dirty. How? he asked again. I want to suck your dick. The words increased his desire, made him ache and burn. Go on, Zack said through clenched teeth. Just do it. The boy's hands fumbled with the button fly of Zack's pants, friction driving his heart on nearly to the point of pain. Then all at once, Leaf's hot mouth slid onto him then pulled all the way back to a teasing, flickering tongue tip, then swallowed him deeper yet. 
Zack felt the pot and pleasure swirling in his skull, deliciously mingling. God loved the kid. It turned out he knew what he was doing after all. Zack always appreciated it when people surprised him. Twenty minutes later, stocked up with a handful of lighters, a six-pack of mineral water, and two bags of jalapeno potato chips, Zack renewed his acquaintance with Highway 90. It would take him through Biloxi, through the tag end of Alabama, and all the way to Pensacola in another hour or two. After that, he thought, he would get off 90, but keep heading east, all the way to the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. Somewhere, he knew, there was a beach that was clean. Leaf hadn't asked him to stay overnight, hadn't seemed put out in the slightest by the encounter. After getting each other off, they had rested together for a few minutes, embracing loosely, catching their breaths. Zack had spent the moments appreciating the spare, elegant lines of the boy's face and body, admiring the sheen of his silky hair in the half-light of the storeroom. Then, by some silent mutual consent, they rose and pulled their clothes together and went blinking back out into the unmerciful brightness of the store. At the door, they clasped hands briefly. By the way, Leaf told him, I like your shirt. Zack glanced down at himself. He was still wearing the exploding Kennedy head. He wondered idly if some buried sixth sense had made him put it on this morning as a twisted metaphor for what was to follow. Thanks, he said, and gave Leaf's talented fingers one final squeeze. In its way, it was quite a tender farewell. The day had followed a steep curve down to hell, but now it seemed to be inching back up. The interlude with Leaf had relaxed him, left him feeling sharp and awake, as if Leaf had imbued him with some vital essence, as indeed he had. Surely there was some energy in calm, some electrifying charge. And Zack had given as good as he got. He always deserted in the end, like the bastard Eddie thought he was, but he always tried to make his lovers feel good in the brief spans of time he spent with them. He had even left Leaf with another tightly rolled sticky joint to stave off tomorrow night's ennui. All in all, Zack mused as he reconnected with the silent ribbon of highway, it had pretty much been the perfect relationship. Six. Trevor awoke from a dream of blank paper, laughing up at him his mind a monochrome wash of panic, his heart clenching around a core of emptiness. If he couldn't draw, if he couldn't draw. The sheets Kinsey had given him were twined around his legs, sodden with nightmare sweat. Trevor kicked them away and shoved himself upright. His bag lay on the floor next to the sofa. He pulled out his sketchbook, opened it to a clean page, and sketched furiously for several minutes. He had no idea what he was drawing. He was only reassuring himself that he could. When his heart stopped pounding and his panic began to fade, Trevor found himself staring at a rough sketch of his brother lying on a stained mattress, small hands curled in death, head crushed into the pillow. He remembered that today was the day his family had died. Trevor felt like throwing the book across the room. Instead, he closed it and slid it back into his bag, found his toothbrush in the zipper pocket, then stood up and stretched. He heard his shoulders crack, his spine make a noise like a muffled burst of gunfire. Despite the flattened cushions and the occasional sharp end of a spring, Kinsey's sofa had been a welcome place to sleep. Trevor was surprised to find it comforting to be invited into someone's home, to have a known human presence in the next room. He had grown used to cheap hotels and run-down boarding houses. On the other side of the wall might be drunken sobs or curses, the moist tempo of sex, the silence of an empty room, but never anything familiar, never anyone who cared that Trevor Black was there. Kinsey's living room was sparsely furnished with more thrift shop relics, an easy chair, a reading lamp, a wooden bookcase listing under the weight of too many volumes, paperbacks mostly. Trevor read some titles as he passed. One Hundred Years of Solitude, The Stand, Short Stories of Franz Kafka, Whole Shelves of Hesse and Kerouac, Even Low by Charles Fort. Eclectic tastes, that Kinsey. 
There were some crates of comics, too, but Trevor did not look through them. He had his own copies of Birdland. Coming upon other copies in a comic shop or someone's collection was always unnerving, like seeing someone he had thought dead. There was no TV, Trevor noted approvingly. He hated TV. It brought back memories of a crowded day room at the home, the sweaty smell of boys, voices raised in fury over what channel to watch. The stupidest ones had always screamed for a cartoon show out of Raleigh called Barney's Army. Barney was a cartoon character himself, squat and ugly, announcing kids' birthdays and cracking lame jokes between Looney Tune shorts. He was so badly animated that no part of him moved but his pitifully stubby, flipper-like arms, his prognathous jaw, and his big googly eyes. Trevor figured he had probably hated Barney as much as any real person he had ever known. The bathroom tiles were spotless, deliciously cold against his bare feet. He used the Toms of Maine cinnamon-flavored toothpaste on the edge of the sink, then splashed cold water on his face. For a long moment, he stood staring into the mirror. His father's eyes looked back at him, eyes rimmed in black, faintly challenging. Do you dare? You bet I do. The door of Kinsey's bedroom was ajar. Trevor peeked into the shady room. Kinsey's tall form lay sprawled across the bed, skinny legs half covered by a vivid patchwork quilt. He was the only person Trevor had ever seen who actually wore pajamas, bright blue ones, the same color as his eyes, patterned with little gold moons and stars. Trevor hadn't even known they made pajamas in Kinsey's size. For a few minutes, he watched the gentle rise and fall of Kinsey's chest, the draft from the open window that stirred Kinsey's scraggly hair, and he wondered if he had ever slept so peacefully. Even when Trevor wasn't having bad dreams, his sleep was uneasy, sporadic, full of flickering pictures and half-remembered faces. But the luminous face of the clock on Kinsey's nightstand, no cheap digital job, but a molded plastic relic done in early 60s aqua, its corners rounded and streamlined, told him it was nearly noon. He had to go. Not to the house yet, no, but he had to take the first step toward the house. Trevor slung his backpack over his shoulder, stepped out into the tranquil Sunday morning, and locked Kinsey's door behind him. The road that led out to Missing Miles' small graveyard was hot and flat and muddy. Trevor was accustomed to walking city streets, where the languid haze of summer was shot through with blasts of air conditioning from doors constantly opening onto the sidewalk, where you could always duck under an awning or the overhang of a building into a little pocket of shade. But this road, Burnt Church Road, according to the crooked signpost where it ran into Firehouse Street, offered no shade except the occasional leafy canopy of a tree. The houses out here were few and far apart. Most had been built on farmland, and the road was bordered by fields of leathery tobacco and bristling corn. This was a nicer area than Violin Road. The dirt here had not yet been farmed to death. The houses were not new or fancy, but their yards were large grassy expanses unmarred by scrap heaps or the rusting hulks of autos. The sun beat mercilessly on the road and on the coarse gravel that paved it, broken granite like the crushed leavings of a cemetery, mired in wet red clay, catching the light and shattering it into a million razored fragments. Trevor was glad when clouds began to blow in, a slow-brewing summer thunderstorm on the way. His brain felt baked in his skull, and his skin already tingled with fresh sunburn. His backpack was waterproof to keep his sketchbook dry. If the storm held long enough, he would start a new drawing at the graveyard. If not, he would sit on the ground and let the rain soak him. Trevor could feel the nearly silent presence of death up ahead, not precisely watchful, not even really aware, but somehow detectable. It was like a frequency on a radio, or rather the empty space on the band between frequencies. There were no signals to pick up, but still you heard a faint electric hum, not quite silence, not quite sound. It was like being in a room someone had just left, a room that still bore the faint scent of breath and skin the subtle displacement of air. An epileptic kid had died on his hall at the boys' home once, pitched a grand mal fit in the hours before dawn, when no one was awake to help him. Trevor had woken in the cool, still morning and known that death was close by, 
though he hadn't known who it had come to or how. But the graveyard gave off only a quiet buzz like crickets in the sun, like the cogs of a watch beginning to wind down. Set back at the shady dead end of Burnt Church Road, surrounded by woods on three sides, it was a place that felt like surcease from pain. Trevor had never seen the burial place of his family. As soon as it came into view, he knew that this was a fitting prelude to going home. Of course, they hadn't let him attend the funeral. As far as Trevor knew, there had been no proper funeral. Bobby McGee had burned most of his bridges when they left Austin, and they had no family but each other. The town, he supposed, had paid for the interment of three cheap pine coffins. Later, a group of comics artists and publishers had taken up money for a stone. Someone had sent Trevor a Polaroid snapshot of it years ago. He remembered turning the picture over and over in his hands until the oil from his fingers marred the slick paper, wondering who had cared enough to visit and photograph the grave of his family, but not enough to rescue him from the hell that was the boy's home. He also remembered a drawing he had done soon afterward, a cutaway view of the grave. He made the headstone look shiny and slick, as if some thick, dark substance coated the granite. The earth below was loamy, seeded here and there with worms, nuggets of rock, stray bones come loose from their moorings. There were three coffins, two large ones with long shrouded forms within, their folds suggesting ruined faces. The shape in the littlest coffin was strange. It might have been one form grossly misshapen, or two small forms mingled. Mr. Webb, the junior high art teacher who hid Listerine bottles full of rot-cut whiskey in his desk, had called the drawing morbid and crumpled it. When Trevor flew at him, skinny arms outstretched, hands hooked into claws going unthinkably for Webb's eyes, the teacher backhanded him before he knew what he was doing. Both were disciplined, Webb with a week suspension, Trevor with expulsion from art class and confiscation of his sketchbook. He covered the walls of his room with furious art, swarming thousand-legged bugs, soaring skeletal birds, beautifully lettered curse words, screaming faces with black holes for eyes. They never let him take an art class again. Now here was the place of his drawing and his dreams, the place he had imagined so often that it already seemed familiar. The graveyard was much as he had pictured it, small and shady and overgrown, many of the stones listing, the roots of large trees twining through the graves and down into the rich soil, mining the fertile deposits of the bodies buried there. Trevor wondered whether he might find Dee Dee's face in a knot hole, the many colors of Mama's hair in a shock of sun-bleached grass, the shape of his father's long-fingered hands in a gracefully gnarled branch. Maybe. First, though, he had to find their grave. Trevor rummaged in his backpack, found a can of Jolt Cola, popped the top, and tipped the warm soda into his mouth. The sickly sweet taste foamed over his tongue, trickled into the cracks between his teeth. It tasted horrible, like stale carbonated saliva, but the caffeine sent immediate electric tendrils into his brain, soothed the pounding at his temples, cleared the red cobwebs from his vision. It was the only drug he had much use for. Once he'd started to develop a taste for speed, but quit the first time he detected a tremor in his hand. Pot reminded him too much of his parents in the good days, back when Bobby was drawing. Alcohol terrified him. It was nothing more than death, distilled and bottled. And junk held such a morbid fascination for him that he dared not try it, though he had been in plenty of low haunts and back alleys where he could have had some if he'd wanted to. He knew it was supposed to be clear, yet he imagined it black as ink, swirling out of the needle and through his veins, lulling him into some dreadfully familiar nightmare world. He drank the last vile swig of jolt, stuck the empty can back in his backpack, and set out on a meandering path through the graveyard. The ground was uneven, the weeds in some places tall enough to brush the tips of his fingers. He caught at them, let them slip through his hands. This was not missing Miles' only burying ground. Trevor had glimpsed a few small church cemeteries on his way into town, and he remembered that the surrounding woods were seeded with old Civil War graves and family plots, sometimes just two or three rough-hewn stones in a lonely little cluster. But this was the oldest one still in use. There were recent stones, 
letters and dates chiseled so sharply that they seemed to float just above the slick surface of the granite. Flecks of quartz and mica caught the receding light. There were old markers, stone crosses and arched tablets of slate, their edges crumbling, their inscriptions beginning to blur. There were the small white stones of children, some topped with lambs like smooth cakes of soap partly melted in the shower. Some graves were splashed with gaudy color, flowers arranged in bright sprays or tortured into wreaths. Some had gone undecorated for a very long time, and some had never been decorated. Pain shot through his hands. Trevor found himself standing before a long, plain slab of granite. He realized he had been standing there for several minutes, working his hands against each other, twisting his fingers together until the joints screamed. He made himself flex them one by one. Then he raised his head and looked at the gravestone of everyone he had ever loved. McGee, Robert Frederick, born April 20th, 1937. Frederick Dillon, born September 6th, 1969. Rosina Parks, born October 20th, 1942. Died June 14th, 1972. Trevor had forgotten that his brother's middle name was Dylan. Mama had always told people it was for Dylan Thomas, the poet. Bobby pointed out that the kid was born in 69. No matter what anyone said, everybody would assume he was named after Bob Dylan. It would haunt him all his life. But Bobby had taken care of that. During his walk out here, Trevor had wondered if they might all start yammering at him, their voices warming up through six feet of hard-packed earth through twenty years of decay and dissolution, over the chirrup and buzz of insects in the tall grass and the slow rumble of the storm coming in. But though he still sensed the soft hum of the collective dead, his own dead were silent. Now that he was here, he felt curiously flat, almost disappointed. No one had spoken to him. No skeletal hand had thrust up to grab his ankle and drag him down with them. Left out again. Trevor knelt and laid his palms briefly against the cool stone, then put his backpack down and stretched out on the ground. In the center of the grave, over Dee Dee, he supposed. It was hard to believe that Dee Dee's body, the body he had last seen stiff and cold in bed with its head smeared like overripe fruit across the pillow, lay directly beneath him. He wondered if any reconstruction of the heads and faces had been done or if Dee Dee's fragile skull had been left to fall to pieces like a broken Easter egg. The ground was warm under his back, the sky overhead pregnant with clouds, nearly black. If he was going to do any drawing here, he'd better get started. He unzipped his bag and took out his sketchbook. A pencil was wedged into the coiled wire binding. Trevor fingered it, but did not pull it out just yet. Instead, he turned to the drawing he had finished on the bus. Rosina Black, the dead version of Rosina McGee, with none of her wit or warmth, with nothing but a cold ruined shell of a body. Seven fingers broken as she tried to fight Bobby off in the doorway to the hall, beyond which lay her sleeping sons. Had she been trying to grab the hammer? And if she got it, would she have killed her husband with it? Trevor thought so. That would have changed every part of the equation but one. Bobby would still be dead, and Trevor would still be alive. Only if it had gone down that way, at least Trevor would know why he was alive. He reached into his backpack again, felt way down deep in the bottom, found a battered manila envelope, and took out three folded sheets of paper. The folds had worn through many times over, had been taped back together and refolded, until some of the photocopied words on the paper were nearly illegible. It didn't matter. Trevor knew them by heart. They all followed the same format. Robert F. McGee, Rural Box 17, Violin Road, Male Caucasian, 35 years, 5'9", 130 pounds, blonde hair, blue eyes. Occupation, artist. Cause of death, strangulation by hanging. Manner of death, suicide. Other marks, scratches on face, arms, chest area. He knew Mama had made those scratches, but they hadn't been enough, not nearly enough. Fingernails weren't much use once the fingers were broken. 
He folded the autopsy reports and slid them back into the envelope. He had stolen them from his file at the home and carried them with him since then. The paper was worn soft and thin, read a thousand times. The ink was smudged with the whorls of his fingerprints. The storm was very close now. The hum of insects in the grass, the trill and call of birds in the surrounding woods seemed very loud. The afternoon light had taken on a lurid greenish cast. The air was full of electricity. Trevor felt the fine hairs on his arms standing up, the nape of his neck prickling. He flipped to a clean page in his book, freed his pencil, and began sketching rapidly. In a few minutes, he had roughed out the first half of his idea for a strip. It stemmed from an incident in a biography of Charlie Parker he had read at the home. In his thirteen years there, Trevor had read just about everything in the meager library. Most of the other kids wondered why he wanted to read anything at all, let alone a book about some dead musician who had played a kind of music that nobody listened to anymore. The incident had happened when Byrd was touring the South with the J. McShann Orchestra. Jackson, Mississippi was a bad place for black people in 1941. Trevor doubted it was any great shakes for them now. There was a curfew requiring them to be off the street by 11 p.m., so unless they wanted to risk arrest, or worse, the band had to be finished and packed up by 10.30. There was no hotel in Jackson that would admit them, so the musicians were farmed out to various shabby boarding houses and private homes. Bird and the singer, honky-tonk blues man Walter Brown, drew cots on the screen porch of someone's house. They were out of the converted barn where they had played and back at the house by 11.00, but since their usual lifestyle kept them up until the small hours, the musicians were far from sleepy. They lay on their cots under the meager yellow glow of the porch light, passing a flask and sweating the liquor from their pores as fast as they swallowed it in the sodden Mississippi heat, slapping at the mosquitoes that slipped through holes in the screen, shooting the shit, talking of music or beautiful women, or perhaps just how far they were from Kansas City. At midnight, the police showed up four beefy good old boys with guns and nightsticks, and necks as red as the blood they were itching to spill. The burning porch light was a violation of the nigger curfew, they said, and Bird and Brown could come along to the station with them, and if they didn't care to come peacefully like good boys, why then, they were welcome to a few lumps on the head and a pair of steel bracelets. Charlie Parker and Walter Brown spent three days in Jackson jail for sitting up talking with the porch light on. Charlie had the sharpest tongue, and so came out of it the worst. When McShann was finally able to bail them out, Bird's close-cropped hair was still stiff with dried blood, where the nightsticks had split the skin over his skull. He had not been allowed enough water to wash the crust of blood away. Brown claimed to have kept his mouth shut, but sported some lumps and bruises of his own. Bird had composed a tune to commemorate the incident, first called What Price Love, but later retitled Yardbird Sweet. His fury and wounded pride wound through the song like a crimson thread, a sobbing, wailing undertone. How to get all that into a single strip, a few pages of black and white drawings? How to best show the tawdry tenement where they had been sequestered, the weathered wood and torn tar paper houses, the narrow, muddy streets, the stupid malice on the faces of the cops? It was the sort of thing Bobby had done effortlessly in the three issues of Birdland. His stories had taken place mostly in the slums and beat sections of New York or New Orleans or Kansas City, not Jackson, Mississippi. And his human characters had been fictional junkies and street freaks and jazz musicians, not real ones. But the mood of Birdland, the stark, slick, slightly hallucinatory drawings, the distorted reflections in puddles and the dark windows of bars, the constant low-key threat of violence, the feeling that everything in the strip was a little larger than life, and a little louder, and a little weirder, that was what Trevor wanted to capture here. For now, though, he was just sketching in the panels and their contents, space for captions and word balloons, rough figures and backgrounds, the barest hints of gestures and expressions. The faces and hands were his favorite part. He would linger over them later. He had already drawn Bird hundreds of times. The handsome, fleshy features appeared on the margins of his pages and woven into his backgrounds nearly as often as the face of his father. He reached the part on the porch, just before the police arrived, and the first time Walter Brown's face appeared in close-up. 
His pencil slowed, then stopped, and he tapped the eraser against the page thoughtfully. He realized he had never seen a picture of Brown, had no idea what the singer looked like. No problem. He could wing it, improvise the man's face like a jazz solo. He already had a hazy picture in his head, and even as he thought about it, the features grew clearer. His fantasy Walter Brown was a very young man, about 20. But then they had all been young, mostly younger than Trevor was now, and boyishly thin to bird's fleshiness, with high cheekbones and slightly slanting dark almond eyes. Handsome. This was how he usually worked, pondering an idea for months, turning it over and over in his head until he had nearly every panel in line worked out. Only then did he put pencil or pen or brush to paper, and the thing spilled full-blown onto the page. Bobby had been the same way, working in feverish bursts and starts. And when the inspiration was gone, it was gone forever. At least if that happens to me, Trevor reminded himself, I won't have anyone to kill. There was no person he had cared that much about. Incidents like the one with the art teacher were a different thing altogether. You could cheerfully rip such people's heads off and drink the fountaining blood from the neck stumps in those first few minutes of blind rage if the fragile constraints of civilization and lack of physical power did not bind you. But later, when you had time to think on it, you realized that nothing could be gained by hurting such people, that perhaps they were not even alive enough to feel pain. You could make better use of your anger by keeping it to yourself, letting it grow until you needed it. Still, if you loved someone, really loved them, wouldn't you want to take them with you when you died? Trevor tried to imagine actually holding someone down and killing them, just breaking them apart, watching as the love in their face turned to agony or rage or confusion, feeling their bones crack and their blood flow over your hands, under the nails, greasing into the palms. There was no one with whom he would want such intimacy. Kinsey had hugged him last night in the club, had held him as naturally as one might hold a suffering child. It had been the first time Trevor had cried in another person's presence in twenty years. For that matter, it was as physically close to another person as he had been since the man with gentle hands carried him out of the house, since his last glimpse of his father's swollen face. These two brief meetings of clothed skin were all he'd had. No, he remembered. Not quite all. Once, when he was twelve, a slightly older boy at the home had caught him alone in the shower and pushed him into a corner. The boy's hands had scrabbled over his slick, soapy skin, and Trevor had felt something in his head snap. Next thing he knew, three counselors were pulling him off the kid, who was curled in the fetal position on the stall floor, and the knuckles of his left hand were throbbing, bruised, and blood was streaking the white tiles swirling down the silver drain. The older boy had a concussion, and Trevor was confined to his hall for a month. His homework and meals were brought to him. The solitude was wonderful. He filled eighteen notebooks, and one of the things he drew over and over was the shower stall with the boy in it, head smacking the cold tiles at the precise moment of impact, skinny body curled in a half inch of water threaded with his own blood his blood that Trevor had spilled before he even knew what he was doing. And the weird thing was, the boy's hands had actually felt good sliding over his skin. He had liked the feeling. And then suddenly the boy had been on the floor with blood coming out of his head. He had plenty of time to think about what he had done and what had made him do it, the violence inherent in his genes, in his soul. That was the first time he could remember considering the comforts of suicide. Trevor stuck his pencil behind his ear, laid his sketchbook on the ground in front of him. He let the fingers of his right hand slide down the soft inner skin of his left forearm. The skin there was mottled with old scars, years of slashes and cross hatchings done with a single edged exacto razor blade, the same kind he used for layouts. Perhaps a hundred thin raised lines of skin, paler than the rest of his arm, exquisitely sensitive. Some still reddened and hurt once in a while as if the tissue deep inside his arm had never quite healed. But if you went deep enough into the tissue, no scar ever healed completely. And this map of pain he had carved out of his skin, 
This had been no half-assed attempt at suicide anyway. Trevor knew that to kill yourself, you had to cut along the length of your arm, had to lay it open from wrist to elbow, like some fruit with a rich red pulp and a hard white core. Had to cut all the way to bone, had to sever every major artery in vain. He had never tried it. These cuts he had made over the years were more in the nature of experimentation, to test his domain over his own malleable flesh, to know the strange human jelly below the surface, part layer upon cell, delicate layer of skin, part quickening blood, part pale subcutaneous fat that parted like butter at the touch of a new blade. Sometimes he would hold his arm over a page of his sketchbook, let the blood fall on clean white paper or mingle with fresh black ink. Sometimes he would trace it into patterns with his finger or the nib of a pen. But he hadn't done it for years and years. He thought the last time had been on his twentieth birthday, two years out of state's custody, the ill winds of adulthood and poverty blowing down his neck. It was as if America had begun the decade of the eighties by shattering some great cosmic mirror, except that the seven years of bad luck hadn't ended yet. The wizened, evil-faced Dybbuk in the White House had been as alien a being as Trevor could imagine, a shriveled yet hideously animated puppet thrust into power by the same shadowy forces that had controlled the world since Trevor was five, forces he could not control, could barely see or begin to understand. He had spent the night of his twentieth birthday wandering around New York City, riding the subways alone, slamming down coffee and cappuccino and espresso in every dive he passed, finally achieving an exaggerated state of awareness that went beyond perception into hallucination. He ended up huddled in a grove in Washington Square Park, furtively slicing at his wrist with a dull and rusty blade he dug out of his pocket, trying to let some of this electric energy out with the blood before it rattled him to pieces. Toward dawn he fell into restless sleep and dreamed of angels telling him to do violence. To himself? To someone else? He could not remember when he woke. He didn't know why he had stopped cutting himself after that. It had just stopped working. The pain couldn't come out that way anymore. Trevor sat up straight, shook himself. He'd nearly started to doze here in the gathering storm on his family's grave. He saw an image of his flayed wrist above a white sheet of paper, dark sluggish blood making Rorschach blots on the page. The first drops of rain were hitting the spongy carpet of grass and pine needles, dark streaking and blotching on the headstones. Lightning sketched across the sky, searing jagged blue, then thunder rolling in like a slow tide. Trevor closed his sketchbook and slid it into his backpack. He could work on the bird strip later, at the house. The rain began to come down in great gusting sheets as he left the graveyard. By the time he reached the road, the ground was already wet enough to sink and squelch under his feet, muddy water oozing into his socks and sneakers. The trees bowed low over the road, then lashed the wind-torn sky. A ways down the road, Trevor realized that he had barely glanced at the headstone as he left, had not touched it at all past the first initial contact. It was numb, dead, like the fragments of memory and bone that lay beneath it. Maybe they had been there once, but as their flesh decayed and crumbled in the sodden southern ground, their essences had leached away too. Maybe he could find his family in Missing Mile, or something of them, but not where their bodies lay. He had plodded most of the way back to town when he heard a car coming slowly up the road behind him, grinding over the coarse wet gravel. He thought briefly of trying to thumb, just as quickly decided against it. He was already soaked through. Nobody would want his soggy ass on their upholstery. Now the car was close enough that he could hear its wipers sluicing back and forth across the windshield. The sound triggered a memory so distant it was barely there. Lying in the back seat of his father's car one rainy afternoon in Texas, listening to the shush scree of the wipers and watching the rain course down the windows. One of the great San Francisco contingent of cartoonists, Trevor couldn't remember which one, had been passing through town, and Bobby was showing him the sights of 1970 Austin, whatever they may have been. The other cartoonist was busily rolling joint after joint, but that didn't stop him from running his mouth as much as Bobby. For Trevor, in the back seat, everything blurred together like different hues of watercolor paint. 
the comfortable sound of the adults' voices, the sweet herbal tang of the pot smoke, the afternoon city light filtering through a veil of rain. Mama must have been at home with the baby. Dee Dee had been sick with one thing or another for a good part of his first year. Mama worried over him, fixed him special nasty-tasting organic mush, kept watch over him as he slept. Just as if she thought it mattered. Just as if they all lived in a universe where Dee Dee was going to grow up. Trevor kept walking, did not register that the car had pulled up behind him until a horn blipped. He turned and found himself staring at the headlights and grill work of his father's old car, the one whose back seat he had dozed on that rainy day in Austin, the one they had driven to Missing Mile. The two-toned Rambler, or its twin, complete with a crimp that had graced its front bumper since 1970. His father's car, the windshield opaque with reflected light, the windows obscured by beads and drips of rain. Bobby's car coming down Burnt Church Road from the direction of the graveyard. And the window on the driver's side was slowly cranking down. Trevor thought there might be tears on his face, or maybe it was only the rain dripping out of his sodden hair. He stepped forward to meet the car and whatever was inside it. Seven. Just after dawn, Zack left his car in the parking lot of a prefab pink motel and walked out onto the dirtiest beach he had ever seen. He'd kept on a steady northeastern course all night. Shooting past Pensacola at two, he had intended to go straight on east to Jacksonville, but had been diverted by a highway sign pointing out the turnoff to a town called Two Egg. Zack might never set foot in Florida again. He had to see Two Egg before he left. But the town was eerie, even for rural Florida, in the small hours of the morning. The buildings on the downtown strip all seemed to have been built in the early 50s, that time of false prosperity and fake space-age optimism. There was that look of the plexiglass pillar and chromium arch, the kidney shape and the fashionable sign of the atom. But now these fabulous structures were abandoned, left behind by the chill silicon void of the millennium's end. Their aqua paint was faded and peeling. Their once wondrous swoops and starbursts and streamlined angles rusting, falling away. The buildings seemed to sway and nod over the street as if trying to pull Zack into their sterile dream. The street was full of trash, crumpled fast food bags and torn newspapers drifting like aimless ghosts. The swamp was reclaiming the town on all sides. Stagnant tongues of water lapped at the sidewalks. Cattails grew in every vacant lot. Altogether, the town made Zack think of the opening helicopter landing scene of Romero's Day of the Dead, as filmed on the ruined set of the Jetsons. Desolation, in which rotting corpses might rise, set against a backdrop as garish and sad as a forgotten cartoon. He got out of Two Egg in a hurry. Thirty minutes later, he crossed the state line into Georgia. Now he was on Tybee Island according to the signs he'd been nearly too bleary-eyed to read by the time he finally hit the coast. Just east of Savannah, Tybee was a cheap resort area frequented by redneck and middle-class family groups all summer. The island was honeycombed with seaside motels, fried seafood shacks, shell stands, and those weird ubiquitous little Indian boutiques with their unvarying inventory of gauzy cotton clothes, incense, out-of-date rock posters, cheap jewelry, and drug paraphernalia. This early, nearly everything was closed. Zack paid cash for a room at the Sea Castle Motor Inn, parked his car behind the Pepto-Bismol colored building, and walked down to the beach. The Atlantic Ocean looked dark and murky, not quite slate, not quite green. The foam that laced the breakers was like whipped cream squeezed out of a can, thin and unappetizing, unnatural looking. And the sand a hundred times worse than the chalky whitish stuff on the gulf, gray and wet and heavy, like silt, like sludge. Zack nudged a heap of it with the toe of his sneaker and uncovered a broken plastic shovel, the wrapper from a payday bar, the gritty, sticky wad of a used condom. He kicked sand back over the whole mess and watched it fall in a dirty spray, only half hiding the trash. He had thought the ocean would soothe his jangling nerves, 
Instead, the sight of it endlessly heaving and churning made him feel tight inside, lost somehow, as if this was not the place he had meant to come to at all. He had also thought there would be other teenagers on the beach, that he would be able to blend in and look like part of some holiday crowd. But at this early hour the beach was nearly empty, and the few people he saw were middle-aged couples or terribly young parents with herds of tiny children. Even when he took his shirt off and let the fledgling sun beat on his pale back and shoulders, Zack felt about as inconspicuous as Sid Vicious at a Baptist-covered dish supper. He was beginning to realize just how little he knew about life outside of New Orleans. But that was all right. With intelligence and intuition, he could hack it. Hacking was defined as the manipulation of any complex system, as in, I can't hack getting dressed tonight, so I'm going to the club in my bathrobe. The complex system could be numbers on a screen, or the relays and interchanges of the phone system. Those were mechanical, and all you had to do was learn them. The crucial fact many computer hackers never seemed to realize, and the reason some of them were perceived as such geeks, was that the world and all its sentient beings and their billions of stories comprised the most intricate, fascinating system of all. He pushed himself up off the gray sand and walked to the edge of the water. The glare caught the round lenses of his glasses, made his eyes sting and tear. Fine. He felt like crying anyway. A breeze, tainted with the odors of wet salt and crude oil, caught his hair and pushed it back from his face, dried the faint sheen of sweat on his forehead and upper lip. The tears and the wind felt good together. Zack looked up and down the beach, followed the juncture of sand and water until it merged into infinity. South of here were the Georgia Sea Islands, where the rich language and culture of the Gullah people had dried up over the past century, like so many fronds of marsh grass never woven into baskets like so many magical roots never fashioned into protective hands. North was the rest of the Atlantic seaboard, more than a thousand miles of that churning, strange-colored ocean, stretching all the way up to the unimaginably toxic sands of New York and New Jersey. Soon the beach began to get crowded, and Zack saw that he would never be able to blend in here. The redneck dudes in their drawstring jams and scraggly little mustaches, the dudettes with their bleached, permed, frosted hair and cottage cheese asses and scary, leathery tans, the kids that were hideous little replicas of their parents in teenage mutant ninja drag, all stared at Zack as if he might be something nasty that had washed up overnight and hadn't floated back out yet. It was time to crash, time to sleep now so he could blow this boring joint by nightfall. Back in his room at the sea castle, Zack stripped out of his sweaty cutoffs, laid his glasses on the nightstand, and crawled into the double bed. The sheets were worn but clean and cool. He nestled into the pillows, closed his eyes, felt delicious exhaustion wash over him, thought of the kid leaf, and suddenly had a raging boner that was never going to let him sleep in a million years. No way, no how. Zack leaned over the edge of the bed and rummaged in one of his bags found a string of little blue plastic packets and tore one off. He never used rubbers for sex unless the other person insisted, and many of his lovers in New Orleans had insisted. He was known for more than his pallid good looks and mysterious wealth, which combination had convinced a certain set of French Quarter kids that Zack was a vampire, and another set entirely that he was dying of AIDS and hooping it up while he still could. But he always used them for beating off. Not a one had broken yet and he figured he was getting into the thousands. He fitted the slippery little sheath over the head of his dick and unrolled it, sliding his hand down with it, pretending it was Leaf's mouth. The weight of the sheet was Leaf's hands. The extra pillow was Leaf's skinny body pressed smooth against his own. But when he came, Leaf disappeared, and Zack saw an achingly blue wave crashing and foaming on pure white sand. The rubber, as always, remained intact. Maybe they had made the things flimsier back in 72. For a few minutes, he lay with his mind wandering and his hand still moving idly. Not until warm tendrils of cum started trickling back down into his pubic hair did he pull the thing off, knot the end of it, and toss it in the general direction of the toilet. He heard a small, wet plop that meant bullseye, though the room was so small it would have been hard to miss. If every sperm was sacred, 
Zack figured he had made more offerings to the altar of the porcelain goddess than any other. When he woke up later and saw the condom floating like a pale chrysalis in the blue-tinged water of the bowl, he would pee on it and then flush it. Zack thought his body was a nifty machine and had a healthy appreciation of its many functions. He turned over, stretched his lanky arms and legs across the unfamiliar expanse of mattress, pushed his head into the mound of pillows. One of them lay snug against his side, like a warm body sinking into sleep. For an instant, he wondered how it would be to fall asleep and wake up with someone next to him every morning, bodies fitting together in easy familiarity, skin smelling of each other, and the safe shared bed. But only for an instant did he think he might like it. These were thoughts that usually only came to him on leaden winter mornings, when the needling rain of a New Orleans cold spell streaked his window panes. The pillow was his only constant bedmate, in all its malleable, comforting forms. He held it close and pressed his face into it, smelled cotton and detergent and the lingering ghost of his cum, damp and salty as the ocean, but cleaner. In a while, the image of his own bed faded from behind his eyes, and Zack began to dream of a long expanse of silky, sugary white sand, of water the color of the sky, of sky the color of the sun. When he woke, the room was full of sunset's first light, deep pinks and lavenders that lay in overlapping petal-like layers across the bedclothes and made him think he was still dreaming. As consciousness seeped back in, Zack contemplated going out to the beach to watch the sunset and get something to eat. A steady edge of hunger was gnawing at his stomach. But all the happy couples were probably strolling hand in hand in the grimy surf. Zack decided to stay in and order a pizza. He paged through the phone book, ripped out the Domino's ad, and tore it into tiny pieces. They supported Operation Rescue and other heinous fascist causes. Then dialed a local parlor and ordered a 12-inch pie with triple jalapenos. Thirty minutes later, his hair dripping from a fast shower, Zack munched pizza and drank grape soda from the motel's machine while he studied his new atlas. He'd stopped to fill the Mustang's tank somewhere near Valdosta, and while it had not been nearly as fine an adventure as his stop in Pass Christiane, he had scored three tapes, a hot Slim Jim, and the Book of Maps. He saw that I-95 north from Savannah would take him all the way into North Carolina. Zack didn't like interstates, but he was well away from New Orleans now and ready to cover some more distance in a hurry. And after North Carolina, where? Leaf had thought him a New Yorker. Zack had always been intrigued by the idea of such a tiny island-bound city, crammed full of people of every possible race, gender, and persuasion, entire cultures and culture wars, systems of magic and religion, infinite microcosms. Maybe now he could get lost there. He finished his pizza, dropped off his room key at the office, slapped on his new Hank Williams tape, and headed north. Just before midnight, Zack sat drinking a Bloody Maria at the Sombrero Lounge, a colorful confection of a building molded primarily of pink stucco, orange neon, and thousands of twinkling white fairy lights. The South of the Border theme park on I-95 had drawn him in like a bug to a gaudy flame. SOB's increasingly surreal billboards loomed along the highway for 30 miles before the park, all 3D papier-mâché sculpture and moving parts giant hot dogs and spinning sheep and the smirking mustachioed mug of Pedro, the SOB mascot. It was like a little city set down in the middle of nowhere, halfway between New Jersey and Disney World, as one of the signs bragged, and after three hours of dark interstate flanked by monotonous stretches of farmland and stands of pine, its tacky bars and souvenir shops with their Easter egg paint jobs of purple and pink and chartreuse had looked to Zach like the lights of Bourbon Street at Mardi Gras. As he finished his drink, an eye-watering blend of tequila and Tabasco with a splash of tomato juice, an idea came to him. He left the bar and drove across the complex to Pedro's motel, paid cash for one of the air, H-E-I-R, conditioned rooms, dug his battery-powered laptop computer out of the back seat and took it inside, along with the Oki 900 cellular phone he carried everywhere. Zack had tumbled the phone, or reprogrammed it to generate a new ID number each time he used it. It could not receive calls, but neither could his calls be traced. 
The furniture and walls of the room were painted pink. The bed, heart-shaped, with a mirror on the ceiling and a slick spread of lurid red satin. No doubt you could put a quarter in and summon the magic fingers. Instead, Zack turned on the laptop, entered a stolen MCI credit card number, and dialed into the composing department of the New Orleans Times-Picayune. Over a year ago, he had discovered that the newspaper had a program that let reporters type in their stories from home. He'd created an account for himself, changing his password every time he planted an item in the paper. Currently, it was Zygote, thanks to his last story about the petrified abortion. He logged on and changed it to Pedro. Then he typed, Goddess Seen in Bowl of Gumbo, by Joseph Boudreau, staff writer. The goddess Kali is known in Hinduism as the mother and destroyer of creation. But can she make a rue? In a twist on the well-known Jesus in the plate of spaghetti theme, Parvata Sanjay of India spied the Hindu goddess in his bowl during a recent visit to New Orleans while sampling the seafood gumbo at a popular French Quarter restaurant. Her four terrible arms were outstretched, said Sanjay, and her bloody, lolling tongue was clearly visible. It was only a pattern in the soup, formed by the oil on the surface, but I believe all patterns have significance. Might Mr. Sanjay have sampled a few Dixie beers as well? The Calcutta native plans to continue his American travels in North Carolina, where he says he wants to try the barbecue. Zack added the sequence of characters that meant an editor had approved his copy. Then, with a few more keystrokes, he sent it on its merry way to the printing department, where it joined the other stories ready to be printed in next Sunday's edition. It was easier to bury items in the Sunday paper. They were hungry for filler and didn't look twice at the shit that came in. He knew Eddie would be watching the paper for hidden news of him. The mention of Kali would catch her eye, and she might also notice that he had reversed the Indian surname and first name. Calling the guy Mr. Parvata Sanjay was something like calling an American Mr. Rogers Fred. Other friends and outlaws might see it and recognize his hand too. Maybe some of them would see it too, for that matter. But Zack didn't think they would connect it with a hacker on the run. He logged out and broke the phone connection, turned off the computer and carried it back out to his car. A quick pee in the pink tile bathroom, room key left in the door and Zack was gone. After sleeping all day, he was ready to drive all night. And anyway, he couldn't stand the thought of lying there in that slick red heart-shaped bed, staring at his own lonely, horny body in the mirror overhead. South of the border disappeared behind him. Soon it was only a faint fuchsia glow on the horizon. As the night deepened and the traffic thinned to nothing, it seemed to Zack that the whole country lay over the next rise, around the next bend of the highway all lit up and wide awake, violent and strange and joyous, just waiting for him to come find it. 8. Trevor didn't know what he expected to see inside the Rambler as the driver's window wound down. A grinning skeleton, dirt-crusted and warm-festooned, dry bone finger beckoning him in. His father's flesh restored, black shades balanced on his blade of a nose, intense eyes blazing through smoky lenses. Or Bobby as he had looked the last time Trevor saw him, dead eyes bulging, tongue jutting like a rotten melon, chin and bare scrawny chest slicked with drool, streaked with gore. Whatever he expected, it wasn't the smiling face of Terry Bucket, the affable second-generation hippie who had introduced himself at the bar last night. The owner of the record store, Trevor remembered. Procurer of jazz sides, retailer of the magic that had made Bird so little money during his own lifetime. Hey, Trevor Black, it's pouring down rain, or didn't you notice? Catch a ride, man. Terry cocked a thumb toward the passenger door. Trevor made himself walk around the front of the car, heard wet gravel crunching under his feet, though he could not feel it, heard the roar and thrum of the idling engine. Perched high on its wheels, the Rambler looked like a child's sketch of an automobile, a small rectangle atop a larger one precariously balanced on two circles. It was a boxy, plain, yet somehow rakish machine. It was not the sort of car in which you expected to see a ghost. It was not the sort of car you expected to be a ghost. Trevor raised his left hand and wrapped his fingers around the door handle. It was cold to the touch, 
beaded with rain. He pulled the heavy door open and slid in. Across the dirty white vinyl seat his butt had polished in cloth diapers and Oshkosh overalls. The seat that had stuck to the backs of his legs when it was hot. The seat that Dee Dee had peed on a couple of times, though most of his accidents had been confined to the back. Terry lounged comfortably on the other side of the seat. Curly hair pulled back in a faded blue bandana. Dark, amused eyes looking Trevor up and down. Terry's features were blunt, not quite handsome. His bushy eyebrows nearly met over the bridge of his nose, and he needed a shave. But his face had a friendly, squared look, a face that wouldn't take any bullshit, but wouldn't give you any either. Make him a little seedier looking, and he could have been a character drawn by Crumb. Terry put the car in gear, eased off the clutch, and started rolling down Burnt Church Road again. He seemed to be in no great hurry to get anywhere. Where did you get this car? Trevor asked. Oh, I've had it forever. Kinsey used to help me fix it whenever it broke down, but I've learned to do most of the work myself. I love these old engines. No damn electronics to get fucked up. Just a bunch of metal and grease. You know these wipers still run on vacuum tubes? Terry indicated the slushing windshield wipers as though pointing out an artifact of some forgotten civilization. Something else Kinsey told me about this car. It used to belong to a famous cartoonist who killed himself here in Missing Mile. Pretty weird, huh? Trevor sagged back in the seat and let out a long, unsteady breath. Terry glanced over. You okay, man? Yeah. He sat up, swiped water out of his eyes. His shirt was sticking to his skin, outlining his ribs. His jeans were sodden, unpleasantly heavy just wet and cold. Well, look, I was going into town to do some errands, but my house is just back down the road. You want to stop by there and towel off? I'll even give you a dry t-shirt. I've got a million of them. No, I'm fine. But Terry was already turning the car around. I forgot to get stoned before I left anyway. Consider it done. A couple of minutes later, the Rambler turned into a long gravel driveway and stopped in front of a small wooden house whose paint was not so much peeling as fraying at the edges. A couple of rocking chairs were stationed on the porch among various whirligigs, wagon wheels, pirated street signs, and crates of empty beer bottles. Country kitsch gone weird. Terry led the way up the porch steps, through the towers of junk, and unlocked the front door. Watch out for the hex sign. It's supposed to be bad luck to step on it or something. Trevor looked down as he crossed the threshold. Someone had painted two interlocking triangles, one red and one blue, with a silver onk at their juncture. What's it for? Don't ask me. This house belongs to my friend Ghost, who's even spookier than you might guess from his name. His grandmother was some kind of witch. He isn't here, is he? Trevor hoped he wasn't about to meet yet another of Missing Miles' friendly freaks. He had only wanted a ride, not an impromptu afternoon party. No, his band is on tour. Extended tour. I'm minding the farm, which means free rent and a lifetime supply of good karma. How come? Oh, I don't know. Terry shrugged. Ms. Deliverance was a good witch. What color shirt do you want? Black. But of course. Terry tossed him a cotton T-shirt printed with the Whirling Disc logo, a little long-haired man who looked like a hippie version of the man on the Monopoly game, twirling a record on the end of his candy-striped cane, and pointed him down the hall to the bathroom. Trevor placed his wet feet carefully on the mellow hardwood floors. He was intrigued by the idea of a house with good karma, a house that held memories of love and music. He pulled the heavy wooden door of the bathroom shut behind him, tugged his wet shirt over his head and dropped it on the floor. It was just a plain black tee, like almost every other shirt Trevor owned. He had one with a pocket, but that was getting fancy. The little whirling disc man was a radical departure for him. Trevor unbound his ponytail, leaned over the old clawfoot bathtub, and wrung a stream of water from his hair. Then he rumpled it with a towel and let it hang loose to dry. It rippled halfway down his back, ginger like Bobby's, shot through with a few strands of pale gold like Mama's. 
The mirror in the bathroom made him nervous. He had a strong sense of someone looking back at him from its depths. He put his lips close against the wavy silver surface, whispered, Who is it? But nothing answered. There was only his own high pale forehead melding with its own reflection, his own eyes merging into one misshapen transparent orb that stared mercilessly back at him, his own long somber face dissolving to mist at the edges. He stood back from the mirror and watched his nipples shiver erect, his skin prickle into goosebumps. Trevor pulled the whirling disc shirt over his head and hurried back down the hall to the living room, where Terry was just firing up a fat, pungent joint. I don't suppose you do this? Terry asked after a long toke. Blue smoke leaked out of his nostrils and the corners of his mouth. Narrowing his eyes against it, he looked sybaritic and handsomer than before. Trevor hesitated. Terry held out the joint, waggled it enticingly. What the hell, Trevor decided, and reached out to take it with his left hand. He'd smoked pot before, but not for a long time, and never much. It had been one of Bobby's drugs. But pot had never made Bobby puke and sob like a baby, had never made him pick up the hammer or whispered in his ear how he might use it. And Bobby had smoked it when he was drawing. Trevor thought it might be good to try some right before he went in the house. So he wrapped his lips around the wrinkled end of the joint, slightly damp with Terry's spit, but not unpleasantly so, and took a deep drag. Big mistake. He hadn't eaten anything since Kinsey's dubious noodle soup last night at the club, hadn't drunk anything but a few Cokes and a warm, noxious jolt. Suddenly his stomach felt like a small pouch of cracked and shriveled leather. His tissues and the meat of his brain felt scorched by the fire that burned inside him. The joint slipped from his fingers and skittered down his arm, leaving a long, singed trail along the old tracework of scars. He heard Terry say something, felt his knees begin to buckle. Big round bursts of light appeared in front of his eyes, blue and red and sparkly silver, spinning like crazy constellations. Then blackness waltzed in and wiped them all away. Terry couldn't believe it when the kid collapsed on his living room floor. He had seen stoners toked to the point of zombification, staring at a TV screen as if it might bring nirvana. He had seen drinkers gone to drooling stupor in every sort of compromising position and location, including on the toilet. He had even seen a nodding junkie or two. But never in his 28 years had Terry Bucket watched anyone pass out from one toke on a joint. He retrieved the burning spliff from the folds of Trevor's shirt, patted down the kid's scrawny chest to make sure no stray embers were setting him aflame, checked out the glowing end of the joint but saw nothing amiss, smelled nothing weird. The pot couldn't be laced with anything. Terry had already rolled three or four joints out of this particular bag, which came from a trusted source. His own buzz was just starting to tickle the edges of his brain, leafy and benign. It was nothing but good Carolina homegrown. This pale, trembling youth must be in pretty sorry shape. He checked to see if Trevor was breathing, gently pulled up one of his eyelids to make sure he hadn't had a brain embolism or something. The silvery pale eye glared at Terry, making him think Trevor was in there somewhere, not too far away. As he wedged a cushion from the sofa under Trevor's lolling head, the kid started muttering, I'm okay. Fine. Yeah, you look great, said Terry. He went to the kitchen, found a dish rag that was mostly clean, ran it under cold water, went back and draped it over Trevor's face. Trevor raised a limp hand to swipe at it, got halfway, then let the hand fall like a dead white bird by his side. Hang loose, Terry told him. Don't go away. He paused beside the stereo and scanned the portion of his vast record collection he had already managed to cart over here, wondering what music Trevor might like to surface from oblivion with. Jazz was one of the few categories Terry's collection lacked. He liked it okay, but had never accumulated any of his own, had always vaguely figured it was the sort of music you had to be an expert on to really appreciate. Finally, he selected an old Tom Waits album, dropped the needle on it, and returned to the kitchen to be a gracious host.
Trevor woke with a damp, sour-smelling membrane over his face and a strange guttural voice groaning in his ears. He clawed frantically at the membrane, and it came away in his hands, cold and dank and foul. How long had he been gone? It felt like minutes, but could have been an hour, no more. The light hadn't changed. The walls seemed to tower toward an infinitely high point overhead. They were decorated with vintage acid rock posters whose lurid colors swirled and gyred, the band's names taunting him. Jimi Hendrix Experience, Captain Beefheart, Strawberry Alarm Clock. All had been in his parents' record collection. The room was furnished much like his childhood home in Austin. Bookshelves of cinder blocks and particle board comfortable sofa with sagging cushions and the nap on the arms worn thin, table that looked like a refugee from someone else's trash pile, early starving artist or poverty deco. Trevor saw parts of Terry's drum set strewn about the room, a cymbal in the corner, a snare propped between a bookcase and the doorway that led to the hall. There was only one difference between this stranger's house and the one he remembered living in with his family. This one felt somehow safe. His parents' home had felt safe once, too, but that was so long ago Trevor could barely remember. He tried to sit up and felt his brain starting to spiral off into the ether again. A snippet of dialogue from Crazy Cat drifted through his mind. Just imagine having your ectoplasm running around William and Nilium among the unlimitless ether. Gala, it's unbelievable. Unbelievable, it was. Yet it would seem he'd swooned in Terry's living room, or whoever's living room this was. How fucking embarrassing. Terry didn't seem to be around, and Trevor thought that when he felt able to stand, he might just slink out of this safe place, walk the rest of the way into town, then out to Violin Road. Yes, that was what he thought he would do, until he smelled the aroma wafting from the kitchen. It rooted him to the floor, made his nostrils flare and his head throb with longing. Oily dark, bitter rich, utterly compelling. Coffee. Terry finished making two generous sandwiches, poured two mugs of joe, picked up the plate in one hand and both steaming coffees in the other. Precariously, he edged back through the kitchen into the living room and held out the mugs to Trevor. Do you want sugar or... He was surprised again when the kid seized a mug and drank down the hot black coffee in what looked like a single swallow. Terry winced, imagining the bitter brew blazing down his own smoke-seared throat. But Trevor just sighed and licked his lips and held up the empty mug. Can I have another? Should I just bring the whole pot? Yes. He seemed serious. So Terry went back to the kitchen and got it, along with the bag of sugar and a couple of spoons. Trevor poured himself another cup, stirred in a meager spoonful of sugar almost as an afterthought, and drank half of it at once. Terry took his first sip. I thought you might could use a bite to eat, too. What is it? Trevor hadn't noticed the plate of sandwiches until now. Olive loaf and mustard on whole grain. Olive loaf? Yeah, it's kind of a classic around here. A while back, Kinsey wanted to have New Orleans night at the U and serve muffaletta sandwiches, right? But he didn't know how to make the Italian olive salad. So he made these fucked up things on sub rolls with boiled ham, sliced pepperoni, and olive loaf. They were awful, but we all choked them down. Since then, I've kind of gotten to like it. Trevor took a sandwich and bit cautiously at the very edge of it, stayed poker-faced, managed not to shudder. Then he seemed to inhale, and the whole thing was gone. He picked up the other half of the sandwich and repeated the process, then poured himself another cup of coffee. You, uh, want me to fix another pot of java? I don't know. Trevor looked up, and an odd shadow passed over his face. It was as if he had managed to relax for a few minutes, to let down a little of his guard, and then he had suddenly remembered some awful thing he had to do. Maybe I'd better just go. It's okay, man. I'm in no hurry. That's the whole point of owning a business, you know. 
You set your own hours and pay people good money, nobody yells at you if you're a little late. Or a little stoned. Spooning coffee out of its foil bag, Terry mused over the enigma in his living room. There was something very strange about this new kid. He seemed nervous and aloof, but at the same time terribly lonely. It was as if he had no social skills, as if he were some kind of space alien who had read extensively about people and their habits and customs, maybe wanted to know more, but was only now making first contact. And he put away Java the way Terry's car chugged motor oil. Terry wondered what Trevor was trying to stay awake for. One thing was certain. Missing Mile had itself another live one. Trevor stayed long enough to drink most of the second pot of coffee. Terry finished the joint and ran his mouth in what seemed like a friendly way, talking about music, the town, even comics once he found out Trevor drew them. Trevor didn't usually talk about it, but Terry asked so many questions that he couldn't help answering some. At least Terry didn't mention Bobby McGee, but then Birdland probably wasn't his sort of thing. He liked the Freak Brothers, predictably, but most of his other favorites featured guys in capes and long underwear beating up guys in black. There was an awkward silence here. Then Trevor, unable to help himself, mumbled, I hate that shit. Terry just shrugged. Terry seemed kind enough. Still, Trevor could not shake the idea that he was being surreptitiously examined like some three-headed sideshow attraction. In few other places had people seemed as curious about him, as interested in him as here. It was as if they sensed that he was a hometown boy, or nearly so. Finally, Terry stood up and stretched. Trevor saw a flash of bare belly beneath his T-shirt the skin lightly tanned, with the barest beginnings of a roll of fat and a thin line of pale brown hair disappearing into the waistband of his jeans. I guess we better get moving. You want to ride somewhere? Violin Road. Pretty dead out there, man. Are you sure? That's where I'm staying now. Terry glanced at Trevor, seemed to wrestle with something he wanted to say, evidently decided it was none of his business. Okay. Violin Road it is. The rain had stopped, but the day was still overcast. The air felt heavy and moist against Trevor's skin, like an unwanted kiss. The rambler gunned through town and bumped over the railroad tracks. It was Sunday afternoon, and nearly everything seemed to be shut down, doors locked tight, windows dark and shaded. Freak subculture or not, Missing Mile was still in the heart of the Bible Belt. The thought of his lambs being able to buy a tube of toothpaste or get a cup of coffee on Sunday was surely a terrible affront to the Lord. Then they were turning off Firehouse Street onto another gravel road, one that changed to rutted dirt after half a mile or so. Violin Road. Trevor felt a loosening in his chest, a hot ribbon of excitement uncoiling in his stomach. The scrap heaps and rusted hulks of automobiles, the unpainted trailers, the castle-like spires of Kudzu slipped past, less substantial than blurry images in old photographs. His eyes swept the roadside. Then, suddenly, there was the house. His hell. His birdland. It was set farther back from the road than he remembered. The porch and the peak of the roof were barely visible through the rioting growth that had taken over the yard. A weeping willow at the side of the house had not been much taller than Mama's head. Now its pale green fronds caressed the roof. A verdant tangle of goldenrod and forsythia, Queen Anne's lace and pokeweed and brown-eyed Susans ran right up to the porch steps, which were partly crumbled. Kudzu was draped over everything like a green blanket tendrils twining between the porch railings, through the broken windows. You can let me out here. Terry slowed the rambler to a crawl, looked around. This far out, Violin Road was sparsely populated. There was no other house in sight. Where? Right here. The murder house? Trevor didn't say anything waited for the car to slow enough so that he could jump out. Terry seemed to have forgotten that his foot was on the gas. The rambler inched along at ten miles per hour. 
Oh, shit, he said. I think I know who you are. Yeah, I'm starting to feel like a local celebrity or something. Thanks for the ride. I'll see you at the U. Trevor grabbed his bag and pushed the passenger door open, prompting Terry to apply his brakes at last. Trevor's sneakers hit the scrubby grass at the side of the road. Then, before he could think about it, he was sprinting toward the house. Be careful, man, Terry yelled. Trevor pretended not to hear. Then the rambler was speeding up, disappearing down the road, throwing mud in its wake. It rounded a bend and was gone. Trevor stood alone in the yard, panting, staring at the house. A few patches of weathered wood and broken glass were visible through the growth. Other than that, the face of the house was mostly hidden. The grass just brushed his knees. As he pushed through it, sparkling drops of water scattered to earth. Grasshoppers whirred away from his invading feet. He ducked under a dripping bower of vine and was there. No more obstacles lay between him and the house. The steps were mostly intact, and he thought the porch would hold him. The front door was barely ajar. Beyond that was dusty darkness. Trevor closed his eyes for a long moment, heard the sigh and hush of leaves, the high, shrill drone of insects, the distant conversation of birds, and beneath that, a subliminal voice whispering to him, making itself heard over years of absence and decay. He was afraid so. He hoped so. He opened his eyes, took a deep breath of sunlight, and the verdant smell the rain had left, and put his foot on the first step. Nine. The air in Birdland was golden as slow syrup, green as the light that filtered through the kudzu, weighted with dampness and rot. The cool, decaying scent of a house abandoned for decades, made up of many things, the black earth under the floor, the dry droppings of animals, the drifts of dead insects sifting to shards of iridescent chitin beneath shimmering tapestries of cobweb, in the random shafts of sunlight that fell through the lattice of roof and vegetation, dust motes slowly shifted, turned. Each one might represent a memory Trevor had of this house a particle of the universe charged with the terrible energy of years. He moved deeper in. Here was the living room, the husks of the ugly chair and old brown sofa that had come with the house moldering in a corner, reduced to skins of brittle colorless cloth stretched over skeletons of wood and wire. The rain had come in through the holes in the roof, and the room smelled of slow damp decay, of fungal secrets. Here were the remains of the stacked milk crates where the records had been stored. Most of the records were gone, probably stolen by kids who had made it this far in, though by the end of that summer the magical vinyl wheels would have been as warped as if they had spent two months in a slow oven. A few fleeting images of album covers came to him. Janis Joplin's Cheap Thrills, with art by R. Crumb, the psychedelic hologram of the Rolling Stones' Satanic Majesty's Request, that could induce dizziness if he stared into it too long. A photograph of Sidney Bechet that had scared him a little to look at, because the muscles of the jazz saxophonist's cheeks and neck were so developed that his head appeared swollen, elephantine. Here was the doorway leading into the hall, where Mama had died. Her blood had long since faded to a barely discernible pattern of streaks and spatters on the wall, not much darker than the shadow and grime around it. But here and there the wooden frame had been splintered by hammer blows that missed. And in two spots, one on either side of the door, Mama's fingers had dug into the wall hard enough to leave gouges in the plaster. That must have happened when Bobby didn't miss. In the autopsy report was a list of substances found under her fingernails. Wood, plaster, her husband's blood and her own. And little divots of Bobby's skin strands of Bobby's hair. She had fought him off hard. She had died in intimate contact with him. Cause of death, blunt trauma. Victim had fifteen separate wounds made by a claw hammer, five to the head, three to the chest area, seven to the arms and hands. Three of the head wounds and two of the chest wounds could in and of themselves have been fatal. 
Had Mama died quietly? This was something Trevor had wondered about for a long time. She might have wrestled with Bobby in a desperate silence at first, not wanting to wake the boys and scare them with another fight. But once she realized that Bobby meant them harm, Trevor thought, she would have started screaming. She would have tried to hold Bobby off long enough to let them get out of the house. And the injuries she had taken before her death. Seven broken fingers, a splintered collarbone, and a shattered tibia. Three cracked ribs, a blow sunk so deeply into her chest that it penetrated the breastbone. Could she have remained silent through those? Trevor didn't think so. He probably could have slept through anything that night. He remembered the bitter-tasting grapefruit juice Bobby had given him before bed, the dull loginess of his head the next morning when he woke. And a notation in his file at the home said there had been second all in his blood when he was brought in. Bobby had drugged him, which meant he had planned the murders. But had he planned to leave Trevor alive and drugged him so he would sleep through it all? Or had he drugged both boys, planning to kill both, and changed his mind about Trevor for some reason? And what about Dee Dee? Trevor wondered if his brother had seen his death coming. He had found Dee Dee curled on his belly, ruined head burrowed deep into the pillow, as if Bobby had killed him in his sleep. But unless Bobby had given him second all, too, Trevor didn't think Dee Dee could have slept through the sounds of his mother dying. Bobby could have killed him sitting up in bed, or cowering, and then arranged him back into the peaceful sleeping position as if trying to absolve himself. Frederick D. McGee, Box 17, Violin Road, male Caucasian, three years, two six, twenty-five pounds, blonde hair, brown eyes. Occupation, none. Cause of death, blunt trauma. Victim had approximately twenty-two separate wounds, all in head, neck area. Cranium and brain were completely destroyed. Trevor imagined Dee Dee's eyes as the hammer descended. He squeezed his own eyes shut and slammed the heel of his hand against the doorframe. A rain of dust sifted down. The pain in his hand, his left hand, of course, he didn't hit things with his drawing hand, made the image of Dee Dee fade. And in a far corner of the living room, a crumpled sheet of newspaper suddenly rustled, then tore. The sound was nearly heart-stopping in the silent room. Trevor turned away from the doorway, walked over to the corner, and nudged the paper with his toe. He could see no mouse or insect, nothing that could have made it move, let alone tear. He picked it up and smoothed it, and the headline screamed off the page at him. I had to do it, says Killer. The word Killer was ripped neatly in half. Trevor examined the paper more closely and saw that it was a Raleigh News and Observer dated October 1986, years after he had left Missing Mile. The headline story was about a man in Corinth who had given his pregnant wife an abortion with a .30-06, firing sixteen shells into her belly. Even in the womb, children were not safe from their fathers. Trevor imagined the sizzle of hot lead tunneling into unformed fetal flesh, the raw, bloody reek edged with the firework smell of cordite. But Bobby hadn't been giving any interviews after murdering his family. Not in this world, anyway. Trevor pictured the front page of Hell's Daily, printed on asbestos but still cinched at the edges, Bobby's huge-eyed, shell-shocked face in grainy black and white on the front page. And the headline would say, What? Another fucked-up guy kills family, then self. One kid left alive. We'll get him later, says Devil. Minor demons yawning over steaming mugs of bitter black coffee and brimstone, blearily scanning the news but not thinking much about it. This was business as usual in hell. He felt the house drawing him in, filling his mind with images and icons, till he overflowed like a pitcher of dark liquid. Caffeine sang in his veins. He dropped the newspaper, walked through the doorway stained with his mother's blood, passed the kitchen on his left, and slowly down the hall, cocking his head and listening as he passed each room, trying to see through the half-closed doors. On the right side of the hall was his parents' bedroom, then Bobby's studio. On the left was Dee Dee's room, then Trevor's, then the tiny bathroom where Bobby had died. 
He remembered standing here before, looking at the afternoon light filtering in through the rooms, falling in golden slants across the hall floor, and wondering if he would ever be able to draw well enough to capture it. He could do it now. But the light was subtly different, murkier, with a greener tinge to it. After a moment, Trevor realized it must be because of the kudzu growing over the windows of the rooms, catching the sunlight and staining it. He continued to the end of the hall, trailing his hand along the water-stained wall. On his right was the studio, on his left the bathroom. Bobby's hell and purgatory. Or was it the other way around? Trevor guessed that was one of the things he had come to find out. He looked to his left and saw the faint gleam of light on dirty porcelain, the buckled shower curtain rod above the black chasm of the tub. How many hours was it now until the exact moment when Bobby had fastened the rope and stepped off the edge of the tub? How many hours until the twentieth anniversary of his neck snapping? Trevor's eyes moved over the peeling walls, over the dark rectangle of the mirror, found the space between sink and toilet where he had curled his five-year-old body into the tightest possible ball. He wondered if he could fit there now. He wondered what he would see if he did. Instead, he turned and went into the studio. The two large windows were intact, and the room was dusty but otherwise clean. Trevor brushed off the tilted surface of Bobby's drawing table. He preferred to draw on a flat surface, having gotten used to his desk at the home, but the folding table was one of the few things Bobby hadn't sold or thrown out when they left Austin. It had his stains and gouges, his razor slits and scars, his sweat grimed into its grain. Maybe his tears, too. Maybe his secrets. And maybe his nightmares. Trevor sat on the sawed-off bar stool that Bobby had used as his drawing chair. It wobbled, as it always had, but held. The light in here was good, even with the vines and tall grass covering the window. But some drawings tacked up on the wall were in shadow. He didn't want to see them now, anyway. He had enough of Bobby here to suit him for a while. Trevor got his own pencils and sketchbook out of his bag, arranged them on the table, and flipped to the story he had been working on at the graveyard. The story of how Bird and Walter Brown went to jail in Jackson, Mississippi, for talking on a screened porch one fine summer night. Left arm curled around his sketchbook, head bent down far over the page, hair hanging like a pale curtain around his thin, determined face, Trevor drew for three hours. When he looked up, the room was veiled in blue shadows and he realized he had barely been able to see the page for ten minutes or more. He saw Bobby's old gooseneck lamp still clamped to the edge of the table, and without thinking he reached out and pushed the button that turned it on. Stark electric light flooded the room, through the spidery shadow of his fingers clutching the pencil onto the pitted tabletop. Trevor's drawing trance broke. He shoved himself back from the table, nearly tipped the stool over. Only his fear made him keep his balance. He did not want to be on his back on the floor of this room just now. His gaze swept the corners, the ceiling, the darkening windows, came to rest on the brown cord snaking from the base of the lamp to the wall socket below. The thing was plugged in. But how could the wiring, the bulb, last twenty years? And as long as he was asking stupid questions, how could the fucking electricity be on? He wondered if it might never have been turned off, if their delinquent bill might have been passed over by an idling computer or some such. He distrusted all engines and mechanical systems, but especially computers, whose insides he pictured as like some silver, sinister, impossibly intricate painting by Geiger. But Trevor didn't think the power could have stayed on for two decades without someone at the switches noticing, or the house catching fire. When you subtract the impossible, what's left? The improbable, the strange but true. The supernatural, or, if you liked, the supranatural, outside the boundaries of most experience, but possible in a place where no boundaries are drawn. Trevor settled back on the stool and glanced up at the wall, at the drawings tacked there, done on sketchbook paper now yellowed and curling at the edges. Most had sifted away to faint scratchings of ink or graphite, impossible to make out. 
but the one his eyes came to rest on was still clear enough. It was Bobby's last drawing of Rosina, of whom he had done so many. Facial studies framed in cascading hair, with tender mouth and large lustrous eyes. Sinuous nude fantasies made flesh. Long graceful hands like rapid sketches of birds in flight. But in this one, Rosina sprawled in the hall doorway, head thrown back, face battered in. Except for slight differences in style, Bobby had a heavier hand with the shading and a way of capturing the fall of light on hair that made it look nearly wet. It was identical to the drawing Trevor had done in his sketchbook on the Greyhound on his way to Missing Mile. Trevor stared at the faded picture, nodding ever so slightly, not even surprised any more. Either Bobby had known how she would look in death before he killed her, as if he'd had some vision, or he had gotten out his sketchbook and drawn her broken body before he had gone into the bathroom to hang himself. Maybe somewhere around here was a sketch of Dee Dee dead, too. Trevor had done one this morning, barely awake, coming out of his dream of not drawing. But now he was here, on the very spot where he sat in the dream, and he could still draw. His jaw was set, his eyes wary, a shade darker than before. Though he did not know it, he looked like a man who has taken blows but is now ready to deal some of his own. He glanced down at his own sketchbook and for the first time really saw what he had just drawn, and all the hardness drained out of his face. His mouth fell open, his throat slammed shut, tears started in his eyes. Caffeine and adrenaline sizzled through his veins, made his heart carom against the walls of his chest. He could barely remember drawing this. It wasn't even how the story was supposed to go. The cops were meant to show up with their nightsticks drawn, bash Bird and Brown around some, then haul them off to jail with bruises and bleeding scalps. That was what had really happened. But in this version the cops never stopped bashing. There were close-ups of hard wood connecting with skulls, skin splitting and curling back from the edges of wounds, a freshet of blood coursing from a nostril, an eye gone to pulp and swollen tissue, a spray of broken teeth on the ground like splinters of ivory scattered on dark velvet. Bird and Brown lay crumpled at the bottom of the final page like animals hunted down and killed for their pelts, adrift in a spreading pool of gore. The gore was darkly shaded and looked slick, nearly wet. Trevor could not remember drawing it. The house and whatever lived here had cast some nightmarish pall across his vision, hypnotized his hand, ruined his story. Or had it? The true story, as Trevor had intended to tell it, would have been strong and affecting in an understated way. Maybe this could be something splashier, stranger, and ultimately more memorable. He envisioned an ending for this version. The cops realize they've killed the musicians and sneak off, figuring they can blame the murders on niggers killing other niggers. But, as white men have failed to realize for too long, people aren't stupid just because they're poor. The black people of Jackson can read the death of their heroes like a bitter book whose pages are bound in dusky skin, writ large with blood spilled in hatred. Jackson is not so far from New Orleans, cradle of dark religion and herbal wisdom from Africa, from Haiti, from the heart of the Louisiana swamp. And hoodoo knowledge has a way of traveling. Trevor imagined the bodies of Bird and Brown rising back up, seeing dimly through smashed eyes thinking dimly with smashed brains. They would be only shells, drained of music, of life. But like all good zombies, they would be able to hone in on their killers. And they would have help. In his mind he saw a full-page final frame. The cops crucified and burning on their own front lawns, nailed to crosses of blazing agony, their blackening, yawning forms silhouetted against the rich texture of the flames. It would have a crudely moralistic E.C. Comics feel to it. But he wouldn't ink it or color it. He would do it entirely in pencil, meticulously shaded and hatched and stippled, and it would be beautiful. And he would sell this fucker, sell it to a market that could afford to print it right. Raw, maybe, or taboo. He loved taboo, an irregularly published anthology of beautifully rendered, lovingly produced, 
weird and twisted comics, printed mostly in stark blacks and whites, shot through here and there with a few pages of color alternately subtle, vivid, and disturbing. Everything from Joe Coleman's mutilation paintings to the numerous intricate collaborations of Alan Moore had appeared in its pages, all printed on fine, heavy paper. Trevor's jaw was set again as he bent back over his sketchbook. But now the emotion in his face looked more like strength than hardness. If he did this right, it would be the best thing he had ever drawn. He drew for four more hours in the harsh electric light, until his eyelids grew heavy and sandy, until his fingers could barely uncurl from the pencil. Then he folded his arms on the tabletop and cradled his head, and went effortlessly to sleep. Sometime later, the gooseneck lamp clicked off, leaving him in darkness, broken only by the trembling, shifting moonlight that came in the windows, filtered through kudzu and twenty years of dust. Trevor did not dream that night. 10. Kinsey Hummingbird woke on Monday morning, hoping Trevor might have come back in the night, though he had not seen him all day Sunday. Kinsey couldn't imagine anyone sleeping in that house, but apparently Trevor had. At any rate, he wasn't here. There were so many things Kinsey wanted to say to the boy, but he had to stop thinking of him as a boy. Trevor was twenty-five, after all. Even if he had had reason to lie, the chronology was right. Kinsey remembered the date of the McGee deaths well enough. It was just that Trevor looked so young. That scared five-year-old was still a big part of him, Kinsey thought, as he got up and went to the kitchen, though some flintier core must have kept Trevor alive and sane. There was an undeniable strength there. Many people in Trevor's situation would have retreated into the numb fog of catatonia, or blown their brains out as soon as they were able to lay hands on a gun. But even for a soul of enormous strength, what would a night in that house have been like? After the investigation of the McGee deaths was over, and of course there had been little investigating to do, the bodies told their own mute tale, the cops had locked the door behind them, and the family's things had sat in the house, gathering dust in the silent, blood-stained rooms. A for-sale sign went up in the scrubby yard, but no one saw it as anything other than a ghoulish joke on the realtor's part. That house would never be rented again, let alone sold. Browsing the aisles of Potter's store one day, deep in the summer of 1972, the for-sale sign outside the murder house already niggling at his mind, Kinsey found himself wondering what had happened to the McGee's things. Potter's was a cavernous thrift establishment downtown, huge and dim and cool, its rickety rows of metal shelves crammed with chipped plates and battered silverware, and obsolete, though usually functional, kitchen appliances its cracked glass display case filled with strange knick-knacks and costume jewelry, its bins heaped high with musty clothing. Kinsey, with his love of junk, often spent long afternoons browsing here. But he didn't think the McGee's belongings had ended up at Potter's store. He wasn't sure what he thought he should have seen. Bloodstained mattresses, maybe, or splattered shirts and dresses woven through the pile marked M-I-S-C Women's C-L-O-T-H-S, 25 cents but there hadn't been any jazz records or underground comics either, and there sure as hell hadn't been a drawing table. He supposed everything was still out there, moldering in the silent rooms. The house on Violin Road never sold. The for sale sign was stolen, replaced by the realtor, whose optimism apparently knew no bounds. The paint on the new sign faded throughout the long dry summer. Tall weeds grew up around it, and it began to list. At last it fell face forward, and was soon hidden in the long grass. By that time, Kudzu had begun to climb the walls of the house. Where the children of Violin Road had thrown rocks through the windows, the insidious vine snaked in. Kinsey imagined it twining through the rooms, sucking nourishment from blood long dry. He did not doubt that this was possible. As a child, he had seen a Kudzu root unearthed from the Civil War graveyard where his own great-great-great-uncle Miles was buried. The root, fully six feet long, had eaten its way through a grave and taken on the shape of the man buried there. Its offshoots formed four twisted limbs, the root tips bursting from them at the ends like a multitude of fingers and toes. At the top had been a skull-sized tangle of delicate fibers in which the planes and hollows of a face could almost be made out. 
Twenty years later the house was nearly hidden under its twining green blanket. Driving past it, you could barely tell that there was a house on the overgrown lot at all. Only the wooden porch and the peak of the roof showed forlornly through the vines. A stand of oaks shaded the house, their heavy canopy of foliage turning the yard into a deep green cave of light and shadow. The fronds of a willow brushed the roof, fingering the jagged edges of glass in the rotting window frames, strumming the kudzu like the strings of a lyre. Kinsey wondered again how much of the family stuff was still in there. He knew kids had broken in over the years, daring each other, showing off. Terry, Steve, and R.J. had been in years ago, though Ghost would not even go as far as the porch. So most of the things in the front room would be long-spirited away. But not many kids would have gotten past the gouged and bloody doorway to the hall, and Kinsey doubted that any would have made it farther than the first bedroom, where the little boy had died. The back rooms would be dusty, but intact. He wondered what Trevor would find in them. Kinsey measured coffee, poured cold tap water into the machine, and as the old percolator began to bubble and steam, fell to gazing out his kitchen window at his own backyard. He had a little vegetable garden, but otherwise the grasses and trees grew wild. Kinsey liked it that way, home to any flying, slithering, or crawling thing that cared to take up residence. But it was not as snarled and shadow-stained, not as forbidding a landscape as the house on Violin Road. The house where Trevor must be now, even as Kinsey sipped his first milky cup of morning coffee. Kinsey's mother had cured him of Christian prayer long ago. He tried to think of a Zen koan that might be of use to Trevor, but the only one he could remember was, Why has Bodhidharma no beard? which didn't seem to apply. But then koans weren't supposed to apply. His head full of ghosts, little smirking Buddhas, and second-hand treasures, Kinsey stood wool-gathering for the better part of an hour in his own clean, comforting kitchen. Hank Williams's nasal twang poured out of the car speakers as raw and potent as moonshine spiked with honey. Zack pondered it as he drove. It should not have been a remarkable voice. It was nothing but a pobucker whine straight from the backwoods of Alabama. But there was something golden and tragic in it, some lost soul that fell to its knees and sobbed every time Hank opened his mouth. He'd been meandering north on I-40 and surrounding roads when he saw the turnoff for Highway 42. Zack loved the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, and the sign reminded him that the number 42 was the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It pulled him as inexorably as the lights of south of the border had done. Soon he was driving down a two-lane blacktop shrouded in rags and tatters of pre-dawn mist, and several times he caught himself singing lustily along with Hank. The little town only caught his attention because of its curious name and weird architecture. To his road-weary eyes it seemed that the entire downtown was decorated with wagon wheels and spinning barber's poles. He almost drove on through but caught himself drifting across the center line and decided to stop for a quick nap. Zack pulled into an alley and came upon a small lot where several other cars were already parked. The friendly local deputy dog wouldn't bother him here. At any rate, he was only going to stretch his tired bones across the seat, close his eyes for a few minutes, then get moving again. He slept for six hours in the parking lot behind the Whirling Disc record store. The lot was also used for storage by an adjacent auto parts store, and the Mustang was not noticed among the other junkers for some time. When he finally woke, the sun had risen high and hot, his body was bathed in sweat, and Terry Bucket was peering into the car, tapping worriedly on the window. Man, I thought you were dead for sure. Terry took a hit off Zack's pipe and passed it back, shaking his head letting the fragrant smoke leak out the corners of his mouth. You looked like somebody had shot you and left you lying there across the seat. All that was missing was the brains on the window. Zack suppressed a shudder. He didn't think the FBI would shoot a hacker on sight, but he wasn't sure about the Secret Service. The NSA probably kept hackers alive for torture and interrogation later, but their jurisdiction was largely military, and military secrets had never much appealed to him. They were sitting on crates in the dim, cool back room of the record store, and though Zack felt an undeniable echo of Leaf and past Christiane, 
Terry was obviously as straight as the day was hot. There was no definable characteristic that told him this. The pheromones just weren't there. It was a good thing, too, Zack thought. After stewing in his own juices all morning, he was sure he stank abominably. As if to confirm this, a girl with long brown hair stuck her head through the curtain, blinked big Cleopatra eyes against the gloom, and wrinkled her nose. Terry? Back here, Vic. The girl picked her way through the boxes and rolled up posters, long gauzy skirts swishing around her ankles. When she got closer, Zack saw that she was wearing a skin-tight tank top, as if to accentuate the fact that she had absolutely no breasts. Eddie had had a phrase for strippers built like that. Nipples on a rib. The girl leaned down to Terry. Zack thought they were going to kiss, but instead Terry blew into her mouth a long stream of smoke, which she sucked in expertly. Tendrils of it seeped from her narrow nostrils and curled around her head. Terry cupped the back of her thigh through the full skirt. This is my gal, Victoria. Vic, meet Zack. He just rolled into town this morning. Looks like we gain two for every one we lose. At Terry's questioning look, she added, You told me about that guy who came in Saturday. Now him. Yeah, so who'd we lose? Oh, my God, you don't know. Victoria clapped her hands over her mouth. Zack wasn't sure, but it looked as if she might be hiding a sudden guilty smirk. That girl, Rima? The one Kinsey fired for stealing from the U? She had a wreck out on the highway, totaled her car and broke her back. They found cocaine all over the place. Gee, Vic, you sound pretty upset about it. Yeah, right. From the sudden chill in the air, Zack guessed that Rima had come on to Terry at some point, though if she was such a loser, he doubted Terry had slept with her. Terry seemed like that rarest of all creatures, a genuinely guileless, decent guy. Besides, you probably couldn't get away with much in a little town like this. Well... A shadow passed over Terry's face. He obviously felt bad about the girl, but didn't want to hurt Victoria's feelings. She didn't kill anyone else? Victoria shook her head, and Terry brightened a little. Zack believed this was known as looking on the bright side, also as pulling the wool over your own eyes. He didn't say anything, though. The last thing he needed now was to annoy anyone. So he loaded another bowl and sat around the back of the store with them for a while longer, listening to gossip about people he didn't know, occasionally asking a question or offering a comment, hacking the scene, making the connections, weaving himself into the net. It was possible anywhere, though it could be a damn sight tougher than breaking into a computer. When Terry's morning crew, one sleepy-looking teenager with a tattoo so fresh it was still bleeding, showed up, Terry and Victoria took Zack down the street for greasy grilled cheese sandwiches at the local diner. The waitress refilled Zack's water glass with tea, and when he took a sip of it without noticing, his nerves began to crackle and fizz like a string of firecrackers. For all of that, he felt good. He liked this town. After lunch, Victoria had to go to work. She sorted and mended old clothes at some downtown thrift shop, and Terry offered to show Zack the local dive before he went back to the record store. By the time they were halfway down the street, Zack was eagerly picturing the inside of a bar. It would be calm and dark and air-conditioned, like a little pocket of nighttime in the middle of the hot afternoon. It would be comforting with the sharp scents of liquor and the grainy smell of beer on tap, lit by the soft watery glow of a Budweiser clock or a neon Dixie sign. He might have been picturing any of a hundred bars in the French Quarter, but the sacred U was like none of them, and Zack had yet to learn how difficult it was to find Dixie beer anywhere but New Orleans. Trevor woke at the drawing table with cramped muscles, an aching head, and a painfully full bladder. The green-tinted sunlight streaming through the studio windows made him wince and rub his eyes, as he had seen Bobby do in the grip of countless bourbon hangovers but he hadn't had the dream of not drawing last night. He stood up without looking at the pages he had drawn, stumbled out of the room, back through the hall and living room, out onto the vine-shrouded porch where he stood urinating into the kudzu, squinting out at the empty road. The day glistened in emerald splendor, 
grass stems and spider webs still bejeweled with yesterday's rain, inviting Trevor to come out and enjoy the sun a while. Instead, he stood for a few minutes in the shelter of the porch, breathing deeply of air that did not smell like mildew or dry rot. From the quality of the light, he thought it was early afternoon. This time twenty years ago, Mama's friends from the art class had been coming up these steps, knocking worriedly on the door, then letting themselves into the house and finding him among the bodies. The man with the gentle hands had been picking him up, carrying him out of the carnage. For an instant, Trevor almost remembered what he had been thinking at that moment, something about the devil, but it eluded him. Soon he turned and went back into the soft gloom of the house. Without giving himself time to think about it, he crossed the living room, walked a few paces down the hall, and let himself into Dee Dee's room. It looked smaller than he remembered, but that might have been due to the kudzu vines that had burst through the window and taken over more than half the room. They twined up the walls, around the light fixture on the ceiling. They trailed into the closet on Trevor's left, where he could still see a few of Dee Dee's toys mired in the leaves, as if the kudzu had actually twined around them and lifted them off the floor. A smiling plush octopus, a wind-up grandfather clock, a once-red rubber ball. All were covered in dust, faded with time and neglect. Twenty years never touched by a little boy's hands, a little boy's love. The kudzu filled the left half of the room with rustling heart-shaped leaves and shifting green shadows. The mattress sat in a clear spot to the right. Instead of a tiny body, it bore only a huge irregular blood stain, dark crimson and wet-looking in the center, fading to the most delicate pale brown around the edges. Trevor noticed splotches and runners of blood on the wall above the mattress, too, five or six feet up. How many blood vessels were in the brain? And how far could they spray when the head was crushed like a juicy grape, made to spill out the red secrets of its wine, the electric potion of its cerebral fluid, the very chemistry of its thoughts and dreams? It's a glorious summer day, some remotely, annoyingly sane voice in his head nagged him. And here you are, buried in this tomb of a house, staring at the twenty-year-old death stain of a brother you barely had time to know. And another part of him answered, we get to the places where we need to be. He pulled the whirling disc T-shirt over his head, let it fall to the floor, and stretched out on Dee Dee's mattress. Stale dust puffed up from the ticking as he centered his head on the bloodstain. It was stiff and dry against his cheek, and smelled only of age, with perhaps a faint sour undertone like the memory of spoiled meat. He nuzzled his face into the stain, spread his arms wide as if to embrace it. From somewhere in the room came a faint popping sound, then the noise of something heavy hitting the floor. Trevor jerked reflexively, but did not look around. He wasn't sure he wanted to see what new surprise the house had dealt him. Not yet. Can't you even give me a minute with Dee Dee, he thought. Can't I even have that before I had to start thinking about you again? But by now he knew he wasn't calling the shots, not many of them anyway. He had come here to learn, and whatever was here would teach him something. He pushed himself up on his elbows and turned to look into the corner of the room from which the sound had come, over by the closet. A small, dark object lay near the edge of the kudzu, as if it had tumbled out of the vines. The object was perhaps a foot long, half shrouded in shadow. Trevor tried to tell himself it could be anything. A stick? A stray piece of wood? a hammer. He got up and crossed the room, stared at it for a long moment, then leaned down and picked it up. The stout wooden handle was scuffed and streaked with dark stains. It felt slightly warm in his hand. The head and claw were rusted, caked with a delicate, crumbling, dry brown matter like powdery fungus, like desiccated petals. He touched his finger to it, rubbed it against his thumb. The scrim of matter between them felt dusty, gritty, pale brown, like the edges of the blood stain. He remembered reading somewhere that any human tissue would turn to some shade of brown eventually, given time. It was the color of all skin, 
the color of waste, the color of rot. Cause of death, blunt trauma. Trevor had no idea what had happened to the hammer that had killed his family, but he knew it could not have stayed in the house. It would have been taken as evidence, photographed, probably even fitted into the holes in their skulls to prove it was indeed the murder weapon. That was how they did things. Yet he knew, too, just as surely, that this was the same hammer. He stood for a long time turning it over and over in his hands. He felt a few slow tears leaking from his eyes, running into his mouth or dripping off his chin. But he had done most of his crying last night with Kinsey. Now he was beginning to feel as if he were being taunted. Here's a hammer. What can you do with it? He didn't know yet. But when a noise came from the living room, no scrape or creak of the house, he was already starting to get used to those, but a distinct footfall, he whirled and raised the hammer before he knew what he was doing. And when he heard a stranger's voice, Trevor moved swiftly and silently toward the door. Shit, I better get back to the store before it pours. Tell Zack I'll see him later if he decides to hang out. Terry tipped a quick salute at Kinsey, who was on his knees ripping several weeks' worth of silver duct tape off the stage, and took his leave of the sacred U. A few minutes later, Zack came out of the restroom, his face and hands freshly scrubbed, his dark eyelashes still beaded with water, settling his glasses on the narrow bridge of his nose. It's raining, he told Kinsey. I heard. How could you tell? The ceiling's leaking. I put the trash can under it. Kinsey sighed, pushed his feathered hat back over his stringy hair, and kept tugging at the duct tape. Did Terry leave? I was going to ask him if he knew a place I could crash. He'll let you have his spare bedroom if R.J. isn't camped there. You can sleep on my couch, too, if you'll do me a favor. I was going to do it myself, but I need to stay here and make sure the place doesn't flood. The landlord won't fix our pipes, and sometimes a heavy rain just comes right in. Zack had an open natty boho in his hand. He grabbed it out of the cooler and slapped two dollars on the counter before Kinsey could card him, and looked in no great hurry to go anywhere, but he agreed readily enough. Sure, I'll do you a favor. There's a young man living in an abandoned house out on the other side of town. Kinsey explained briefly about Trevor, giving none of the details of why he was in the house. He has no electricity or running water. I brought in a few things for him. Blankets, bottled water, some food. Think you could take it out to him? Zack looked dubious. Okay. He doesn't bite. Oh, well then, forget it. Zack saw Kinsey's blank look. Sorry. What's he doing in this abandoned house? I'll let him tell you himself, if he wants to. You'll like Trevor. He's lived in New York. The two of you can compare notes on that pestilent hellhole. Zack followed Kinsey behind the bar to get the box of supplies. Kinsey noticed that Zack's hands were restless, nervous, their slender, spatulate fingers always manipulating something, skating over the keypad of the adding machine, toying with the phone. Once he reached for the keys of the cash register, but drew back as if realizing that would be impolite. The boy seemed to have a fascination for switches and buttons. He refrained from actually pushing them, but stroked and tapped them gently as if wishing he could. Kinsey gave him directions to the house and led him out the back door. Zack could hardly miss the place. There were several run-down houses on Violin Road, but only one that was barely even there. Kinsey went back into the club. Now a thin trickle of water was seeping from under the door of the men's room. If the rain kept up, he could spend the whole afternoon mopping and ringing, mopping and ringing. Damn the landlord. He wasn't sure he had done right by sending Zack out to Violin Road, but it felt right somehow. He hated the thought of Trevor staying out there another night without food or water. Someone should at least make sure he hadn't fallen through a rotten floor and broken his neck. Zack was an all right sort if a little shifty. Kinsey didn't think he was really from New York, or anywhere near it. There was a type of New York accent that sounded something like his voice, true, 
but Kinsey had heard a distinctive one from New Orleans, a weird blend of Italian, Cajun, and Deep South that sounded a lot closer. And Zack had perked up visibly when Terry mentioned that the name of his band was Gumbo. But if he wanted to be from New York, then he was from New York, as far as anyone around here was concerned. Kinsey only asked questions when he could tell a kid wanted him to. Right now, Zack, no last name offered, looked like he wanted to stay as far away from questions as possible. Zack swerved to avoid the swollen carcass of a possum in the road, slowed, and turned into a likely-looking driveway. It was barely more than a rutted track losing a battle to tall grasses and wildflowers. The house itself was so overgrown that it was invisible from the road unless you were looking for it. Zack thought it looked like a wonderful place to live. He finished his beer, got out of the car, and pulled the box of supplies out after him. Kinsey had put a six-pack of Coke in with the bottled water, blankets, and various packaged food. There was even a pillow in a flowered case at the bottom of the box. Whoever this Trevor Black was, Kinsey had done him upright. The rain had slacked off some, but it was still drizzling drearily, beating on his glasses, making his hair straggle into his face. The day had taken on a cool, slightly eerie cast. Zack hoisted the box and lugged it up the steps to the vine-draped porch. The front door hung askew on its hinges, half open. Zack knocked, waited, knocked again. No response. He squinted into the damp gloom of the house, then shrugged and let himself in. For a moment he stood in the center of the living room, letting his eyes adjust to the absence of light. Gradually details resolved themselves, and he saw the holes in the ceiling, the vines twisting in the windows, the rotting hulks of furniture. A tendril of unease touched him. He cleared his throat. Hello? Nothing. The doorway to the hall was a black rectangle, the wall around it smeared with indistinct dark stains. Zack stared at it, feeling worse. What had that old hippie sent him into? He would just put the box down here on the floor and turn around and go. Nothing to it. He lowered it halfway, his eyes never leaving the hall door. When a tall, pale form appeared in the doorway, Zack stifled a scream and dropped the box. It hit the floor and tipped over on its side. A can of Chef Boyardee ravioli rolled across the floor, disappeared under the couch. Absurdly, Zack wondered if Kinsey had remembered a can opener. The pale form came out of the darkness toward him. A shirtless, skinny, ridiculously beautiful boy, long blonde hair spilling over his shoulders and dirt-smudged chest, eyes wide and blazing and utterly mad, a rusty claw hammer clutched in his upraised hand. He looked like some malevolent avenging angel, like a pissed-off Christ come down off the cross ready to pound in some nails of his own. Zack stood paralyzed as the hammer-wielding angel, presumably Trevor, descended on him. He could not seem to make himself speak. He did not want to die like a character in a splatter movie, did not want to die quick and stupid or slow and mean, with a chunk of metal buried in his frontal lobes and syrupy blood gradually obscuring the dumb, startled expression frozen on his face for all eternity. But even less did he love the idea of turning to run and feeling the claw end of the hammer take a divot out of his skull. His heart caromed crazily off the walls of his chest. A wire-thin pain shot down his left arm. Maybe he would just have a heart attack and avoid the whole thing. Trevor's other hand snaked out, wrapped long fingers round Zack's wrist. His touch was galvanizing, akin to an electric shock or a whole pot of coffee. Zack thought his nerves might just rip out of his skin and go twining up Trevor's arm like the stinging tentacles of jellyfish. But his synapses refused to save him. Think, his mind yammered. Flex your brain and think, because if you don't, it's going to end up splattered all over this dirty floor. And is that any fate for this rare and superior organ that has served you so well for nineteen years? Want to go for twenty? Then hack this system, dude. D-zero-zero-D. What's the first thing you need? The password. Trevor, he hollered. No. He had made his voice as loud and sharp as he could. 
He saw Trevor hesitate, but his grip on Zack's wrist didn't loosen, and the hammer stayed upraised, ready to fall. But passwords always required more than one try. Trevor! he shouted again, letting an extra edge of fear and deference creep into his voice. Kinsey sent me. Please don't kill me. Please! Zack felt a tiny bright pain deep in his head, wondered if that was the spot where the hammer would go in, or if he had just managed to have an aneurysm instead of a heart attack. It seemed the body always had some time bomb lurking in its depths. But some of the madness appeared to melt off Trevor. His eyes met Zack's, really saw Zack, and a glassy film cleared from them. The black-rimmed irises were the palest, most delicate ice blue. Moments ago they had been muddy with killing rage. Now Trevor looked horrified and years younger. He let go of Zack's wrist. His shoulders sagged. He tried to swallow but could not seem to work up the spit. The curve of his throat worked convulsively. The skin there was creased with sweat and grime, as if he had not shaved or bathed in days. Okay, you found a crack in the system. That doesn't necessarily mean you're in. Verify yourself. Reassure the system that you belong here. Trevor, I didn't mean to scare you. My name's Zack, and I'm new in town, too, and, uh, Kinsey from the club sent me out to bring you this stuff. The quicksilver eyes flickered. Then Trevor's lips moved. His voice was deeper than Zack had expected, and very quiet. You must think I'm crazy. Well, said Zack, and stopped. Trevor tilted his head. Well, it would help if you put the hammer down. Trevor stared at the grisly tool in his hand, as if he had no idea how it had gotten there. Then, very slowly, he bent and placed the hammer on the floor. I'm sorry, he muttered. I'm really, really sorry. Bingo! In with full user privileges. Bells and whistles should have been going off in Zack's head. But he didn't feel as triumphant as he usually did when he cracked a system. He was starting to remember that Trevor was more than a system. He was a person, and people were volatile things, and that hammer was still within easy reach. And on top of all that, the stricken look on Trevor's face and the jagged catch in his voice were so genuine that Zack actually felt a little sorry for him. He was a beautiful boy, with fierce intelligence behind the craziness flickering in his eyes. Zack wondered what had brought him to this place, to this extremity. You're the only person who ever tried to kill me that apologized for it afterward, he said. So, I guess I accept. A trace of a smile might have crossed Trevor's face. It was gone before Zack could be sure. How many other people have tried to kill you? Two. Who were they? My parents. Trevor's eyes went very wide, paler still. Then, suddenly, they shimmered with tears. A couple spilled over the rims of his eyelids before he could stop them. Great, fat, crystal drops of pain. Once in a while you happen purely at random upon the right password in a million. The unguessable code sequence. The needle in a program's haystack. Once in a while you just get lucky. I can explain everything, said Trevor. The thought of what he had nearly done made Trevor feel lightheaded. The house spun around him. The floor threatened to tilt, to yawn wide open beneath his feet. He couldn't remember what he had been thinking as he grabbed Zack's wrist. He wasn't sure he had been thinking. His mind had felt as empty as the rooms of the house, and that scared him worse than anything. I can explain everything, he said, though he doubted he really could, and doubted even more that Zack would want to hear it. But Zack just shrugged. Sure, if you want to talk about it. I'm not hurt. It's no big deal. Trevor looked at him. Zack was trying to smile, but his face was terribly pale in the gloom, and his eyes still showed too much white. 
Even his hands were shaking. Trevor wondered what kind of threat Zack would consider a big deal. I want to talk about it, he said. Let's go outside. They walked around to the side yard and sat beneath the glistening canopy of the willow. The leaves back here were so thick that the ground was almost dry, though a shimmer of droplets fell on them from time to time. Trevor was still shirtless, and the water beaded on his shoulders, made trickling paths through the dirt on his chest and back. Zack seemed to be watching him closely, waiting to hear what he had to say. In the daylight, Trevor saw that his eyes were a startling shade of green, large and slightly tilted. His face was fine-boned, sharp-featured, interestingly shadowed by his wild spiky hair and the round black frames of his glasses. Trevor realized who Zack resembled, his drawing of Walter Brown, the singer who'd been arrested with Bird in Jackson, Mississippi. The singer whose face Trevor had had to imagine because he'd never seen the man's picture. The likeness wasn't exact, but it was strong enough to put him more at ease with Zack. This was a face he knew, a face that pleased his eye. Trevor began to talk. The words came slowly at first, but soon he could not stop. Never in his life had he talked for so long at one time. He told Zack everything, the deaths, the orphanage, the dreams, the things that had happened since he'd been back in the house. He even talked about the time he had cracked that kid's skull open in the shower, though he didn't mention how much he had liked it. He was surprised at how good talking felt. Not since he stopped letting blood from his arm with a razor blade had he felt such a welcome sense of release, of poison draining from his system. He wasn't sure why those two words Zack had spoken, my parents, had opened him like this. Certainly there had been other kids at the home who had taken plenty of abuse from their parents and probably would have told Trevor about it if he had asked. But those kids had not appeared in the house of his childhood like embodiments of someone he had drawn. Those kids had not stood their ground and talked him out of whatever he had been about to do. He had never gripped those kids' thin wrists hard enough to leave red impressions of his fingers in the flesh. And if he had, he doubted they would have stayed around to hear his reasons why. Trevor's face was hidden behind curtains of long hair, and his voice was so low that Zack had to lean in close to hear it. Trevor kept sneaking looks at Zack as if to gauge his reaction, but would not look him full in the face. Slowly the tale unfolded, beginning with the bloody history that had been branded upon the house before Zack was even born. He would have heard much of this in town soon enough, Trevor said rather bitterly. Word was no doubt getting around Missing Mile that the last survivor of the murder family had come home. He said it just like that, the murder family as if he knew that was what they would be called in the local legends that must have unfolded around them. But Trevor's own story got weirder and weirder until hammers were appearing from thin air and drawings were undergoing sinister mutation betwixt hand and page. Zack kept nodding his encouragement. He was far too fascinated to let Trevor quit. Back in his familiar French quarter, back in his comforting little corner of cyberspace, Zack thought he had seen strange things maybe even done some. But he had never met anyone who had lived through experiences like this, anyone who had taken such damage and remained among the walking wounded. Eventually Trevor's flood of words ran down, and he sat staring out through the drifting, glistening fronds of the willow. Through the undergrowth one weathered corner of the house was just visible, paler gray than the threatening afternoon sky. Zack watched a single raindrop making its way down the knobby ridge of Trevor's spine. At last, Trevor said, I don't know why I told you all that. You still must think I'm crazy. Maybe, Zack told him. But I don't hold it against you. It was obvious no one had ever said such a thing to Trevor before. He didn't know what to make of it. He looked wary, then surprised and finally tried a tentative smile. Zack thought Trevor might indeed be quite insane, but was developing a healthy respect for him in spite of it. Terry, Victoria, and Kinsey were fun to hang out with, but if he was going to stay in Missing Mile for any length of time, he wanted Trevor for his first friend. 
He'd have to sublimate the attraction, though. He'd done it before, once he realized that he actually liked someone. He didn't think it would be a problem. Whereas Terry gave off the wrong kind of pheromones, Trevor didn't seem to give off any. It was as if he had no sexual awareness at all. Zack caught himself wondering how hard it would be to teach him. He watched the raindrop finish its navigation of Trevor's spine and disappear beneath the waistband of his jeans. There was a dusting of the palest golden hair there, slightly damp, right in the hollow of the back. He bit his lip painfully and realized that Trevor was asking him something. Huh? I asked what you do. Oh. After the raw honesty Trevor had shown him, Zack could not entirely bring himself to lie. Well, I work with computers. With great relief, he watched Trevor's eyes glaze over. It was the look of the willful computer illiterate, complete with the hasty little nod that said, That's enough, that's all I need to know. Please don't start talking about bits and bytes and drives and megarams and all that incomprehensible mojo. Zack had seen that look hundreds of times, welcomed it. It meant he wouldn't have to answer any uncomfortable questions. He dug into his pocket and found his last pre-roll joint, flattened and mauled, but more or less intact. Do you mind? he asked. Trevor shook his head. Zack produced one of the lighters Leaf had given him and set it afire. Trevor's nostrils flared as the smoke drifted past his face. I better not, he said when Zack offered him the joint though Zack saw his fingers twitch as if wanting to reach for it. I smoked some pot yesterday and almost passed out. I'm not used to it. Zack gathered all his considerable nerve. Want a shotgun? What's that? Oh, God. How to explain a shotgun without making it sound like the obvious scam it is? I'm not going to take this any further. I'm really not. I like him, damn it but there's no harm in a little innocent frustration. It's, um, where one person breathes in the smoke and then blows it into the other person's mouth. See, my lungs filter the smoke before you get it, so it won't be as strong. Yeah, right. Heavy science going down. Trevor hesitated. Zack tried not to slip into social engineering mode, but he thought he could feel the power radiating in great joyous waves through his brain now. He felt as if he could convince absolutely anybody of absolutely anything. Come on, he said. Pot's good for you. It relaxes you, clears out your brain. Trevor eyed the smoldering joint, then shook his head. No, I'd better not. What? Zack couldn't hide his surprise. He had known Trevor would say yes as surely as he'd known Leaf would give him those damn lighters. Why? Trevor studied Zack's face as intently as anyone ever had, more intently than most of his one-night lovers had done. Zack felt almost uncomfortable under the scrutiny of those striking serious eyes. You really want me to do it, don't you? Zack shrugged, but he felt Trevor had looked straight through his skull to the whorls of his devious, treacherous brain. It's more fun getting stoned with somebody, that's all. Another long, searching look. Okay, then. I'll take one. Zack thought Trevor might as well have added, but don't fuck with me too much, here. He realized that his heart was beating more rapidly than ever, that his blood was surging, and his head felt like a helium balloon ascending fast into an achingly blue cloudless sky. No one ever got to him this way. This was the way he liked to make other people feel. He took a deep hit off the joint, held it in for a second, then leaned over and exhaled a long, steady stream of smoke into Trevor's open mouth. Their lips barely grazed. Trevor's felt as soft as velvet, as rain. Ribbons of smoke twined from the corners of their mouths, swayed their heads in an amorphous blue-gray veil. Zack kept his eyes open and saw that Trevor had closed his, as if being kissed. His eyelashes were a dark ginger color, the pale parchment of his eyelids shot through with the most delicate lavender tracery of veins. Zack thought of putting his mouth against those eyelids, of feeling the lashes silky against his lips. 
the secret caged movement of the eyeball beneath his tongue. And he was doing a damn fine job of sublimating his attraction, wasn't he? He pulled back, shaken. Once he decided he wasn't going to be turned on by someone, he just wasn't anymore. At least, that was how it had always been. He let himself have anyone he wanted, unless he had good reason not to want them, and his libido had always paid back by giving him complete control. Until now. Trevor lay back on the damp grass and put a hand to his forehead. Zack saw pine needles snarled in his long hair, fresh dirt under his fingernails tiny beads of water trapped in the fine hairs around his nipples. So, said Trevor, blowing out his shotgun, how did your parents try to kill you? My dad beat the shit out of me for fourteen years. My mom mostly just used her mouth. Why did you stay? Zack shrugged. Nowhere else to go. From the corner of his eye he saw Trevor nod. Sure, I could have run away when I was nine or ten, but there would have been a lifetime of stiff dicks in town cars waiting for me. I waited until I knew I could take care of myself some way besides giving blowjobs. Then I ran. Just disappeared into another part of the city. They never tried to find me. What city? Zack hesitated. He still didn't want to lie to Trevor, but he couldn't start giving different stories to different people. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. New Orleans, Zack said, not even sure why. But don't tell anybody. Are you on the run or something? Zack's silence spoke volumes. It's okay, said Trevor. I've been running from this place for seven years. But, you know, you get sick of it after a while. Yeah so you come back and it tries to make you bash people's brains out. Trevor shrugged. I wasn't expecting company. Zack started laughing. He couldn't help it. This guy was so fucked up. But smart, and despite his weird asexuality, entirely too beautiful. Trevor stared at him for a moment, then tentatively joined in. They grinned at each other in ganja swirled camaraderie. Suddenly, Zack found himself wondering again if it mightn't be possible, after all, to love someone and make love with them, too. Something about such a spontaneous, sweet smile on a face that didn't smile too often made him wonder why he had always denied himself the physical pleasure of a person he truly cared for. Wouldn't it be fun to see someone? All right, then, someone like Trevor, smile that way just because Zack knew how to make him feel good? Maybe even more fun than getting sucked off by a cute, all-but-anonymous stranger in the back room of a convenience store in a state he might never see again? Probably not. Probably it would end in cutting words and tears, pain and blame and regret, maybe even blood. Those were the risks of such a relationship, almost guaranteed. But where along the line had he decided that he could not take those particular risks while cheerfully taking indeed seeking out so many others. Trevor was watching him closely. He looked as if he wanted to say, what are you thinking, but didn't. Zack was glad. He'd always hated that question. It seemed people only asked it of you when you were thinking about something you didn't want to share. Instead, very hesitantly, Trevor asked, have we met before? Do I know you? He frowned as if that weren't precisely the question he wanted to ask, but he could not find the words for the right one. Zack shook his head. I don't think so, but it feels like we have, Trevor finished for him. Zack snuffed the half-burnt joint and put it back in his pocket. They sat in silence for a few minutes. Neither wanted to be the first to say too much, to take this strange new notion too far. Zack mused on how irretrievable words were in the real world. In many ways, he preferred the simplicity of the computer universe, where you could revise and delete things at will, where you acted and the system could only react in certain ways. But there you ran up against an eventual wall of predictability. Here, the slightest shift in semantics could make a situation run wild, 
and that appealed to him too. The rain had nearly stopped. Now it began to come down harder again, though they were still protected beneath the canopy of branches and vines. The sky rumbled with nascent thunder, then erupted. All at once it was pouring. Zack saw a chance to diffuse the awkwardness. He caught Trevor's arm and pulled him up, noticing how Trevor's flesh seemed to simultaneously cleave to and cringe from his touch. Come on, he urged. Where? Don't you want to shower? This is our chance. Out here? Sure, why not? Nobody can see us from the road. Zack ducked out from under the curtain of willow fronds and ran to a clear patch in the yard. He kicked his sneakers off, pulled his shirt over his head, stuck his glasses in his pocket, and started unbuttoning his pants. Trevor followed, looking doubtful. Are you going to get naked? Zack undid the last button and let his cutoffs fall. He wasn't wearing any underwear. Trevor raised his eyebrows, then shrugged, unbuckled his jeans, and pushed them down over his skinny hips. If he'd grown up in an orphanage, male nudity was probably no big deal to him. The rain sluiced over their bodies, washing away the grime of the road and the old crumbling house. Trevor was only a wet blur several feet away. Zack could barely see him flinging his arms about as if dancing or performing some wild invocation. Zack raised his face to the downpour and let it fill the tired hollows of his eyes, washed the taste of smoke from his lips. He was not aware that he was grinning like a fool until he felt rain trickling between his teeth, over his tongue, and down his throat in a little silver river. 11. Kinsey was mopping up the last of the water as the early evening barflies began to drift in. Terry was closing up shop at the whirling disc and wishing Steve Finn were in town. The new guy had fucked up an invoice and ordered twenty copies of Louis Limbo Lounge, an obscure album of exquisitely bad strip club music, instead of the two Terry had meant to special order. Now they could hear such classics as Torture Rock, Beaver Shot, and the amazing Hootie Sapper Ticker by Barbara and the boys whenever they so desired. Terry started to call Poindexters in Durham to see if they wanted any, but decided fuck it and went instead to buy his girl a beer. A gaudy sunset bathed the downtown in red and purple light, and the slowly darkening streets glistened with the rain that had fallen all afternoon. One by one the streetlights flickered on. Terry remembered a summer two or three years ago when there had been a plague of luna moths. The huge insects beat against windows and swarmed around streetlights, their broad, fragile wings catching the light and making it shift strangely, their color like nothing else in nature, the palest silver green, the color of ectoplasm or the glow of radiation. You could find drifts of them tattered and dead in the gutter, their fat furred bodies shriveled to husks. Soon a flock of bats descended upon the town, roosting in the treetops and church bell towers by day, swooping out at night to catch the luna moths in their tiny razored jaws. If the show at the Sacred U was boring, the kids would congregate on the street and watch the shadow play of leathery and iridescent wings, strained to hear the high needling squeal of the bats over the churn of guitars and percussion from the club. One night Ghost had mused aloud that to the bats the moth's blood must taste like creme de menthe. Terry wondered what had become of the new kids. He thought Zack might have just hit the other side of town and kept driving. That boy looked like he might have some place to be in a hurry. And he guessed Trevor was still out at the murder house. Hell of a thing, Bobby McGee's son coming back after all these years. Well, Kinsey would know the lowdown. Terry hastened his step toward the U, toward friends and music and the taste of a cold beer in his favorite bar on a summer's evening. By ten o'clock, Terry had had five cold beers and had forgotten all about Zack. But Zack had not hit the other side of town, had not even returned to his car except to check the locks and pull it around to the side of the house. He had found a place he liked, and he had every intention of setting up camp here for a few days unless Trevor objected. But he didn't think Trevor would. When they came in from the rainstorm, Trevor excused himself to put on dry clothes and disappeared down the hall. Zack followed a few minutes later and found him sprawled on a bare mattress in one of the back bedrooms. 
naked and almost painfully thin, long hair spread out around his head like a corona, he was already deeply asleep. Zack watched him for several moments, but could not disturb him. Trevor had spent the last three nights sleeping on a greyhound bus, a couch, and a drawing table. He deserved some bed rest. Zack got one of Kinsey's blankets and covered him. As he did so, he saw goose flesh shivering across Trevor's chest, water droplets still caught in the cup of his navel and the damp tangle of his pubic hair. He imagined the salty taste those droplets would have if he were to bend down and lick them away. Now you want to molest him in his sleep. It was Eddie's voice, out of nowhere. Christ, Zack, why don't you just buy a blow-up love doll on Bourbon Street and be done with it? Fuck you, Eddie. As he turned away from the bed, he noticed drawings tacked to the walls. Monsters and fanciful houses, unfamiliar landscapes, and faces, all kinds of faces. A child's drawings, but a child with obvious talent, with an eye for line and proportion, with an untrammeled imagination. This was Trevor's own room. Zack left Trevor to sleep and started exploring the house. At the end of the hall was the bathroom, where Bobby had died. There was no window in this room, and Zack did not think to try the switch. He stood on the threshold, staring into the unlit chamber, saw porcelain gleaming dully beneath the layers of dirt and cobweb. The shower curtain rod was bent, almost buckled. Zack wondered if Trevor had seen that yet. Something about the bathroom's geometry seemed wrong as if the angle at which walls met ceiling were slightly skewed. It made Zack feel dizzy, almost nauseated. He turned away and went into the room across the hall, which was the studio. He saw Trevor's sketchbook lying open on the drawing table and slowly flipped through the pages. The drawings were very good. Zack had read one issue of Birdland, and he thought Trevor's style was already technically better than Bobby's. The lines were surer the faces finer and more subtle, with layer upon layer of nuance lurking in the expressions he captured. But Bobby's work had always had a certain fractured warmth to it. No matter how sordid and vile his characters were, the junkies and glib beatniks and talking saxophones who got laid more often than their human counterparts, you always felt they were pawns in an indifferent universe, butts of an existential joke with no punchline. Trevor's work was harsher, icier, his universe was not indifferent, but cruel. He knew his punchline. The crumpled, bleeding woman in the doorway. The broken bodies of the musicians. The burning cops. And others, as Zack paged back through the book. So many others. So many beautifully drawn dead bodies. He checked out the master bedroom and its walk-in closet. Saw little of interest. The parents hadn't brought much of their own stuff, probably. After fitting Bobby's art supplies and the kids' things in the car, there wouldn't have been much space left. He crossed the hall to Dee Dee's room, stopped dead on the threshold, and stared at the huge dark mass boiling through the window, then realized it was Kudzu. Zack wondered how long it would be before the vines filled the room from floor to ceiling. He took in the blood stain on the mattress, the spatters high on the wall. Trevor said the hammer had appeared in the opposite corner next to the small closet. Zack looked at the area, even prodded the kudzu with the toe of his sneaker, but found nothing unusual. He had heard of objects instantaneously being transported from one place to another. They were called a ports, and were supposed to be warm to the touch, as Trevor said the hammer had been. Zack wasn't sure he believed in a ports, but he couldn't think of another way it might have gotten there, if it was the same hammer. But if it wasn't, where had the dried blood and tissue come from? Zack didn't even want to wonder. It had to be the same one. That made more sense than thinking Trevor had bought another one and smeared it with sheep brains or something. Zack was not an implicit believer in the supernatural, but he didn't believe in scaring up improbable natural explanations just to rule it out, either. Nature was a complex system. There had to be more to it than anyone could understand from looking at the surface. The kitchen was large and old-fashioned, with a freestanding sink and a gas range. A real farmhouse kitchen, or so Zack imagined. 
He opened the refrigerator and was surprised to see the light come on. He hadn't tested the electricity, he realized. He had forgotten about it until now. In the fridge was a juice bottle with a half inch of black sludge at the bottom, some kind of vegetable matter mummified beyond recognition, and a Tupperware container whose contents he dared not contemplate. He'd heard Tupperware coffins could preserve human remains for twenty years or more, so who knew what they could do to leftovers? Zack retrieved the cokes and bottled water from the living room and arranged them on the shelf next to the juice. He checked Trevor again, found him still sleeping. Zack began to get bored. He picked his way across the living room, went out to his car, and got the bag that held his laptop computer and cellular phone. He thought he might be staying here for a few days, and he wanted to give Eddie a more specific message than the one he had left last night. If he dialed in now, he thought he could just make the deadline. Zack accessed the Times-Picayune's computer, typed rapidly for several minutes, then pressed the keys to send his article. After he had done that, he was still restless. He found a square of yellow post-it notes in his bag, scribbled down a few phone codes, and stuck them on the edge of the table. They were numbers he might need in a hurry, and he didn't think Trevor would mind. Then, just for the hell of it, he dialed into Mutinet. He didn't log in with his own password, of course, since they might be monitoring the board. But Zack had long since acquired full systems operator privileges on Mutinet, though he had discreetly neglected to mention this fact to the Sysop. The Sysop fancied himself a Discordian, or worshipper of the chaotic goddess Eris, and his password was P-O-E-E-5. -E First, Zack read the messages on the main board, scanning them for his handle. Message 65 from Codes Kid to All Mutants. Lucio got busted today. Ha, 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 ha. Message 73 from Zombie to Codes Kid. If you had a googolth of Lucio's hacking skill, you would not take such sick joy in his misfortune. You are wrong, kiddo. Somebody warned him Saturday night, and he's long gone. Message 76 from Acker to Mutoids. Zombie's right. I, Acker, the hacker, founder of the data acquisition and retrieval team, DART, cracked the Secret Services system and found the warrant to search Lucio's house. It was I who warned him in time. Power to DART. Emoticon, sideways smile face. Message 80 from St. Gulick, your humble sysop, to anyone reading this. Lucio can't get on this board anymore. I disabled his account. If he tries to contact you, don't talk to him. For all we know, he could have gotten busted and turned informant. Anyone known to still have contact with him will be kicked off Mutinet. A paranoid hacker is a free hacker. That caught Zack's interest, so he checked the sysop's personal mail. There was only one message. From Zombie to St. Bogus. Fuck your fascist board, dude, D-0-0-D. You'd be the first to turn rat if a KK computer KK cop nailed your white ass. Your address is 622 Fraser Street in Metairie, and if you keep telling kids who not to talk to, I will first post it on boards all over the country, then come over there and personally introduce your teeth to some of that chaos you're supposed to worship, but don't seem to. And by the way, Acker didn't warn Lucio. I did. Zack nearly fell off his chair laughing. He'd known he could count on Zombie. He left two messages, the first on the main board where everyone could read it, the second personal. From Lucio to St. Paranoid. Please don't kick me off the board, Br'er Sysop. Please, please, please. From Lucio to Zombie. A Google Times, thanks. Then Zack logged off Mutinet, maybe for the last time. After turning the computer off, he felt disoriented. He was used to spending hours each day in front of the screen. Those few minutes had only whetted his appetite, had made his fingers tingle, but hadn't given them the supersensitized buzz he got from a marathon session of pounding the keys. But he didn't need money yet, and he wanted to lie low for a few days. He noticed Trevor's backpack sitting on the kitchen counter. The zipper was half open, and Zack could see the corner of a comic book poking out. 
He glanced toward the door, then went over to the bag, cautiously tugged the zipper all the way down, and began to nose through the contents. To Zack, this was no different from examining Trevor's credit rating or police record, either of which he would have done guiltlessly and without hesitation if he had reason to. But he didn't care about those things. He wanted to know what Trevor carried around with him, what he kept close to him. Here were all three issues of Birdland, battered copies in plastic bags. No surprises there. A Walkman and some tapes. Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker, and just for good measure, Charlie Parker. A black T-shirt, a pair of underwear, a toothbrush, and other assorted toiletries. Pretty boring. Zack dug deeper, and his fingers touched worn paper. An envelope. He pulled it out, unfolded the contents carefully. The three sheets of paper were taped and retaped at every crease, wrinkled to the texture of fine silk. Much of the text was indecipherable, but from what Zack could make out, he suspected Trevor had it memorized. Multiple defensive wounds. A blow to the chest penetrated the breastbone and ruptured the heart, and could in and of itself have been fatal. Due to gross trauma, victim's brain could not be removed in one piece. Robert F. McGee, Occupation Artist Each report was signed by the county coroner and dated June 16, 1972. Yesterday had been the 20th anniversary of the McGee's deaths. Tomorrow would be the 20th anniversary of their autopsies. Zack imagined the three naked bodies lined up on steel tables whose blood gutters were black with clotted gore. He could picture them much more clearly than he wanted to, their skin shockingly livid, their wounds black and purple, their torsos crisscrossed with Y-shaped autopsy scars that bisected each pectoral muscle and went all the way down to the pubic bone, the woman's breast hanging slack and darkly veined like fruit gone rotten on the tree, her long hair stiff with blood. The little boy's head tilted at an awkward angle because the back of his skull was gone, his soft pink lips sealed with a crust of dried blood, his fingers permanently curled like a doll's. The man, with his eyes squeezed halfway out of their sockets by the pressure of the rope, giving him a goggle-eyed stare that would last until the eyeballs fell into the cranial cavity. Zack folded the autopsy reports and jammed them back into the envelope. It was as if Trevor had imagined the scene so many times that it was imprinted on these sheets of paper like some sort of psychic snapshot. Zack glanced over his shoulder again, but the doorway was still empty. He wasn't sure if he had been afraid of seeing Trevor or something worse. Enough snooping for now. It was making him jumpy. He put the envelope back and found a fat paperback book in the very bottom of the bag. Thou shalt not kill was the true tale of a man named John List, who had calmly and systematically murdered five members of his family, wife, mother, two sons, and a daughter, and then disappeared for eighteen years. The back cover said they had caught him through the TV show America's Most Wanted. The book fell open in Zack's hands to page 281, where the spine was cracked. List was killing his older son, fifteen-year-old Johnny. He'd struggled with the boy in the kitchen, shot him in the back as he ran down the hall, caught up with him and shot him nine more times as he tried to crawl away from his father toward some imagined safety. Zack checked out Johnny's school picture in the section of photographs at the center of the book. A skinny, grinning kid with badly cut dark hair and birth control glasses and ears that stuck out goofily. Looked like a hundred computer geeks Zack had known, not so different from how he had looked at fifteen. This shit could happen to anybody. He sat down at the table and began to read about the lists. He didn't usually read this kind of thing, but it was a pretty interesting story. They didn't find List's family until a month later, lined up on sleeping bags in the giant ballroom, their bodies black and swollen. When it grew too dark to see the page, Zack got up and switched the overhead light on without thinking about it. He read for two hours until he heard stirring and yawning from the bedroom. Trevor appeared in the kitchen doorway, his hair rumpled and tangled, knuckling sleep from his eyes. He had put on a pair of baggy black sweatpants, but remained shirtless. 
Was I out long? Couple hours. I thought you could use it. Why are you reading that? Sack put the book down. Why are you? I mean, it's none of my business, but it seems a little depressing for someone in your situation. Trevor pulled out the other chair and sat down at the table. I always read books like that. I keep hoping one of them will make me understand why the guy did it. Any luck? No. Suddenly Trevor looked up, speared him with those eyes. Anyway, I meant why are you reading that book that was in my bag? I didn't say you could go in my bag. Zack held up his hands. Sorry. I just wanted something to read and you were asleep. I didn't touch anything else. Great. They'd make a perfect pair. A professional snoop and a privacy freak. Zack guessed now was probably not the best time to tell Trevor how much he had liked the drawings in his sketchbook, and he didn't think he'd better mention the autopsy reports at all. Trevor still didn't look happy about the matter, but let it drop. He noticed Zack's post-it notes, peeled one off the table and read it. What's this? A phone card number. What's it for? Making phone calls. Trevor gave Zack a look, but decided to let this pass, too. Are you hungry? Starved. They retrieved Kinsey's can of ravioli from under the couch and ate it cold, with forks scrounged out of a kitchen drawer. It was awful, but Zack felt better after he had choked it down. He watched Trevor drink two Cokes the way some guys drank beer, putting the stuff away with more regard for quick chemical effect than thirst or taste. He was starting to think he could watch Trevor all night. Do you want something else? he asked, thinking they might go out to the diner. Trevor looked at him rather sheepishly. Could I? Anything, Zack wanted to say, but settled for what? Could I have some more of that pot? Zack laughed and fished the half-burnt joint out of his pocket. It was a bit damp, but fired up fine. I thought you weren't used to it, he said. I'm not. I never really liked it before. But my dad used to smoke a lot back when he was drawing, and I just thought... What? Zack asked gently. That you could figure out why he stopped? Trevor shrugged. If I really wanted to figure that out, I'd start drinking whiskey. Bobby used to say pot made him more creative, and after he went dry, he wouldn't smoke even when Mama tried to make him. It was like he didn't even want to try anymore. Maybe he just knew it was gone no matter what he did. Maybe. They sat at the table, talking and smoking. As Trevor passed him the joint, Zack noticed the tracery of slightly raised white scars on his left forearm. He had to put some on the outside, Zack thought, to match the ones on the inside. But he didn't yet know Trevor well enough to say that. Instead, he talked of New Orleans, the daytime bustle of the French market, the way the cobblestone streets looked at night under the gas lamps, all black and gold, the neon smear of Bourbon Street, the river like a dirty brown vein pulsing through the city. At last, they both began to yawn. Trevor stood up, stretched hugely. Zack watched the loose sweatpants ride low on the ridges of his hip bones, then wondered why he was staring. He'd already seen it all this afternoon. Do you want to crash here? Finally. That'd be great. You can have the big bedroom. There's a mattress and, uh... Trevor stared at the floor. Nobody died in there or anything. Zack hadn't expected an invitation to bed down with Trevor, was still trying to convince himself he didn't want one. But he couldn't help feeling disappointed as he said goodnight and left the kitchen. He untied his sneakers, took off his glasses, and was about to lie down on the sagging double mattress when he realized that his head and back were throbbing in tandem. He'd been running on pure adrenaline for more than 24 hours. Now the pot and the long drive had finally kicked in to give him the great granddaddy of all body aches, and he hadn't brought any kind of medicine. He padded down the hall to Trevor's room, 
saw that the light was still on, and tapped at the door. Do you have any aspirin? Trevor was sprawled in bed reading the John List book. Yeah, I think so. He sat up and rummaged in his bag, came up with a single white pill. Here you go. I think this is my last one. Thanks. Good night again. Zack went to the kitchen and drank from the faucet, put the pill in his mouth and washed it down. A chill ran along his spine as he passed the hall doorway and returned to his room. It was dank and dim, empty except for the mattress and some moldering cardboard boxes in the shadowed recesses of the closet, the window an inky rectangle beaded with rain. For the first time in hours, Zack found himself unnerved by the house. Sitting in the bright kitchen talking with Trevor was one thing. Sleeping by himself in the bedroom of a suicide and a murder victim whose blood still stained the place, that was another. But he wasn't afraid of ghosts, he reminded himself. He lay down on the dusty mattress, pulled one of Kinsey's blankets over him and closed his eyes. A few minutes later, his heart gave a nauseating lurch and began to race so hard he thought it might just punch right through his breastbone like an angry fist made of muscle and blood. Then his whole chest seized up, and he was sure the tortured organ had simply ceased to beat, that in seconds he would realize he was dead. He felt the house gather itself around him, its rotting boards alive and watchful, its darkness ready to enfold him in velvety arms and claim him for its own. Trevor turned out the light and lay back on his mattress, listening to the slow creak and drip of the house. He thought that somewhere deep within the hundreds of tiny noises there might be a murmuring voice. He wondered what having Zack here would do to the house's subtle chemistry. He wondered why he had let Zack stay. It was only for one night, he told himself. Zack was an outsider, too, and he would surely want to move on tomorrow. But that didn't explain the weird sensation they'd had of almost recognizing each other this afternoon. And it didn't explain the tightness Trevor felt behind his eyes when he looked at Zack, or the uneasy warmth deep in his stomach when he thought about Zack now. He was so smart, and so strange, and he had the smoothest skin, like matte paper. Probably it was just the pot. Trevor had smoked too much. Stupid to think it could teach him anything of his father. It was only a drug, its effects as subjective as those of sleep or sorrow. Even alcohol was nothing but a drug. In his heart, he knew it hadn't made Bobby kill his family any more than the hammer had. The idea of being drunk still made Trevor feel sick, though. All he could remember was the stinging scent of whiskey that had surrounded Bobby like a cloud as he watched his five-year-old son drink second all, then hugged him good night for the last time. Trevor heard a floorboard creak in the hall, then a closer sound. The door of his room, which he had pushed to, slowly swinging open. His body stiffened, and his ears strained. He felt his pupils dilating hugely, painfully against the blackness. Trevor, you still awake? It was Zack. He thought of not answering of pretending to be asleep. He couldn't imagine what Zack wanted now. But Zack had listened to him this afternoon. I'm awake, he said, and sat up. What was that medicine you gave me? Aspirin, like you asked for. Are you sure it was aspirin? Well, Excedrin, that's what I always take. Oh, God. Zack laughed weakly. That shit has 65 milligrams of caffeine in every tablet. I can't deal with caffeine. What happens? It hits me like speed. Bad speed. What do you want me to do? Nothing. He felt Zack's weight settle onto the edge of the mattress. I'm not going to be able to sleep for a while, though. I thought maybe we could talk some more. Why? Why what? Why do you want to talk to me? Why shouldn't I? I don't understand why you like me. The first time I ever laid eyes on you, I tried to knock your brains out. Now I've poisoned you. How come you're still here? 
He heard Zack try to laugh. It came out more like a moan. Just persistent, I guess. No, really. Well? A shudder ran through Zack's body, into the mattress. Do you mind if I stretch out here? I guess not. Trevor moved to one side of the bed. He felt Zack arranging himself on the other side, thought he could feel electricity crackling off Zack's skin. When Zack's elbow brushed his, it gave Trevor a sensation like the shock one gets from walking across a carpet and then touching metal. First of all, said Zack, you didn't try to knock my brains out. You stopped. Second, you didn't know caffeine would hurt me. Even so... Even so, seems like I would have figured out by now that you aren't exactly good for my health. Something like that, yeah. Maybe I'm not in this for my health. In what? Life? Then what are you in it for? Um, he felt Zack shiver. To keep myself amused, I guess. No, not amused. Interested. I want to do everything. You do? Really? Sure, don't you? Trevor thought about it. I think I just want to see everything, he said at last. And sometimes I'm not even sure I want to. I just feel like I have to. That's because you're an artist. Artists remind me of stills. Of what? Of stills. What they use to make moonshine. You take in information and distill it into art. Zack was silent for a moment. I guess that's not such a good analogy from your point of view. It's okay. A still doesn't have much choice about making moonshine. The choice is up to the person who drinks it. Then I'll drink your moonshine any time you want to give me some, said Zack. I admire you. That's why I didn't leave this afternoon. You may be crazy, but I think you're also very brave. Suddenly Trevor felt like crying again. Here was this young kid on the run from some sinister unknown, this curious, generous, resilient soul who could stand up to a stranger with a hammer and make friends afterward, and he thought Trevor was brave. It didn't make sense, but it sure made him feel better. He couldn't remember the last time anyone had told him he was doing something right. Thanks, he said when he could trust his voice. I don't feel very brave, though. I feel scared all the time. Yeah, me too. Something brushed the side of Trevor's hand, then crept warmly into the palm. Zack's finger, still trembling a little. Trevor nearly jerked his hand away, actually felt his muscles tensing and pulling. But at the last second, his own fingers curled around Zack's and trapped it. If he went, he wouldn't take anyone with him. That was the one thing Trevor had promised himself. But if he had someone to hang on to, maybe he wouldn't have to go. At least, not all the way down. Zack's touch sent little currents through his hand, into his bloodstream. The old scars on his arm throbbed in time with his heartbeat. In the darkness, he could just make out Zack's shining eyes. What do you want? he whispered. Could you... Zack squeezed his hand, then let go. Could you just hold me? This damn Excedrin. Yes, said Trevor. I think I can. I'll try. Gingerly, he reached out and found Zack's bare shoulder, slid his arm around Zack's chest, moved closer so that their bodies were nestled like two spoons in a drawer. Zack's heart was hammering madly, his muscles so taut it was like hugging an electrical coil about to blow. His body felt smaller and frailer than Trevor would have expected. It reminded him of sleeping with Dee Dee. They had often nestled together in just the same way. The damnedest thing, Zack said into the pillow, is my head still hurts. Trevor laughed. He could hardly believe any of this was happening. He would wake up and find that he'd slept another night at the drawing table, had invented this boy, this impossible situation. He wasn't supposed to be feeling like this. He had never felt like this. He was supposed to be finding out why he was alive. 
but he was very aware of Zack's skin against his own, as smooth as he had imagined it, and he didn't want to pull away. If anything, he wanted to get closer. He wondered if this might have something to do with why he was alive. Trevor pressed his face into the soft hair at the back of Zack's neck. Are you supposed to be here? he asked very softly, half hoping Zack would not hear him. Is this part of what's supposed to happen? Fuck supposed to, said Zack. You make it up as you go along. Holding each other like a pair of twins in the womb, they were able to sleep. Sometime just before dawn, a slow shimmering began in the air near the ceiling just above the bed. It deepened into a vaguely circular whirlpool pattern, something like the waves of heat that swim above asphalt in the heart of a southern summer. Then tiny white fragments of paper began to fall, appearing in the air and seesawing slowly down. Soon, a funnel-shaped cloud of them was swirling like a freak snowstorm in the hot, still room. Trevor and Zack slept on, not knowing, not caring. The bits of paper collected on the floor, the bed, the boys' sweaty, sleeping bodies. Dawn found them still locked tightly together, Trevor's face buried in the hollow of Zack's shoulder and his arms clamped across Zack's chest, Zack's hands clutching Trevor so tightly that Trevor would later find the indentations of Zack's nails in his palms. Awake, they had been afraid to touch each other at all. Asleep, they looked as if they would be terrified to ever let go. Twelve. As luck would have it, Eddie had a hacker in her apartment when the Secret Service kicked the door down. His name was Stefan, better known on Zack's beloved pirate boards as Fetus, and he was one of the few local computer outlaws who knew Zack's real name and where he lived. Even if Zack hadn't wanted him to have this information, Fetus could easily have chivied it out of the vast grid of data kept under electronic lock and key by the phone company. Zack said he was very good. He ran with a local gang of hackers who called themselves the Order of Dagon, order spelled zero R-D-E-R, -E of spelled zero F, and Dagon spelled D-A-G-Zero-N. Hackers, Zack had explained to her, often employed a unique spelling system in which Fs were replaced with PHs, plural Ss with Zs, and ordinary Os with zeros. It amused Eddie to picture Lovecraft's blasphemous fish frogs of nameless design flopping, hopping, croaking, bleeding, and surging inhumanly through the spectral moonlight all the way from Innsmouth to New Orleans and the surrounding swamps, where they had presumably set themselves up with the latest technology and started tapping phone lines and cracking databanks. He came knocking at her door early Tuesday morning, sometime around eleven. Eddie had spent all day Sunday and most of Monday trundling her stuff from her old apartment over to Madison Street in a little red wagon she usually used for shopping and laundry. It didn't dawn on her until she was making the second-to-last trip that she could have hired a moving van. Having thousands of dollars in the bank was difficult to get used to. She kept expecting someone to stop her on the street and tell her there had been a mistake, which, of course, there had been. But with luck, they wouldn't find out about it. By Monday night, she was sore and exhausted. She had collapsed on Zack's bed, thinking she would just rest for a few minutes, then get up and go to the corner liquor store for a flask of rotgut. She could drink if she wanted to. She didn't have to get up and drag herself to the Pink Diamond tomorrow afternoon. She could call that hairy, failed rock star Loop and tell him to blow. Of course, she would do no such thing. She would inform him politely that she was taking some time off, and she hoped it wasn't too inconvenient, and he could call her if he needed a dancer to fill in sometime. Then, if he called, she would have to search madly for excuses not to. Sometimes the leftover shreds of her upbringing could be a real bitch. In Korean etiquette, there was no such thing as a flat no. You left all possibilities open, no matter how ambiguous. You never caused the other person to lose face, not even if he was a sexist, coke-snorting asshole. She took one last look at the twenty-five wagon loads of her stuff strewn around the room, along with everything Zack had left. It was a mess. Eddie decided to rest her eyes for a few minutes. When she opened them again, sunlight was streaming through the open window, 
A green lizard was poised on the ceiling, spearing her with its jeweled gaze, and someone was knocking lightly but rapidly at the door. She opened it, and Fetus slipped through the crack. He was perhaps seventeen, very thin, tall, and loose-jointed. Something about his posture and gait reminded Eddie of those posters of evolving man. Fetus was somewhere around the midpoint, where the head and muscle structure were more human than ape, but the arms still dangled a bit too low. His curly brown hair looked as if it might lighten two or three shades if he washed it, and his eyes were nearly hidden behind lenses as thick and swirly as the bottoms of Coke bottles. He looked blankly at her. You're not Zack. No, Stepan, I'm Eddie, remember? We met at the Café du Monde once. She had been having coffee and beignets while Zack nibbled the Thai bird peppers he'd just bought in the market and chased them with a cold glass of milk. They had a table by the railing, and Zack hailed the nervous, pasty-skinned boy as he skulked by, dodging street performers, avoiding the eyes of tourists. When introduced, the guy stared at Eddie as if petrified by the sight of her, leaned over the railing to mumble something to Zack. It sounded like the eunuch's holes are wide open, and sidled quickly away toward the river. Who was that? Eddie inquired. That was one of the most brilliant phone systems guys on the planet. He's also the sysop of a pirate board called the Lurking Fear, and a member of the Order of Dagon. He's way underground. Sociable type, isn't he? As usual, when Zack talked about his hacker buddies, Eddie understood about half of it, but she always looked at her telephone a bit more warily afterward. Who knew what unspeakable presences waited within those wires like swollen silver spiders clinging to a fiber-optic web? Stefan stood by the door, wringing his hands and staring at her in sweaty panic. Eddie realized, with something like awe, that he might never have been alone in a room with a girl before. The thought was oddly touching. She would have to remember not to make any sudden moves, otherwise she might frighten him clean away. Zack's not here, she told him. He doesn't actually live in New Orleans anymore. I heard he might have gotten busted. Who said so? I hear things. That much she didn't doubt. He wasn't busted. He got away. But he's okay. I got a message from him. The hacker looked aghast. He didn't call you here? No. He put a message in the paper, in secret code. She showed him the folded page of yesterday's Times Picayune. Goddess in a bowl of gumbo, indeed. See, I think this means he's in North Carolina. Maybe heading for New York next. He scowled at the paper. Secret code. This is kid stuff. I suppose shutting down the 911 system is mature, Eddie said coolly. Zack had told her how Fetus bragged on the boards that he could overload every emergency telephone circuit in the city if he wanted to. Not seeming to register the insult, or perhaps not considering it an insult, Stefan edged past her into the room. Where's the phone? She pointed to Zack's desk, which was still piled high with books and papers, but looked rather forlorn without the computer and boxes of floppy disks. Zack had left his printer behind, though. Eddie guessed she would drag it out and hawk it sometime soon. Stefan took the receiver from the hook and pried off the plastic earpiece before Eddie could protest. He removed a small black box from his pocket and clipped some wires running from it to something inside the phone then peered owlishly at the box. Well, nobody else has a tap on this line, but the government might. They can tap straight from the phone company if they've got a warrant. Assume it's bugged. What did you do to it? He held up the black box. This is called a multi-tester. It reads your standard off-hook voltage. If it's too low, there's probably another device sucking bolts off your line. Oh, Stefan had become briefly animated. Now he seemed to sink back into his sniffling, nervous fugue. Look, I've got people after me, too. Why, if they knew I was here... Eddie had closed the door as Stefan entered, but had not yet bothered to lock it. There was an iron security gate at the street entrance that led up to the apartment, and while French Quarter residents were generally careful about locking all their doors, the gate offered some semblance of privacy some illusion of safety. 
This illusion was shattered as the door flew open and banged against the wall, making a dent in the soft plaster. All the policemen in the world seemed to come pouring into her tiny apartment. Eddie had no idea how many there actually were. All she saw was the guns, great oily insectal things unholstered and dripping death, pointed straight at her. Eddie crouched and wrapped her arms around her head and screamed, No! No! She couldn't help it. She had always had an instinctive terror of guns. Perhaps in another life she had been a revolutionary sentenced to the firing squad, or a gangster cut down in a street battle. Behind her, she heard one of the most brilliant phone system guys on the planet burst into tears. The raid team totaled 15 men. Secret Service agents, Bell South phone security experts, and curious New Orleans cops along for the ride. Most of them faltered at the sight of the two cowering kids. Several guns went back into their holsters. The German machine pistol carried by Agent Absalom Cover wasn't one of them. He kept it trained on the suspects and watched them ride. Either of these two could be Zachary Bosch or the person hiding behind that name. Agent Cover had wanted Bosch for a long time. Other hackers goaded him unmercifully, threatened his credit and disrupted his phone service, left taunting messages in his email, had done all but beard him in his New Orleans field office. But Bosch was smarter than ten such crooks, and far more dangerous. He didn't brag much. He didn't leave cute little clues in his wake. He just breezed through systems nobody should be able to get into, stealing information and wreaking havoc and he covered his tracks like an Indian. Finally, a 15-year-old software pirate under interrogation had given them the keys they needed to trace him. Scratch a hacker and find a rat. Ask him the right questions, marvel a little at his amazing technical feats, and turn him into an eager rat. Some of these kids were terrifyingly smart, but they were still kids. And Agent Cover believed all kids were basically amoral. He got his warrant and moved in fast. Bosch couldn't have had time to slip between his fingers. Still, once the first flush of adrenaline began to wear off, he found himself looking doubtfully at the two bawling kids. He hadn't expected Bosch to fold so easily. Most of these teenage whiz kids turned to jelly when they saw a few guns and badges, but then most of them had only broken into a system or two and browsed through sensitive files, maybe used a stolen phone code here and there, or downloaded some software they shouldn't have. Most of them weren't brazen enough or criminally inclined enough to rip shit off on the scale that Zachary Bosch had. Cover took one last loving look at his heckler and cook and tucked it back into the holster inside his jacket. He hadn't needed a gun on a hacker raid yet. These kids loved to brag on the boards about how they would go down shooting, but the deadliest weapon Agent Cover had found in a hacker's possession was a dental probe the kid used for jimmying phone jacks. As he approached the suspects, the punked-out Asian girl lifted her head and stared at him in teary defiance, like a gut-shot deer watching a hunter loom over her in the bloody snow. She had enough crap dangling from her earlobes to set off a metal detector, and her hair looked like she'd cut it with a weed-eater in the dark. Cover always wondered what had been done to these kids in early childhood to make them want to look the way they did. He'd busted one hacker who had a blue mohawk and scorpions tattooed on the shaved sides of his skull. Scorpions. The tall, sickly-looking boy bolted for the bathroom. Two of the cops were right behind him. Cover heard the toilet lid bang up, the thick liquid sound of vomiting. Hey! One of the cops stuck his head back in. An expression of dismay plastered across his broad, shiny face. He just chunked his wallet and keys in the crapper. Fish them out. But they're floating in a puddle of puke. Fish them out, Cover repeated. The girl was watching him with a mixture of terror and loathing. The rush of forced intrusion left him, and he felt suddenly weary. From the bathroom, he heard, I'll write you, little crook, fish them out, followed by another round of puking. The U.S. Secret Service was charged with all manner of important duties and missions, any of which Ab Cover might have been assigned to upon his graduation from the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center at Glencoe, Georgia. He could have protected the president from freaks and commies and assassins. He could have guarded the precious metals in treasury vaults, 
or fought the clear-cut war on counterfeiting and forgery of U.S. currency. Instead, he was part of an ongoing crackdown on computer crime that had begun with Operation Sun Devil in 1990. Based in Arizona, Sun Devil had targeted hacker abuse of credit card numbers and phone codes. More than 40 computers and 23,000 floppy disks had been seized from private citizens across the country. Since then, the Secret Service had acquired a taste for the slippery little anarchists who loved to hide behind their keyboards in the dark dens of iniquity, but could be so rewarding once they were dragged out into the sun. So instead of guarding the president, cover busted funny-looking misfit geniuses who weren't usually old enough to go to prison for crimes that nine-tenths of the American public didn't understand. In Washington, they told him it was an honor. At any rate, it was a living. But sometimes he wondered if it was a good one. Eddie clutched her copy of the search warrant and watched the cops swarm over the apartment. Now that the guns had been put away, though she was very conscious of the filthy things bulging under jackets and dangling from carelessly snapped holsters, looking as if they might crash to the floor and go off at any moment, she was able to take a look at the men behind them. The Secret Service drones were sleek and broad-shouldered and well-dressed, with razor-cut hair combed severely back from feral faces, with clean square jawlines and hard glittering eyes. They all seemed to be wearing expensive leather tassel loafers, and Eddie was hardly surprised to see that several even sported mirror shades. She assumed that the guys in the cheaper jackets and plain loafers were lower echelon agents, though in fact they were from the telephone company. And of course she recognized the New Orleans cops. She had a long and bitter acquaintance with them, from her bust for a joint's worth of marijuana at 16, which Zack had since wiped from her record, to the clumsy attempts at entrapment she had been subjected to at the Pink Diamond. How much would you charge to show a little more, they'd leer, tugging at the crotches of their tacky plainclothes slacks. After the agent in charge had examined her driver's license and realized that there was no computer equipment left in the place except the printer, he seemed to view Eddie as a minor threat at best. She still saw his mean, handsome face glowering in her direction from time to time as he snapped out orders, but she had mostly been forgotten. The printer quickly disappeared out the door in the arms of another sharp-dressed, eerily efficient Secret Service man. Zack moved out months ago, she said. I think he left the country. No one paid any attention. A suit with a camera clicked off shot after shot of the desk, the bookshelves, the towering stacks of paper. Two others busily sorted and packed computer printouts, smudgily printed zines, cassettes and CDs. With a sinking heart, she saw the folded page from the Times-Picayune going into one of their goodie boxes, along with a copy of the science fiction novel, Neuromancer. That had been one of Zack's favorite books. The main character plugged his computer directly into a jack in his brain and entered the Matrix, where he stole information from huge, faceless corporations. To Zack, William Gibson's seamy world must have read like the paradise of his wildest dreams. To these guys, it was just more proof of sedition. They unplugged the phone and the answering machine and took those too. They took poor Stefan. Eddie saw him being hustled out the door between two broad blue backs, a thin string of puke still dripping from his chin. She wondered what they'd gotten him for. Tampering with evidence, probably, for throwing his ID in the toilet. Eddie thought it had been a pretty good trick. Too bad he hadn't managed to flush and send them fishing in the sewers. New Orleans' finest, busting pitiful teenage geeks while old ladies visiting their husbands' graves stood a good chance of getting robbed or raped in the cemetery. Real heroes. And robbed and raped was how she felt right about now, watching these cookie-cutter robots swarm over her home and sift through her belongings and not being able to do a damn thing about it. As soon as this nightmare was over, Eddie decided, she would go to the bank and withdraw part of the $10,000. Not all of it. That might look suspicious. But enough to have around in case... What? In case she needed to leave in a hurry? God damn it, she thought. I haven't even broken the law yet, and I'm already as paranoid as Zack was. Is this any way to live? Is it worth the gnawing in your stomach, the constant urge to look over your shoulder? For Zack, she supposed it had been. He was addicted to the thrill, the risk. 
but for her this state of affairs would not do for long. She didn't know if she should go anywhere near that money, and wished she had been able to ask Stefan if it was safe. But Eddie thought she would feel more secure with wads of cold cash sewn into her mattress than with illegitimate funds lurking in any electronically accessible part of her life. She wished she had never seen a computer. Right now, if she was to be perfectly honest, she wished she had never met Zack. He was the best friend she had ever had. He was generous and brilliant. He had introduced her to all manner of exotic things she might never have found on her own. But he was also confusion and trouble and heartache. And on top of all that, she missed him so badly she thought it might kill her. 